so in this part two marathon uh, for anatomy marathon the first part we did uh, our upper limb and the uh, uh, medical genetics and your lower limb and in this part we are starting with our head and neck head neck and face hnf which is uh, a huge huge chapter okay and it is the most feared chapter of anatomy also so let's uh, move with our head and neck and uh, let's make the chapter easy and as much as much easy as possible and we'll discuss the clinicals also so as you can deal with all your clinical based questions which are most commonly asked from your head and neck and all okay so just pay your full attention your full attention is required in this uh, topics because uh, the chapter is a little bit complicated not uh, the whole but i will try to make it easy so let's start first we'll go about the scalp okay what is the scalp in this this has five layers okay s c a l p your skin is there your connective tissue is there aponeurosis a is for aponeurosis loose areolar tissue and your pericranium okay this is five layers what is the extent of the scalp your anterior border is attached to the superciliary arches okay superciliary arches posterior to the superior nuchal line you can appreciate the skull if, if you have the skull you can appreciate these points this is a very simple things okay lateral body is attached to the superior temporal lines okay uh, take, uh, like, like about the the layers we have first your skin okay then your connective tissue layer is present then your aponeurosis is present okay then you have the loose areolar tissue your loose areolar tissue and your pericranium is there okay and this is your skull this is your skull and below the skull we have dural venous sinuses which are filled with blood and these are emissary veins which are connecting the second layer the connective tissue layer to the dural venous sinuses emissary veins don't have valve Talking about the skin first layer, it is thick, hairy and sweat glands are present, okay, and hairy, so we have sebaceous glands are present, so it is, uh, so skin is a site for sebaceous cysts, this is a sebaceous cyst, okay, and talking about connective tissue, connective tissue is a dense fibrous connective tissue in which the vessels are adherent, okay, so injuries to this connective tissue will lead to profuse bleeding, okay, as vessels are adherent, they cannot retract and form your uh, vasoconstriction, do vasoconstriction. A function of connective tissue is to bind to the skin to the ap underlying aponeurosis and it is the area of nerves and blood vessels. Talking about aponeurosis, it is also called as epicranial aponeurosis or your galea aponeurotica, which is the Latin for your helmet. Okay, this is your aponeurosis, this is your aponeurosis. Okay, and this is attached in, in uh, your uh, anterior uh, anteriorly to the frontal belly of your occipitofrontalis muscle. Okay. So uh, and uh, posteriorly to the occipital belly of your occipital frontalis. This is the frontal belly of occipital occipital frontalis, and posteriorly it is attached to the occipital belly of your occipital frontalis muscle. Okay, and the uh, muscle is the occipital frontalis muscle. Just two occipital be bellies and two frontal bellies, one in each side. Okay, this is one, and in that side also you would have the same frontal belly. Okay. So this is the frontal belly. This is the aponeurosis. Your loose areolar tissue is there. Loose areolar tissue is there, occipital belly is there, and the superior nuchal line, as I said, the skull is attached posteriorly to the superior nuchal line. Okay. And uh, this this loose areolar tissue layer, this loose areolar tissue layer, if there is some infection, if there is some infection, okay, due to accumulation of blood, if, if there is some uh, injury due to which the blood will accumulate, the blood will tend to accumulate in the loose areolar tissue, and this loose areolar tissue is continuous. This it is continuous with the uh, that uh, occipital frontalis muscle which allows space to the connective tissue okay so it is continuous with your uh, orbit okay uh, your uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue over eyebrows and root of nose okay because the insertion of the frontal belly is there so it is continuous and this can accumulate here in the eyes which can cause a black eye okay if if uh, you have seen in movies okay uh, usually the, uh, the ch children and all they fight and, uh, and the, this black eye is caused okay so this is the accumulation of blood in the loose areolar tissue which comes from down which comes down beneath the frontalis muscle uh, talking about loose areolar tissue it is the uh, that uh, fourth layer it is transversed by many emissary veins transversed by many emissary veins which do, do not have valve and this connect the second layer to the dural venous sinuses okay so infections can reach uh, from the second layer to the dural venous sinuses so second layer is called as a dangerous layer of skull this is very very important this is very important a dangerous layer of scalp is the second layer second layer was your connective tissue okay so this connective tissue is called as a danger layer of scalp because these have emissary veins which are connecting it to the dural venous sinuses so any infection can travel in this path in uh, like this okay and reach your dural venous sinuses understood then afterwards let's move uh, there is if there is a transverse wound a transverse wound will gape more gape more means open more 
due to the pull of your occipital frontalis muscle okay if there is a transverse wound transverse wound to the scalp okay it will gape more due to the pull of your occipital frontalis muscle okay what is safety valve hematoma if there is a fracture of fracture of your cranial vault okay then the dura mater and pericranium will be teared and this intracranial hemorrhage this hemorrhage communicates to the loose areolar tissue okay and this loose areolar tissue due to this mechanism also it is the cere cerebral compression is uh, like blocked okay if if there is a fracture of the cranial vault okay then the dura mater and pericranium will tear up okay and this hemorrhage which is uh, your uh, blood blood will be lost okay the uh, intracranial hemorrhage it is in, inside your uh, cranium okay it communicates the loose areolar tissue first it communicates the loose areolar tissue layer and it, uh, this loose areolar tissue like act as a conditioning mechanism okay that is the blood may, may accumulate here blood blood may accumulate here and will not cause your cerebral damage okay will not cause your cerebral compression okay this, so this safety valve hematoma is also due to your connective tissue layer okay cephalohematoma it is also called cephalohematoma or the caput succedaneum okay so fracture of cranial vault in children may be associated with tearing of dura mater and pericranium okay in the blood will blood from the intracranial hemorrhage will communicate with the sub aponeurotic space of the skull through the fracture lines okay and uh, the, there will be no signs of a cerebral compression okay uh, so collection of blood in the fourth layer is called as a safety valve hematoma okay collection of um, this is uh, in fourth layer is your safety valve hematoma okay the loose areolar tissue layer loose areolar tissue not your connective tissue just i told mistake maybe uh, not your connective tissue loose areolar tissue. fourth layer fourth layer is uh, is helping in a safety valve hematoma mechanism okay talking about pericranium we have the sutures and the endocranium is like intrinsically connected to the pericranium okay so if there is sub periosteal bleeding if there is sub periosteal bleeding like in the uh, if the periosteum if there is the below the periosteum there is bleeding okay uh, so the bleeding will take the shape of the bone only that the bleeding will take the shape of the bone as it is intrinsically connected okay so you can see here this this is a uh, cephalohematoma of your parietal bone okay usually it takes the shape of the parietal bone because it is very common in the parietal bones okay talking about the nerve supply of the scalp which is very very important uh, let's talk about the nerve supply of the scalp so first first uh, your uh, two nerves are the supratrochlear nerve and the supraorbital nerve okay this is a supratrochlear nerve and the supraorbital nerve here okay these two nerves are the branches of the ophthalmic nerve ophthalmic nerve which in turn is a branch of a trigeminal nerve okay we'll uh, learn about trigeminal nerve in a while then we have the zygomatico temporal nerve zygomatico temporal nerve from here ztn which is a branch of a maxillary nerve which is a v2 nerve and which is also is a branch of trigeminal nerve we have the auricular temporal nerve, ATN nerve, auricular temporal nerve, damage to auricular temporal nerve can cause a syndrome which is called as a Freeze syndrome. We will talk about that also. It, it, is also. it is also a branch of a mandibular nerve, mandibular nerve, V3 nerve. Okay. So we have from this V1, V2 and the V3 okay, in this sequence. Okay. So V3, V3 nerve, it is also a branch of your trigeminal nerve. Okay. Then we have below the auricle, we have a great auricular nerve, great GAN, great auricular nerve starting from C2 to C3 then your lesser occipital nerve uh, starting from C2 lesser occipital nerve starting from C2 this great auricular nerve C2 to C3 lesser occipital nerve from C2 greater occipital nerve from C2 and the third occipital nerve from C3 okay so we have great auricular we have lesser occipital greater occipital and the third occipital okay and uh, this these are connected to your uh, cervical plexus we will discuss the cervical plexus later okay uh, in the due course of time talking about the blood supply of the scalp this is more or less uh, like your nerve supply also scalp is richly supplied by arteries five on each side so we have about 10 arteries in your scalp okay so wounds of scalp they bleed profusely okay so you have the supratrochlear artery and the supraorbital arteries uh, like we had the supratrochlear nerve and the supraorbital nerve the supratrochlear artery and supraorbital artery which are branches of your ophthalmic artery these are branches of your ophthalmic nerve and these are branches of your ophthalmic artery this ophthalmic artery is a branch of your internal carotid artery we will learn about the internal carotid artery also in neuroanatomy okay so we'll, we can correlate there okay and then uh, above the ear we have the superficial temporal artery sta superficial temporal artery okay which is a branch of a facial nerve uh, sorry facial artery and we have the posterior auricular artery below the auricle we have the posterior auricular artery okay and here in the occipital part we have the occipital artery occipital artery okay and uh, this superficial temporal this posterior auricular superficial temporal posterior auricular and the occipital artery as the branches of an external carotid artery 
ओके सो लाइक यू हैव द कॉमन कैरोटेड एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड इंटरनल कैरोटेड दिस एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड आर्टरी ओके इट डिवाइड्स इन टू योर फेशियल आर्टरी ओके सुपरफिशियल टेम्पोरल आर्टरी योर पोस्टीरियर ऑरिकुलर आर्टरी एंड द ऑक्सीबिटल आर्टरी ओके एंड दिस आर फॉर्म ओके and craniotomy incisions are usually given at the center to prevent damage to blood vessels let's move on to the next concept so after discussing the scalp let's move on to the face okay face of the uh, the skin of the face is thick elastic and vascular superficial fascia is have uh, the muscles of facial expression okay and uh, the face has no deep fascia so deep fascia is absent deep fascia is absent except in the parotid gland in parotid gland there is a uh, deep fascia that is a parotido mesenteric fascia that is the superficial layer of uh, the investing layer okay of your pretracheal fascia okay we'll see about that uh, face has variable amount of fat fat is absent in the eyelids and more in the buccal region the buccal fat is more more prominent in newborn it's called as a sectorial pad of fat okay uh, so it is more uh, prominent in the newborn okay talk about facial muscles these are remnant of your panniculus carnosus which is present in the lower animals okay and uh, which muscles you have just uh, pay attention here first is the procerus procerus here, here you can see the procerus and this causing a transverse wrinkling transverse wrinkling of the nose okay it's causing a transverse wrinkling of the nose okay when it contracts there will be a transverse wrinkling and you have got the corrugated supercilia over the, the eyes you have got the corrugated supercilia like this this and this okay and when it uh, there is a frowning expression in this uh, wide open your eyes okay or frowning your corrugated supercilia is acting okay and have the orbicular is oculi over the eyes which will help in the closing of eye okay and your uh, compressor nasi compressor nasi this one your compressor nasi is there this is a compressor nasi okay which, uh, sorry uh, this is a compressor nasi this one this one this one sorry so this this one is the compressor nasi present like this which will compress the nostrils okay and uh, then have the big muscle uh, not the big muscle there is a big name okay that is called as a levator labi superioris aliquin nasi levator labi superioris aliquin nasi okay llsa and muscle okay which will elevate your upper lip you can li uh, like uh, understand from this levator labi levator labi means your lip elevator and superior is the upper lip elevator okay aliquin is a aliquin is a means to dilate the ala of the nostril to dilate the nostrils and elevate the upper lip okay so this muscle is like this this is a levator labi superior aliquin is a okay and then we have the compressor as i we told about this muscle okay just just uh, lateral to your llsn that is a levator labi superior aliquin is a okay you have another muscle and another muscle is called as levator labi superior this okay you can see here your levator labi superior is also present okay which will just help to elevate your upper lip again okay and uh, also uh, the, like in the side okay like many muscles are present like zygomaticus major is present zygomaticus minor is present this is your zygomaticus major this is zygomaticus major it is the most lateral okay and it is helpful in the smiling okay it is called as smiling muscle and then you have the zygomaticus minor zygomaticus minor okay this one zygomaticus minor this one which will help to up, up in the uplift the upper lip okay upper lip elevation upper lip elevation okay, so in upper lip elevation which are acting you can uh, see uh, your levator labi superior is elevate uh, your levator labi superior is aliquin nasi and your zygomaticus minor okay these are helping in your upper lip elevation okay and uh, you can the uh, see all uh, this muscles also like uh, levator labi superior is aliquin nasi and your levator labi superior is only okay and you have muscles like this in transversely present in your uh, in this part okay like this on just your transverse muscles which are called as rhizoreus and rhizoreus is for grinning rhizoreus is for grinning expression okay and uh, then you have your uh, over the mouth you have your orbicularis oris like we had orbicularis oculi over there we have orbicularis oris okay which is helpful in the closing of mouth okay that was in opening in the closing of eye and this is in the closing of mouth orbicularis oris okay and then you have other two muscles like uh, this one this ones is are called the dip depressor labi inferioris okay for sad expression you, you have to depress the lip like this okay so this muscles are pulling the lip like this okay this muscle will pull in this direction and will depress the lip which is called as dip depressor labi inferioris okay and then you have the med mentalis muscle here in the mental region okay, which is for the wrinkling of the chin for confused expression okay and your depressor anguli oris is also there your depressor anguli oris is also there which will also cause a depression okay 
so these are your uh, facial muscles these are your facial muscles and we have buccinator also here we left another muscle buccinator in the cheek region and this buccinator muscle is called as a whistling muscle or the blowing muscle okay this is for this purposes okay you can see the muscles here you can appreciate the muscles here you can take a screenshot okay if you want to just know okay this is your platysma muscle this is platysma muscle of the neck okay done yes let's move ahead talking about parotid gland your seventh nub the facial nub comes here in the parotid gland and divides into five branches that is a temporal branch a zygomatic branch a buccal branch marginal mandibular branch and a cervical branch okay temporal branch is supplying a frontalis orbicularis oculi and orbicular muscles okay a zygomatic branch is supplying your orbicularis oculi zygomatic branch for orbicularis oculi lower eyelids okay and buccal branch for cheek and upper lip marginal mandibular branch for lower lip and the chin and cervical branch for the platysma muscle okay so you can just put your uh, four fingers over your uh, cheek part of your um, face and uh, this uh, this uh, your five fingers and this five fingers will re rep <coughs> will represent your five branches of your facial nerve in the parotid gland blood supply of the face it is important and supply to the facial artery which is a branch of the external carotid artery it has a cervical part and a facial part cervical part and a facial part okay talking about the course of a facial artery so uh, let's let's trace from the, the external carotid artery this is external carotid artery okay at the level of the greater corner of hyoid bone it gives up a facial artery so facial artery starts at the greater corner of the hyoid bone as a continuation of your external carotid artery as a branch of your external carotid artery in the neck region it gives four branches the stag branches the submental artery tonsillar artery ascending artery and glandular artery okay this glandular to suppress the mandibular uh, gland ascending branch and tonsillar branch and your submental branch these are the four stag branches okay then it goes like this and it goes deep to the angle of mandible this is the angle of mandible goes deep to the angle of mandible and makes a u turn here okay um, posteriorly and at the anterior inferior angle of the mesator this is the anterior inferior angle of the mesator okay uh, at this point it pierces a deep cervical fascia of the neck and comes out into the face okay it pierces the deep cervical fascia at the anterior inferior angle of the mesator okay and it comes out like this and uh, it goes 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 it gives the inferior labial artery to the uh, lower lip your superior labial artery to the upper lip okay L the lateral nasal artery to the nose okay and it goes like this and uh, as it extends it is called as an angular artery angular artery okay and it anastomoses with the dorsal nasal artery which is a branch of your ophthalmic artery which is in turn is a branch of your internal carotid artery not an external internal carotid so internal carotid artery will give your ophthalmic artery this ophthalmic artery is a branch dorsal nasal artery why this is important because this anastomosing points represent your anastomosis between eca and ica your internal carotid and external carotid anastomose at which point between which two arteries so you have your dorsal nasal artery and your angular artery so this is very very important okay just to know and pulsations of facial artery can be felt at the anterior inferior angle of the mesator usually by the anesthesiologist so it is also known as the anesthetist artery okay and wounds of the face they also bleed profusely but heal quickly okay so it is rare for skin flaps to necrose in plastic surgery of the face you can see your facial artery here in this cadaveric image you can appreciate a facial artery okay and the facial vein also goes intrinsically with the facial artery so talking about a venous drainage of the face your facial artery is tortuous course okay it has a tortuous course it is like this but the facial uh, vein is uh, just uh, plain and normal okay and uh, talking about this so let's discuss the venous drainage of the face okay so what happens is that uh, first talking about your supratrochlear and supraorbital vein this is supratrochlear vein and this is a supraorbital vein these two veins will form your angular vein this angular vein will come down which is uh, angular continuation of the angular vein is forming your facial vein okay and this facial vein uh, it is it is coming down and uh, here you have your superficial temporal vein which is which will pass just posteriorly to the parotid gland superficial temporal vein passes posterior to the parotid gland where it receives receives a branch okay which is called as a maxillary vein this is a maxillary vein it receives a branch and fuses with the maxillary vein which and forms a retromandibular vein so retromandibular vein is formed by your uh, formed by your superficial temporal vein and your maxillary vein okay this is forming a retromandibular vein this retromandibular vein is coming down and forming an anterior division and posterior division and the anterior division of the retromandibular vein is uh, fusing with the facial vein to form your 
common facial vein and the common facial vein is draining to internal jugular vein okay and this posterior division this is fusing with another vein which is called as the posterior auricular vein the posterior auricular vein okay this posterior division of your retromandibular vein and the posterior auricular vein this fuse to form your external jugular vein external jugular vein and this external jugular vein drains into your subclavian vein external jugular vein drains into your subclavian vein understood okay and this internal and external jugular is uh, said with respect to your sternocleidomastoid muscle this is important okay and uh, talking about a uh, clinical here talking about a clinical you have your, um, from your angular vein uh, from your angular vein there arises a superior ophthalmic vein superior ophthalmic vein okay by the superior ophthalmic vein it, infections can travel okay to the cavernous sinuses okay and uh, we have a deep facial vein which is a branch of a facial vein only infections can also travel to the pterygoid venous plexus from here okay so uh, emissary veins which are connected to your cavernous plexus and pterygoid venous plexus okay so infections are being drained here and here okay so infections from the superior ophthalmic vein are draining into your cavernous sinus and infections from the facial vein are also draining into it draining into pterygoid venous plexus okay so uh, this infections uh, infections of this part of this part of the face is um, basically going into various regions okay and uh, the, so this area this area this triangular area which which contain the lower nose okay upper lip lower nose is there upper lip is there okay and adjoining parts of cheek is there this is called the dangerous triangle of the face dangerous triangle of the face infection cells can travel up to cavernous sinus and your pterygoid venous plexus talking about buccinator muscle just a note about buccinator muscle you can get a short note on buccinator muscle you can see this muscle here okay if the parotid duct is cut this parotid duct is cut okay you have the buccinator, buccinator muscle present over here this is the buccinator okay you can uh, well appreciate your buccinator it has uh, many fibers like your anterior fibers middle fi your upper fibers your lower fibers and the middle fibers okay so you have the upper fibers here upper fibers like this you have a lower fibers like this and your uh, and middle fibers is decussate is decussate middle fibers is decussate okay so upper fibers these are upper fibers which originate from the maxilla originate from the maxilla okay and opposite to the molars opposite to the molars and this uh, lower fibers okay this lower fibers uh, these are originating from the mandible opposite to the molars this is originating from the mandible but opposite to the molars okay so you, you can just well uh, you can make a logic like this the upper means maxilla and lower means the mandible okay and middle fibers these are originating from your pterygomandibular raphe this is your pterygomandibular raphe and these are originating from a pterygomandibular raphe and they are decussating what is the action of a buccinator a buccinator has an action of flattening of cheeks against the gums flattening of cheeks against the gums it prevents the food accumulation in the vestibule this is the vestibule area so it prevents the food accumulation in the vestibule and helps in whistling okay so it is uh, called as a whistling muscle or a blowing muscle okay so this completes our face let's move on to the next topic okay let's talk about uh, our deep cervical fascia which is a uh, fascia of deep uh, fascia of the neck okay so it has the modifications like your investing layer your pretracheal layer prevertebral layer carotid sheath and the buccopharyngeal fascia this investing layer pretracheal and prevertebral layer this give rise to your carotid sheath okay so basically this is the deep fascia this is the deep fascia of the neck okay and you can uh, appreciate all the things okay or the prevertebral prefacial layer you can just take a screenshot and uh, the, uh, you can research on this diagram okay okay so these are some of the diagrams which are used for explaining this all okay talking about this uh sternocleidomastoid okay let's talk about the ts of the neck transverse section of the neck if you cut the neck from this point and uh, look from the above so you will get a transverse section so what will be there this is the transverse section of the neck very very important okay you can draw the transverse section of the neck if the fascias are asked in a long question or so if you get a deep cervical fascia long question it is unlikely but you can get okay so you can draw this diagram first and uh, after drawing you can uh, like the investing layer the investing layer will surround the muscles like your sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius okay so investing layer this is surrounding the sternocleidomastoid in the anterior part okay anterior part this is the anterior part this is the anterior part and we are uh, looking at the posterior part from here okay so anterior part we, uh, we have the sternocleidomastoids two sternocleidomastoid muscles okay which are surrounded by the investing layer okay and then you have the trapezius muscle posteriorly in the posterior part we have the trapezius muscle and these are also surrounded by your investing layer yes, and investing layer 
we have the vertebra here and the vertebra is surrounding by your prevertebral layer okay and then we have the carotid sheath which is also a modification of this okay and then we have this trachea and esophagus is there and then we have the thyroid gland this is the thyroid gland this is the thyroid gland and this thyroid gland is covered by a fascia which is called as a pretracheal fascia this pretracheal fascia is mainly covering your thyroid gland okay this is the visceral layer of a pretracheal fascia okay and we have the muscular layers also of the pretracheal fascia this muscular layers of the pretracheal fascia are covering the muscles which are in front of your thyroid gland okay your muscles in front of the thyroid gland this is the many muscles are there in front of your thyroid gland like your sternothyroid and your uh, superior your superior belly of omohyoid and this all okay these are your pretracheal fascia that is your muscular layer of pretracheal fascia we'll talk in detail about this all so don't worry and this all this fascia like a pretracheal fascia visceral layer and uh, your investing layer and your uh, this this one this one and this one this three uh, your prevertebral fascia also it is contributing to the carotid sheath okay Talk, first let's come to the investing layer investing layer covers the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius it forms the roof of the posterior and anterior triangles of neck we'll talk about the triangles of neck later okay so it forms the roof if, if, if your uh, roof uh, relations of posterior and anterior triangles are asked in the roof you will see the investing layer only okay it encloses uh, it has it follows a rule of two it follows a rule of two okay it has two spaces and it encloses the two glands okay two muscles and all okay so it encloses the parotid gland and the submandibular gland so talking about this how it uh, surrounds this glands okay talking about how it surrounds the parotid gland okay then the submandibular gland so let's say here is our tooth and here is our mandible okay so and here is our man uh, your hyoid bone okay so uh, here your submandibular gland, gland is present so deep layer and the superficial layer this both are surrounding it okay surrounding it like this and uh, connecting to the hyoid bone and if you have the parotid gland here so it is a diagrammatic process and the tympanic plate diagonal diagrammatic process and the tympanic plate uh, so the superficial layer that is called is a parotidomesetric fascia which i said is a modification of your investing layer that is surrounding the superficial part that is surrounding the parotid gland this is a parotidomesetric fascia okay and the deep layer deep layer uh, is there which connects to the tympanic plate and this both are surrounding a parotid gland and continuing downwards okay and we have the stylo uh, mandibular ligament here which runs anterior posterior like uh, in uh, in this plane uh, perpendicular to this plane you, in which you are reading okay just imagine like that okay and the stylo mandibular ligament the stylo mandibular ligament this separates your parotid and your submandibular gland okay uh, like a parotid gland is here submandibular gland is here then the stylo mandibular ligament will, se will separate these both glands investing layer encloses two spaces also which is called is a suprasternal space or a burn space and a supraclavicular space okay so we'll uh, see what are the suprasternal and supraclavicular space so uh, let's say you have a clavicle here you have a clavicle cut end of the clavicle the clavicle is cut from the middle okay the clavicle is cut from the middle and you are seeing the pectoralis major must be there so it's the anterior side and uh, below the clavicle you have the muscle that is a subclavius this is a muscle that is subclavius muscle so subclavius muscle is being surrounded by a clavipectoral fascia we have read about all this and uh, this 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 is your this is your uh, investing layer this is your investing layer and uh, the space that is created by the investing layer it, it is called as your it is called as your supra sternal space sorry your supra clavicular space because it is above the clavicle okay supra clavicular space what are the contents the external jugular vein will uh, come down here and drain into your subclavius muscle uh, sorry subclavius muscle, what i'm saying external jugular vein come down here and will drain into your subclavian vein okay and your um, supraclavicular nerve also supraclavicular nerve also will run like this okay so this uh, external jugular vein and the supraclavicular nerve external jugular vein supraclavicular nerve these are the components of your supraclavicular space understood Talking about the suprasternal space, uh, let's say this is the sternum, this is the manubrium of the sternum and then we have the two clavicle like this, okay, and uh, we have this space created above the sternum that is called as your suprasternal space and the suprasternal space is also called as your burn space, burn space, burn space, okay, and uh, what are the contents, so you can have two anterior jugular veins, so forming the jugular venous arch, so jugular venous arch is the content of your burn space. 
and we have the sternal head of the sternocleidomastoid also which is coming into the space so we have uh, jugular venous arch and the sternal head of sternocleidomastoid that is present in a burn space okay so here uh, when you have written you can write this contents also so this supra sternal space so the burn space this contains okay this contains your sternal head sternal head of your sternocleidomastoid of sternocleidomastoid plus your what was that your uh, jugular venous arch jugular venous arch that is formed by two anterior jugular veins understood investing layer this follows the rule of two rule of two is followed okay it has two glands it has uh, two muscles two spaces two ligaments and two pulleys okay two ligaments and two pulleys so talking about two glands which glands it uh, like surrounds okay so parotid gland submandibular gland, we know this two muscles like a sternocleidomastoid and trapezius two spaces your suprasternal space and the supraclavicular space two ligaments that is a stylomandibular ligament and the spinomandibular ligament and two pulleys that is a digastric muscle and your omohyoid muscle two pulleys are there of investing layer that is a digastric and your omohyoid digastric and your omohyoid talking about a pretracheal layer okay uh, investing layer is done so we're talking about the pretracheal layer it is a uh, sagittal view. we're looking at the sagittal view this is the anterior part and this must be the posterior part okay and uh, this hyoid bone is there we are uh, talking about the thyroid gland this is the false capsule of the thyroid gland the true capsule is the uh, gland's own stroma but the fibrous capsule is formed by the pretracheal layer so this orange one this is a pretracheal layer which is connecting uh, ultimately to the fibrous pericardium which is continuing uh, ultimately in the lower part as the fibrous pericardium uh, this pretracheal layer this also is a modification this is called as a suspensory ligament of berry suspensory ligament of berry which connects the gland which connects the gland to the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage is lying above okay and the suspensory ligament of berry this is the modification of pretracheal fascia okay and the function is to pull the thyroid gland in deglutition okay so you must have seen that if, if your neck is there your thyroid gland moves up when you deglutate okay when you swallow your thyroid gland moves up this is your uh, function of a suspensory ligament of berry and how can you differentiate between thyroid and non-thyroid swelling by asking the patient to deglutate okay if there is the uh, thyroid swelling if there is the thyroid swelling then the swelling will uh, just go up with the thyroid gland okay the swelling will go up but if it is non non thyroid swelling okay the thyroid gland will only go up your swelling won't go up okay talking about a prevertebral fascia uh, prevertebral fascia is this fascia prevertebral fascia is this fascia and it uh, encompasses a, a wide uh, thing wide range of things okay like your uh, your vertebra is there like this and uh, scalenous anterior muscles scalenous medius and the scalenous posterior muscles are there here also anterior medius and posterior and this is the prevertebral space this is the prevertebral space and the phrenic nerve is present in front of your scalenous anterior in front of your scalenous anterior your uh, and that uh, phrenic nerve is present and between your scalenous anterior and scalenous medius we have our brachial plexus arising so brachial plexus arises from between the scalenous anterior and the scalenous medius okay and subclavian vessels the nerve and artery are seen in this space between the scalenous anterior and scalenous medius and this is the prevertebral layer prevertebral fascia okay and it extends in the axilla at the axillary sheath we know about the contents of the axillary sheath from yesterday's marathon okay that is uh, your uh, axillary artery okay your axillary artery axillary vein in the course of the brachial plexus so axillary sheath is a continuation of a pre-vertebral fascia understood and buccopharyngeal fascia it's uh, it uh, generally co covers your esophagus okay and the space between buccopharyngeal fascia and the anterior part of your pre-vertebral fascia it is called as your retropharyngeal space it's called as your retropharyngeal space so after you have done this let's talk about a sagittal view okay we are uh, seeing the facies from the sagittal view and uh, here we can uh, see the formation of the danger layer of neck okay which uh, the pus can migrate to the posterior mediastinum and can cause dysphagia and dyspnea let's discuss about that so talking about this this is the base of the skull this is the base of the skull and uh, this is a pre uh, vertebral column this is a vertebral column you can see the vertebral from c1 to T, uh, T4 level C1 to T4 level okay and your anterior longitudinal ligament is uh, lying which is connecting the all the transverse processes of this vertebrae 
okay the anterior longitudinal ligament and uh, uh, um, parallel to the uh, and longitudinal ligament uh, anterior longitudinal ligament you have a pre vertebral fascia that is covering this whole part okay so uh, see, seeing the sagittal section so this appears as a layer so pre vertebral fascia this is superiorly uh, attached to the base of the skull superiorly to the base of the skull and inferiorly by a t1 t2 and t3 it connects to the t1 t2 and your t3 okay t1 t2 and your t3 and uh, talking about another so let's say you have this pharynx here you have your pharynx here and if you have your pharynx uh, uh, there is uh, a uh, modification of a pre vertebral fascia that is called as a retro uh, that is called as your buccopharyngeal fascia okay no, not a buccopharyngeal fascia okay a modification anterior layer anterior layer of pre vertebral fascia that is called as a lr fascia not your buccopharyngeal called as a lr fascia so lr fascia is a modification of your pre vertebral fascia and this lr fascia this this uh, connects it to pharynx okay and uh, <clears throat> uh, you have your buccopharyngeal fascia here covering your esophagus buccopharyngeal fascia here and the space is called as a retropharyngeal space retropharyngeal space is this space the space is a retropharyngeal space understood and uh, this layer this part this whole part this whole part here it is open from the posterior side it is open from the posterior side extends till the coccygeal vertebrae so uh, the uh, this this region is called as a danger layer of your neck danger space of the neck because the infection any infection you know, from this space can migrate into posterior mediastinum can migrate down into your posterior mediastinum okay and uh, in the posterior mediastinum it can cause your compression of your trachea and your uh, esophagus and all and your dysphagia and dyspnea will occur okay understood and another space is there that is a yellow space that is a pre vertebral space before the vertebral column and the space between anterior longitudinal ligament and your pre vertebral fascia is called as your retropharyngeal sorry your pre vertebral space understood let's talk about the carotid sheath carotid sheath is contributed by your investing layer pre tracheal layer and pre vertebral layer okay so this is a carotid canal carotid canal and uh, here you have the jugular foramen where internal jugular vein enters and uh, it is the carotid sheath it is cover, covered by a carotid sheath so you have the internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein and vagus nerve that is present in the carotid sheath so talking about carotid sheath if you if you have this uh, base of the skull okay this is your mandible and your teeth are present this is eac external acoustic meters or canal okay and the master process and then you, you will have your carotid canal and your jugular foramen Car from the carotid canal your internal carotid artery is passing this is the internal carotid artery which will go through the carotid canal to supply the brain the parts of the brain okay and the external carotid will go out and uh, here we have the internal jugular vein internal jugular vein also passing through the jugular foramen jugular foramen okay and uh, afterwards you have a vagus nerve also here in the carotid sheath so in the contents of the carotid sheath the contents of the carotid sheath is your uh, carotid sheath as a content and that is your internal carotid artery okay your vagus nerve and your internal jugular vein three contents okay very important and the carotid sheath inside the internal jugular vein okay the, the that internal jugular vein inside the carotid sheath is thin and it allows the exp, uh, expansion okay and uh, in the walls of your carotid sheath you have ansa cervicalis so the anterior relation of your carotid sheath is an ansa cervicalis we'll see what is ansa cervicalis you won't understand here and the posterior relation is a sympathetic chain posterior relation is a sympathetic chain just remember the anterior and posterior relations of your carotid sheath understood so you can write uh, well a question if, if it comes in your exam so this completes a deep cervical fascia let's move on to the next chapter uh, to the next part okay not the chapter next part let's uh, talk about a nerve so there is our trigeminal nerve very important trigeminal nerve is important for your understanding of your uh, next nerves okay so let's discuss the trigeminal nerve first so we have parasympathetic ganglions discussing about parasympathetic ganglions we have four ganglions that is a ciliary ganglion a pterygopalatine ganglion or a spinopalatine ganglion a otic ganglion and your submandibular ganglion okay so what is the topographic nerve and what is the difference between topographic nerve and the functional nerve is that uh, in a gang if there is a ganglion okay there is a ganglion so topographic nerve topographic nerve only comes and relays in the ganglion relays in the ganglion and goes out and goes out okay and uh, this from uh, from this relay point your post ganglionic fibers will arise 
and innervate your gland or muscle okay what what about the functional love functional love this this comes into the ganglion this relays also okay this comes and relay but never come out okay they never come out of a ganglion like a third nerve seventh nerve ninth nerve tenth nerve they never come out okay and the post ganglionic fibers only come out and they will give innervation to the gland very very easy topographic nerve this uh, they come and relay and go back uh, go out okay and this functional nerve they come and relay but never go out very easy and trigeminal nerve is the nerve for your third seventh ninth and tenth okay so topographic nerve for all this third seven nine and ten three seven nine ten is your trigeminal nerve or your fifth nerve okay this trigeminal nerve is a topographic nerve for all these nerves okay so nerves which connect the parasympathetic ganglion topographically will also carry the post ganglionic parasympathetic fibers and all parasympathetic ganglions are topographically connected to the trigeminal nerve so we have to learn the trigeminal nerve first so as to understand all this facial nerves and all so trigeminal nerve will uh, serve as a base for understanding your many nerves like your facial nerve and all three nerves trigeminal nerve it has three uh, nerves okay three branches the ophthalmic nerve maxillary nerve and mandibular nerve trigeminal nerve is a fifth nerve okay so we write ophthalmic nerve as a v1 of maxillary as a v2 and the mandibular nerve as a v3 nerve okay so this ophthalmic and maxillary these are your sensory nerves while the mandibular nerve is a mixed nerve mandibular nerve is a mixed nerve so what are the functional columns the functional columns from which the sensory nerves this trigeminal nerve arises is a sve column and a gsa column okay if you don't know this sve and gsa so we'll discuss about this functional columns then okay and after this functional columns you will get to know what is your sve and gsa okay so it supplies muscles of mastication and takes sensations from the face okay so it, it will bring the sensations to uh, from your face okay so talking about this uh, we will have our this is a trigeminal ganglion so let's say we have a trigeminal ganglion here trigeminal ganglion here okay and uh, from the trigeminal ganglion this v1 nerve will come out of the superior orbital fissure this is a superior orbital fissure by which the v1 nerve will go out okay and uh, your uh, v2 nerve will come out of the foramen rotundum your foramen rotundum okay this foramen rotundum and uh, this uh, mandibular nerve v3 nerve this will come out along with the um, that sensory part is there sensory part is the black part and the motor part is the red part so it will come out uh, from your sensory uh, along with your sensory part okay throughout the foramen ovale foramen ovale understood so this is the course of your uh, trigeminal ganglion trigeminal nerve okay and uh, there it is present upon the petrous part of the temporal bone petrous part of the temporal bone this petrous part of the temporal bone is forming a, a meckel's cave okay this is forming a meckel's cave like structure a cave like structure which is called as a meckel's cave and upon this meckel's cave lies your trigeminal ganglion which is also known, known as your gasserian's ganglion also known as a gasserian's ganglion this is a trigeminal ganglion it has three branches one two and three okay first we're talking about the b1 nerve first let's discuss the ophthalmic nerve so ophthalmic nerve comes here and divides into three other branches three other branches it passes through the superior orbital fissure and gives up your frontal nerve frontal nerve your nasociliary nerve and your lacrimal nerve okay frontal nerve nasociliary nerve and your lacrimal nerve and this nasociliary nerve is topographically connected to the ciliary ganglion okay this frontal nerve again divides into supratrochlear nerve and a supraorbital nerve okay so remember we talked about the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerve uh, in your skull okay these were supplying the skull also okay uh, so, sorry not your skull your scalp okay we are discussing your scalp okay. so these are the branches of your frontal nerve and frontal nerve in fact is the branch of your b1 nerve b1 nerve in fact is a branch of your of the, uh, your uh, b nerve that is your trigeminal nerve then with the nasociliary nerve and the topographically connected ganglion is a ciliary ganglion okay and uh, this has three branches okay this is the infratrochlear nerve is there uh, supratrochlear is the frontal nerve so infratrochlear nerve is there then the posterior ethmoidal nerve and the anterior ethmoidal nerve okay then we have a lacrimal nerve lacrimal nerve lacrimal nerve is giving uh, innervation to your lacrimal gland okay and another branch is to the upper eyelid upper eyelid so talking about this, uh, look at this, this V1 nerve, this V1 nerve, your frontal nerve is there, your lacrimal nerve is there, okay, and uh, your second, that third nerve, this nasociliary nerve is also there, okay, you can note this. 
so let's uh, discuss from the superior view looking from this okay you are just uh, taking open skull from this and you're uh, looking at into open skull okay this skull is open so we're looking from superior view we're looking from the superior view so if you understood what are the view we are looking into okay so you can see this now you can see the orbit from the superiorly superiorly you have seen the orbit okay this is the optic nerve this is the optic nerve that is uh, um, taking the sensation the visual sensations of the orbit okay and uh, <coughs> here we'll have our first nerve that is a uh, lacrimal nerve okay so let's first discuss our lacrimal nerve so this is lacrimal nerve that is coming okay this is lacrimal nerve that is coming and is giving a, a branch to your uh, that uh, uh, it is giving a branch to your uh, cell your man lacrimal gland sorry it's lacrimal nerve so lacrimal gland obviously it's giving a branch to the lacrimal gland and your upper eyelid okay so this is the course of a lacrimal nerve here Okay, talking about the nasocilial nerve, nasocilial nerve will come here and uh, give uh, the topographic ganglion that is a ciliary ganglion in this part. Okay, and it will continue like this. Okay, so this is the course of a nasocilial nerve from the ciliary ganglion, from the ciliary ganglion, post ganglionic fibers arise. This post ganglionic fibers which arise from the ciliary ganglion. Okay, uh, those post ganglionic fibers which arise from the ciliary ganglion, these are called as your short ciliary nerve. These are called as your short ciliary nerve. And this continue like this. This uh, give branches to the anterior ethmoidal nerve and the posterior ethmoidal nerve. Okay, this uh, posterior ethmoidal nerve supplies the spinoidal and ethmoidal air sinuses. We'll see the sinuses. This anterior ethmoidal nerve will go to the cranial dura mater and uh, supply the nasal mucosa and become the external nasal nerve. We'll see also this. Okay, and this uh, this branch of the uh, nasal ciliary nerve will give two branches that will that will be called as your long ciliary nerves. So the short ciliary nerves and the long ciliary nerves. Okay, and uh, this these are the branches of a nasal ciliary nerve as well. Understood. And the long ciliary nerve are responsible for uh, taking the sensations from the cornea, ciliary body, and the iris. Okay. Just see this diagram. You can take a screenshot. I have no time to explain the diagram. Okay, you can take a screenshot. Done. Yes. So let's uh, after finishing our first nerve, this this part is finished. So let's take the second part. Uh, so second the the V two nerve, V two nerve comes out of the foramen rotundum as we told. Okay, it is topographically connected to the pterygo palatine ganglion. To the pterygo palatine ganglion. Okay, it is topographically connected to the pterygo palatine ganglion. It is also supplying. It is also giving a branch to your. La uh, lacrimal nerve which is also is a connecting branch to the lacrimal nerve okay and uh, lacrimal nerve and we have two other branches from here also two other branches we'll see we'll zoom in in this part okay first uh, you understand the other course so it's connected to top uh, topographic uh, that is topographically connected to the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion pterygopalatine ganglion then it comes here comes here like this and uh, transverses like this so uh, it, it forms an infraorbital nerve it forms an infraorbital nerve okay and it gives uh, branches to uh, it is called as your posterior superior alveolar nerve okay then your middle superior alveolar nerve msan psan is there msan is there and asan is there the anterior superior alveolar nerve okay it has three branches while it gives in your uh, maxilla it has three branches in the maxilla that is infra uh, that is your psan asan and your msan okay posterior superior alveolar nerve middle superior and anterior superior understood so uh, this this is the course about uh, of your v2 nerve so talking about uh, this okay this part this part this part we are zooming in this part we are zooming in and seeing which nerves is there so v2 nerves come here and forms a pterygopalatine ganglion okay from here arises a zygomatic nerve okay this is a zygomatic nerve okay and it uh, goes to your lacrimal uh, connects to the lacrimal nerve this zygomatic nerve connects to the lacrimal nerve and gives two other branches that is your zygomatico temporal nerve and your zygomatico facial nerve okay so this zygomatic nerve is also giving an uh, innervation to your lacrimal gland okay we'll see in the secretomotor pathways uh, other things we'll see in the secretomotor pathways let's talk about the mandibular nerve it is a bit uh, bigger nerve than this uh, former two nerves okay so we are taking the v3 nerve so V3 nerve will come here and the sensory part will also uh, be with it okay and it uh, goes inside the foramen oval and comes out from the foramen oval uh, it, uh, it comes out and relates in the otic ganglion it relates in the otic ganglion before it, it is relayed in the otic ganglion it gives a branch okay which transverses again back 
it transverses again back which is called as the nervous spinosis okay it transverses again and goes to the brain and supplying supplies the dura mater of the middle cranial fossa dura mater of the middle cranial fossa is supplied by nervous spinosis and nervous spinosis in turn is a branch of your branch of your trigeminal nerve okay it relays in the otic ganglion and in the otic ganglion it uh, gives a branch to the medial pterygoid and to the tensor villi palatini and the tensor tympani tensor tympani and tensor villi palatini these are your uh, supplied by your trigeminal nerve only okay and this is a palate muscle and uh, tensor tympani muscle is there okay, which will uh, read about in middle ear and other parts so uh, this this uh, nervous spinosis this comes out via the sp uh, foramen spinosum foramen spinosum other content of foramen spinosum is the middle meningeal artery also this middle meningeal artery also comes out of the uh, foramen spinosum understood so this is there and uh, it it goes uh, down and divides into a posterior division and anterior division this posterior division first gives a auricular temporal nerve this auricular temporal nerve is like be uh, like separated in this part okay and this allows the passage of the middle meningeal artery which will go it will pierce the auricular temporal nerve which will go here and uh, then afterwards it will come out of your foramen spinosum okay and posterior division again gives another branch which is lingual nerve and this lingual nerve is uh, topographically connected to your submandibular ganglion submandibular ganglion okay submandibular ganglion and this carries a general sensations from the anterior to third of tongue lingual nerve carries general sensations from the anterior anterior to third of the tongue okay and this posterior division this has a lingual nerve and another nerve is there that is the inferior alveolar nerve inferior alveolar nerve is also a branch of the posterior division of your trigeminal nerve uh, of your sorry b3 nerve okay uh, so it uh, inferior alveolar nerves goes inside inside the uh, al your uh, um, mandible okay just inside the mandible and uh, it enters okay it uh, comes out it comes it gives uh, alveolar branches short alveolar branches again okay, it comes out from the mental foramen in the skull that is uh, and it is called as a mental nerve okay and supplies the skin of the chin it supplies the skin of the chin this in inferior alveolar nerve again gives a nerve which is called as a nerve to mylohyoid which will supply a mylohyoid and the anterior belly of digastric mylohyoid and the anterior belly of digastric understood and the anterior division it will give uh, branches to a lateral pterygoid temporalis and your mesenteral these all are this all are your uh, this all are your um, muscles of mastication okay this gives motor branches to this and it gives a sensory branch to the buccal nerve okay buccal nerve which continues as a buccal nerve you can say understood so these things i have to pay attention and this buccal nerve pierces the buccinator muscle but doesn't supply it okay it is a very important point because the coracobrachialis was piercing the musculo the musculocutaneous was piercing the coracobrachialis and was supplying it but here the buccal nerve will pierce the buccinator but doesn't supply it it supplies the skin and mucosa of the chin cheek okay so it is a uh, it is a very important fact here okay so that's all about the trigeminal nerve let's move on to the next part uh, let's do our seventh nerve that is your facial nerve let's come to the facial nerve uh, so it is a mixed nerve it is a parasympathetic nerve uh, it has a motor root and a thin sensory root a motor root and a thin sensory root which is called as a nervous intermedius it goes via the internal acoustic meters iam and arises from the pontomedullary junction so arises from pontomedullary junction it has a motor root and a sensory root and goes via the internal acoustic meters like this and uh, let's talk about the course so here is the course of your facial nerve here is the course of your facial nerve it goes via the internal acoustic meters it turns forming the external genu genu means a band bend okay and it gives a geniculate ganglion here forms a geniculate ganglion then goes via like this goes in the posterior wall of a middle ear cavity so uh, you must have observed that posterior wall of middle ear uh, is has an impression for your facial nerve so it goes like this like this and uh, like uh, comes out of the stylomastoid foramen after this course we will discuss later uh, it gives two branches one is to the stapedius and one is called the cauda tympani nerve cauda tympani nerve which via the anterior canaliculus which, uh, in the anterior wall of the middle ear via the anterior canaliculus will go on and uh, it will join the lingual nerve it will join the lingual nerve and will supply the tongue along with it it will supply the tongue so we know from the, our previous discussions that uh, the cauda tympani nerve is also supplying is also supplying our tongue it also gives a branch the cauda tympani also uh, relays into uh, this ganglion 
it also relates into this sub uh, smg that is a submandibular ganglion and supplies a submandibular gland and also gives a branch to a sublingual gland as well and it is help uh, it is uh, taking the taste from the anterior two third of the tongue except the circumvallate papillae anterior two third except the circumvallate papillae Talk, tracing the course from a geniculate ganglion again this is a greater petrosal nerve which goes via the uh, there is a deep petrosal nerve also there is a deep petrosal nerve this internal carotid artery is present here and there is a sympathetic plexus so from the sympathetic plexus arises for your deep petrosal nerve this greater petrosal and deep petrosal this go via the nerve to pterygoid canal that is a vedians nerve and form um, like it goes by the nerve to pterygoid canal and form the vedians nerve this is a vedians nerve and to this vedians nerve a branch from the soft palate is also there and this vedians nerve relays into a pterygopalatine ganglion after relaying into this pterygopalatine ganglion the vedians nerve uh, there arises the v2 nerve that is a, there will be a v2 nerve and this v2 nerve that is a maxillary nerve it will give a branch to zygomatic nerve the zygomatic nerve is a branch of this nerve that is your v2 nerve and this zygomatic nerve will give you a zygomatic temporal nerve and your zygomatic facial nerve you can just uh, see from our previous discussions that this zygomatic temporal nerve this was supplying on the scalp yes it was supplying the scalp and zygomatic facial nerve is there which will uh, supply your orbicularis ocular muscles we'll talk about that and there is a lacrimal nerve here which is a branch of a zygomatic temporal nerve which will supply the lacrimal gland which will innervate your lacrimal gland and from the soft palate taste sensations are uh, taken to the vedians nerve talking about this uh, i guess we discussed all this so deep petrosal nerve this is a post ganglionic sympathetic nerve deep petrosal nerve is a post ganglionic sy sympathetic nerve and the greater petrosal nerve is a pre ganglionic parasympathetic nerve this greater petrosal nerve is the GPN, this is a preganglionic parasympathetic nerve and the petrosal nerve is postganglionic sympathetic. After that, uh, let's discuss the secretomotor pathway of lacrimal gland. So, uh, lacrimal gland, you know, uh, that uh, innervation comes from superior salivatory nucleus. Superior salivatory nucleus, SSN, remember, we talked about this in cranial nuclei and columns. Uh, so, it arises from that and it travels via the VII nerve, that is the seventh nerve. Uh, release in the greater petrosal nerve then your pterygopalatine ganglion it relays into your pterygopalatine ganglion from where arises the v2 nerve this this is zygomatic nerve this zygomatic temporal nerve zygomatic temporal nerve is a lacrimal nerve and this lacrimal nerve innervates a lacrimal gland this is the secretomotor pathway of a lacrimal gland let's talk about the secretomotor pathway of a submandibular and sublingual gland so you can see here uh, uh, this submandibular and sub the sublingual glands this this have uh, the pathways like this and how is the pathway your superior salivatory nucleus, your seventh nerve, your cauda tympani that will form the cauda tympani, relays into a submandibular ganglion that is topographically connected to the lingual nerve. And from the lingual nerve, it goes to a submandibular and the sublingual glands. Uh, here's the full course. Uh, yes, I told that after the stylomastoid foramen, we will discuss. So, after the stylomastoid foramen, there will be a posterior auricular branch. That is a posterior auricular branch of uh, this nerve, which will supply a stylohyoid, posterior belly of digastric auricular muscles and occipitalis occipitalis stylohyoid posterior belly of digastric auricular muscles and your occipitalis this muscles are supplied by this posterior auricular branch and uh, this branch is coming this branch is uh, uh, giving uh, five other branches like and this nerve is coming it's continuing like this and posterior auricular branch is there and this nerve is dividing into five branches we have a temporal branch we have a temporal branch uh, inside this parotid gland we have a temporal branch a zygomatic branch, a upper buccal branch, a lower buccal branch, which is just below the duct of the parotid. Then we have the marginal mandibular branch and the cervical branch and the cervical branch. So these are uh, on the five branches of a facial nerve in this uh, after this level. Done. So we discuss the full course. Let's talk about the intercranial segment. So we have a labyrinthine segment here. Just before uh, this is internal acoustic meters. So after this, we have the labyrinthine segment in the uh, um, this in tympanic plate. That's uh, in this part. We have the tympanic segment and the mastoid segment, which is present in the posterior wall. So labyrinthine segment, tympanic segment, and mastoid segment. Then we talk about upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So you know about the upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons from a physiology part. <clears throat> your upper motor neurons just come like this and relay and gives your lower motor neurons okay element 
so you know about the lesions what happens in the lesions human lesion leads to spastic paralysis element lesions lead to flaccid paralysis where clonus will be present where spasticity is present where class night spasticity is present and uh, you know a lot of things like uh, to, uh, things like a uh, babinski sign you know about the babinski sign right you know about the babinski sign thing and uh, about uh, intermittent rigidity how it is there and what are the features and all so you know a lot uh, not going to details of this let's discuss the upper motor neuron lesion versus the lower motor neuron lesion so uh, if, if there is the lesion of your upper motor neuron if there is a lesion of the upper motor neuron then uh, just remember that it will affect it will affect this part of the face it will affect the contralateral lower half of the face if there is upper motor neuron lesion in this part in this part then it will affect this part the opposite part if there is upper motor neuron lesion upper motor ne neuron lesion of uh, like right upper motor right upper motor neuron lesion so it will affect the left part the uh, lower half of the left face lower half of the left face but if there is lower motor neuron lesion uh, it will ha have your ipsilateral facial paralysis that is called the Be bell's palsy that is uh, the same side lower motor neuron lesion will cause the same side paralysis that is your ipsilateral facial paralysis or your bell's palsy what are the features you can see inability to wrinkle the bow drooping eyelid and inability to puff cheeks asymmetrical smile and drooping corner of mouth or dry mouth let's talk about the injuries at different levels what are the injuries at different levels of the facial nerve so we have the injury at the level of stylomastoid foramen at the at this level so what will be there if this branch will uh, damage this all branches will be damaged so after this case is injury at the level of stylomastoid foramen there will be ipsilateral facial paralysis that is your bell's palsy at this level you will have your bell's palsy present all these branches are affected right so we have your bell's palsy and uh, injury on the posterior wall above the quadrat tympani mastoid segment in uh, injury on the posterior wall above the quadrat tympani let's say it's a quadrat tympani so this one from here it is injured okay so what will happen this this uh, quadrat tympani nerve this is also above above quadrat tympani means and that is the quadrat tympani nerve is damaged quadrat tympani nerve is also damaged so ipsilateral facial paralysis of course it will occur and then be ipsilateral loss of taste from the anterior two third because the quadrat tympani is taking the taste from the anterior two third of the tongue except the circumvallate papillae so there will be ipsilateral loss of taste from anterior two third and there will be reduced salivation reduced salivation as this uh, your submandibular and sublingual glands are these are uh, affected the uh, injury at the level of lateral semicircular canal c is a lateral semicircular canal is present here and uh, injury at this level c level so we have the branch from stapedius also which is uh, being affected now so all features of case c will occur uh, sorry here all the features of case b will occur and then you will have your hyperacusis hyperacusis is the enhanced sensitivity to hearing because the stapedius muscle is now not working with a pulley like action so you have the enhanced sensitivity to hearing that is the hyperacusis then injury at the level of geniculate ganglion okay so have upper injury now at the level of geniculate ganglion at the level of geniculate ganglion so uh, the lower parts these are all parts these all parts will be affected these all parts will be affected so what will the uh, features that all features of case c will occur and loss of taste from the soft palate also this is your loss of taste loss of taste from the soft palate because a palatal branch has been given here the course in the course it is not seen let me show you somewhere else that i have drawn um palate yes soft palate taste sensations are going into the median nerve remember so there is a loss of taste sensation um, um there is a loss of sensations you can say loss of taste from a soft palate and this injury at the level of geniculate ganglion that can lead to crocodile tear syndrome which is also called as a bogorad syndrome uh, in this during regeneration if there is a, a same same phenomenon now as that of freeze syndrome it is related but distinct uh, so in face syndrome as um, the, there's an auricular temporal nerve injury but here is the injury of facial nerve at the level of a geniculate ganglion at the labyrinthine segment so the, in, uh, in crocodile tear syndrome if there will be regeneration occurring then in the time of regeneration there is damage there is injury at the level of geniculate ganglion but afterwards it will try to regenerate during regeneration your secretomotor fibers for a salivary gland your secretomotor fibers for the salivary gland will accidentally grow into your lacrimal gland they accidentally grow into your endoneural tube of nerve 
to the lacrimal gland so if there is salivary stimulus it will lead to lacrimation as a crocodile does while eating its prey uh, there will be false tears so you uh, tell like um, that sort of thing so this is about a crocodile tear syndrome so that completes the facial now let's move ahead so now let's talk about our ear anatomy of the ear so ear has uh, its three bones malleus incus and stapes these are called as the ear ossicles where stapes is the smallest bone in the body and um, this these are present at an angle of 55 degree with it like uh, this tympanic membrane is present at an angle of 55 degree we'll see and it is attached to the lateral processor malleolus and all we'll see about it external ear let's discuss the nub supply nub supply what is the nub supply the lateral part lateral upper two-third is supplied with the auriculotemporal nerve is supplied with the auriculotemporal nerve and the medial surface is supplied by your upper two-third medial surface of upper two-third is supplied by lesser occipital nerve your auricular temporal lamb and the lesser occipital lamb is supplying the medial surface and uh, uh, that uh, this this part this part is your external acoustic meters this part is supplied and your canal is supplied with the auricular branch of seventh nerve and your arnold's nerve and your arnold's nerve that is your tenth nerve and lobule is supplied by your great auricular nerve not your greater auricular it is a great auricular nerve Lobule supplied by the great auricular nerve. What is the blood supply? Superficial temporal artery and posterior auricular artery. Do you remember uh, the, the scalp? This was your auricle, and your STA was like coming like this in the uh, uh, in this part, and your uh, posterior auricular artery was uh, present like this. Yes, and then you had your occipital artery like this. Okay, so if you just uh, remember your scalp, the section of scalp, uh, it is the, the blood supply of the ear is also easy. Tympanic membrane, what is the shape and size? Shape is the oval 9 into 10 mm and makes an angle of 55 degree with the floor of meters, which I was telling here. So, it makes the angle of 55 degree with the floor of the meters. It has a cuticular layer, which is made up of stratified squamous epithelium cuticular layer. Uh, so this is this is the cuticular layer of the tympanic membrane this is your fibrous layer of the tympanic membrane we have a umbo present what is the umbo we will see and then we have uh, a mucus layer so what what layers we have we have a uh, fibrous layer uh, we have the cuticular layer we have the fibrous layer and the mucus layer cfm okay and uh, this is a handle of the malleus handle of the malleus and this is a fibrocartilaginous ring which is present in your fibrous layer and this mucus layer, this is made up of a low columnar epithelium. Low columnar, you, know, you can see cuboidal epithelium also. Let's talk about the uh, middle layer. That is your middle layer is your fibrous layer. So talking about the middle layer, we have inner radiating and inner uh, outer radiating and inner circular fibers. Outer radiating and inner circular fibers. Let's talk about this. We have a fibrocartilage ring here, and these are your inner circular fibers. And some fibers are radiating like this. Some fibers are radiating like this. These are called as outer radiating fibers. Understood? Then let's talk about uh, the tympanic membrane. This is your tympanic membrane. We have the pars flaccida. This is called as a pars flaccida, and uh, this is called as a pars tensa. Pars flaccida, pars tensa. Uh, pars uh, flaccida is flaccid type, and pars tensa is just stretched. Okay. And then if the anterior malleolar fold, the posterior malleolar fold. This is a lateral process of malleolus. And here is a uh, we have a like point of maximum convexity. This is convex, like it is convex. So the point of maximum convexity, where the point is maximum, it is convex maximally. It is called as your umbo. Umbo is the point of maximum convexity. So the, this is the uh, point and. Uh, a cone of light is seen in the anterior inferior quadrant anterior inferior quadrant so talking about this we have the past placida here the anterior fold the sort of posterior fold the anterior fold and uh, we have our yes yes we have our umbo here present and the cone of light is seen in anterior inferior quadrant the past tensa let's check this is also another diagram which is showing it and uh, okay Yes, so uh, how is the quadrate tympani nerve that is running? This is a malleus, this is a malleus, and uh, this is a pars flaccida, this is a pars flaccida part, this is a pars tensa part. The seventh nerve is going like this. So, uh, the quadrate tympani nerve, the quadrate tympani nerve is like moving like this below, is like moving below, is like uh, moving posterior to this malleus, is like posterior to the malleus. You can uh, uh, check here. This auricular branch of corda tympani is supplying the auricle. So corda tympani now must be supplying the middle ear cavity as well. Uh, how it is going inside the middle ear cavity? 
आर्टेरियल सप्लाई वे आउटर सर्फेस दैट आउटर सर्फेस कंपेनिंग कंपेनिंग सप्लाइड बाय डीप ऑरिकुलर आर्टरी डीप ऑरिकुलर आर्टरी दैट इज सप्लाइंग आउटर सर्फेस ऑफ योर टिम्पेनिक मेम्ब्रेन व्हिच इज द पार्ट ऑफ ए फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ ए मैक्सिलरी आर्टरी दैट इज अ वी टू नॉट द वी टू आई वाज टॉकिंग अबाउट द नर्व यस एंड द एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड आर्टरी एक्सटर्न इट इज अ ब्रांड ऑफ ए एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड आर्टरी सो एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड आर्टरी गिव्स अ फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैक्सिलरी विच सप्लाई विच इज गिव्स अ डीप ऑरिकुलर आर्टरी एंड दिस डीप ऑरिकुलर आर्टरी इज सप्लाइंग द आउटर सर्फेस ऑफ ए टिम्पेनिक मेम्ब्रेन इनर सर्फेस इज सप्लाइड द एंटीरियर टिम्पेनिक आर्टरी एंटीरियर टिम्पेनिक आर्टरी एंड इट्स पोस्टीरियर टिम्पेनिक ब्रांच सो दिस एंटीरियर टिम्पेनिक आर्टरी इज बेसिकली ए पार्ट ऑफ योर फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैक्सिलरी आर्टरी इज ए बेसिकली फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ मैक्सिलरी आर्टरी विच इन टर्न इज अ ब्रांच ऑफ योर ई Branch of your ECA. This ECA is giving a first part of maxillary, and this first part of maxillary artery is giving you anterior tympanic artery. And this ECA is also giving a posterior auricular artery, posterior auricular artery, which gives stylomastoid artery. And this stylomastoid artery is the branch, the posterior tympanic branch, and is the branch of your stylomastoid artery. So arterial supply, outer deep auricular, and your inner is the anterior tympanic. Lymphatic drainage, outer and inner, both are pre-auricular and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Both are draining into pre-auricular and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Venous drainage on outer surface supplied the external jugular vein, and the inner surface with the transverse sinus. We'll discuss about the durable and sinuses. Inner surface with the transverse sinus, outer surface with the external jugular vein. Nerve supply. Let's talk the outer part and the inner part. So outer part is posterior superior quadrant. Nerve supply is the auricular branch of tenth nerve. Auricular branch of tenth nerve and anterior inferior quadrant by the auriculo temporal nerve. Right? Auriculo temporal. Inner part the tympanic branch of ninth nerve through the tympanic plexus. Tympanic branch of ninth nerve through the tympanic plexus. So which nerves are there? Your auricular auricular branch of tenth nerve, auriculo temporal nerve, and tympanic branch of ninth nerve through the tympanic plexus. Let's talk about the clinical anatomy. Your incision to tympanic membrane is called the myringotomy, and uh, we should be uh, very careful with the cauda tympani nerve, so so that it is not damaged. Uh, like it is given the lower part of the tympanic membrane. Incision to myringotomy. This is given the lower part, lower part, and uh, we put the tube in place. Let's talk about the ear ossicles, which can come as a short note. So talking about the ear ossicles, these are the real time structures. Uh, your inculo stapedial joint, in inculo stapedial joint, which is incus. So what we have, we have your malleus. This is a malleus. This is a incus. This is a stapes. This malleus is called as a hammer. This incus is called as an anvil, and the stapes is also called as a stirrup. So the malleus, incus, stapes, or the hammer, anvil, uh, anvil, and stirrup. This um, mal inculo malleolar, inculo malleolar joint, inculo malleolar joint is a saddle variety of joint. While the inculo stapedial joint, inculo stapedial joint is a ball and socket type of joint. And uh, stapes is the smallest bone in the body. We know this. So this is this is a malleus incus and stapes which are given here. We have um, of malleus of malleus. We have a head. We have a neck part. We have the lateral process. We have an anterior process and a medial process. So which is not very prominent. And then we have the handle. This handle of the malleus give in attachment to your tensor tympani muscle, your TT tensor tympani muscle, and this is the body. This is the body of uh, your uh, uh, incus. This is the body of your incus, and this is a short process which gives attachment to the posterior ligament, and then we have a long process body, short process, and a long process, and a lentiform nodule is present. Lentiform nodule, and this lentiform nodule is uh, generally connecting to the head of your stapes. This head of your stapes there is there, and the neck is there. Then the posterior crust and the anterior crust of stapes is there, and the foot plate. Posterior crust, anterior crust, and the foot plate of the stapes. And this foot plate of the stapes is attached to the oval window. It's attached to the oval window. And this neck is basically giving uh, attachment to a stapedius muscle. The stapedius muscle is the smallest muscle in the human body. The stapes is the smallest bone. In this head um, in epitympanic recess, it is attached attaching to the superior and lateral ligament. Superior and lateral ligament. And this to this lateral process, there is the attachment of the malleolar folds, the anterior malleolar fold and the posterior malleolar fold. These are said in the basis of your lateral process of your malleus, and uh, your uh, anterior process giving origin to your anterior ligament of malleolus, anterior ligament of malleolus. And this handle is attaching to the tympanic membrane, and also giving attachment to your tensor tympani. So these are all about your uh, ear ossicles. Let's move on to the middle ear cavity. Very very important. Very very important cavity. It is a middle ear cavity. Let's discuss the middle ear cavity. Then we'll supply and uh, discuss the art arterial supply and all of the middle ear cavity. Uh, let's 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 get into it. 
so middle ear cavity this is your middle ear cavity and uh, what walls are there so uh, we have removed the lateral wall we have removed the lateral wall uh, first wall is the anterior wall this orange one is the anterior wall this orange one is the anterior wall uh, let's take some other colors so as to prevent any confusion yes this is your anterior wall this is your anterior wall anterior wall and this one is a posterior wall this one is a posterior wall and you can say this is your roof this is your roof is this is your floor and lateral wall is not the lateral wall will be tympanic membrane tympanic membrane will form the lateral wall which is which must be covering this box and this is a medial wall this is a medial wall so what features we have uh, like uh, what what are the things so roof roof is formed by tegment tympani tegment tympani is a part of your temporal bone so roof this roof is formed by tegment tympani which is forming the roof which is a part of your temporal bone which is part of your temporal bone then we have the dura mater and the arachnoid this is a dura mater green one and this is the arachnoid red one and then we have the brain then we have the brain understood so these are this all are this all are you can say are forming the roof or you can say the superior wall then the floor floor is called uh, floor is called the jugular wall this is a floor where and the floor lies over the superior bulb of internal jugular vein this li lies over your superior bulb of your in internal jugular vein and uh, this wall this wall is called as a jugular wall green wall is called as a jugular wall and anterior wall is called as a carotid wall anterior wall this is anterior wall which is called as a carotid wall uh, what are the features of this carotid wall is that we have a canal for tensor tympani muscle tensor tympani muscle is a canal for tensor tympani where it is uh, acting like a pulley this uh, we have a conical process here which is called as a processus cochleari formis processus cochleari formis which is a bony projection and acts as a pulley for your tensor tympani muscle then what things we have we have your eustachian tube this is your eustachian tube which is just entering into your uh, anterior wall this eustachian tube is entering into your anterior wall and this carotid wall this has nerves 1 and 2 what are the nerves 1 and 2 this one one and uh, this one is a two what are these nerves so you can write your inferior carotico tympanic nerve and your inf inferior carotico tympanic nerve superior carotico tympanic nerve the inferior carotico tympanic nerve these are sympathetic nerves okay i uh, uh, you can write your sctn sctn and your ictn sctn and your ictn so this these nerves are there uh, one and two sctn and your ictn and these are originating these are originating from a tympanic plexus um, that tympanic plexus okay and then have the medial wall medial wall medial wall is this one this is a medial wall this is a medial wall and medial wall has a promontory what is a promontory it is formed due to basal turn of the cochlea the cochlea turns posteriorly and forms your uh, elevation which elevation is called the promontory this is called the promontory promontory and uh, then we have a oval window which uh, to which the foot plate of the steps is attached we talked about this we have a oval window here we have a round window here oval window here to which the foot plate of steps is attached and the round window that is called the foramen rotundum round window uh, which is in posterior inferior to the promontory oval window posterior superior it is called the secondary tympanic membrane this round window is also called as a secondary tympanic membrane secondary tympanic membrane and there's a nerve going out there's a nerve going out like like this this is called as a Jacobson's nerve, which is a tympanic branch of ninth nerve. This tympanic branch of ninth nerve, which we talked about uh, here. Just let me check where we, where we had uh, discussed. Uh, I guess we talked about somewhere, right? The tympanic branch of right nerve in a tympanic membrane. Where is the tympanic membrane? Lymphatic nerve supply, yes. Tympanic branch of ninth nerve. This inner part, inner part of your tympanic membrane was being supplied by the tympanic branch of ninth nerve through the tympanic plexus. So this is the nerve supply uh, of the uh, this causing the nerve supply of your tympanic plexus. Uh, sorry, of your uh, inner surface of your tympanic membrane. Then, then what about your? Uh, uh, this is anterior wall. We talked about the anterior wall. This anterior wall, uh, this relation, internal carotid artery must be present. This both nerves one and two. This uh, superior carotico tympanic nerve and the inferior carotico tympanic nerve. These are going and forming a loop. This is forming a plexus around the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery, carotid plexus and all. And uh, you have the anterior wall and the posterior wall is there. This is the posterior. Let's talk about the posterior wall. So, uh, what what um, uh, things we have is that. Posterior wall is also called the mastoid wall, which gives a aditus 
opening to the mastoid antrum which has an impression for the seventh nerve we talked about the seventh nerve it was going through the mastoid wall so this uh, this segment of the seventh nerve which was going through the uh, mastoid wall was called as a mastoid segment and this is a pyramidal eminence also this has a pyramidal eminence lateral wall is a tympanic eminence which is removed let's talk about the posterior wall so in the posterior wall you can see there is this uh, um, impression for lateral semicircular canal is there in the medial wall in the medial wall and additus to mastoid antrum uh, there is there is a uh, impression for the seventh nerve this is an impression for the seventh nerve which is present in the in this uh, posterior wall and uh, th then there is a pyramidal eminence pyramidal eminence to which a stapedius tendon is inserted pyramidal eminence to which the stapedius tendon is inserted and there is a additus to mastoid antrum there is a additus to mastoid antrum there is opening to the mastoid antrum so so th that's that's all about your middle ear cavity let's discuss what are the different things which are there you can see the diagram which is which is from your uh, gray's atlas of anatomy you can see this diagram yes okay then uh, uh, this this diagram was also uh, the components which are seeing this we are seeing the at directly at the medial wall the medial wall you can just see and uh, here it is turned and medial wall is removed so you can see a lateral wall here tympanic membrane is still intact you can just download the gray's atlas of anatomy and look at the structures if you want if you have time and if you want to explore more let's talk about the arterial supply of the middle ear so we have the anterior tympanic branch of maxillary artery posterior tympanic branch of stylomastoid artery and the middle meningeal artery branch of ascending pharyngeal artery and tympanic branch of internal carotid artery all the tympanic branches like anterior tympanic branch of maxillary artery posterior tympanic branch of stylomastoid artery middle meningeal artery branch of ascending pharyngeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery remember it is it was a uh, medial uh, the me medial branch of your external carotid artery and tympanic branch of internal carotid artery also venous drainage is by superior petrosal sinus and the pterygoid venous plexus pvp and the superior petrosal sinus superior petrosal sinus lymphatic drainage pre auricular lymph nodes and the retropharyngeal lymph nodes nerve supply tympanic branch of ninth nerve that is a jacobson's nerve it supplies the mucous membrane of tympanic cavity of mastoid air cells and the auditory tube tympanic branch of your ninth nerve then jacobson's nerve it is supplying it supplies the uh, mucous membrane of the tympanic cavity of mastoid air cells and auditory tube and a superior inferior carotico tympanic nerve the nerves which you are uh, seeing there you can just write this clinical so we have done with the middle ear let's uh, discuss middle ear infection it's called the otitis media otitis media and children are more prone due to horizontally placed eustachian tube we have acute otitis media or chronic otitis media depending upon them so this is a otitis media there's a fluid accumulation and inflammation of the middle ear you can see uh, in this myringotomy uh, that uh, not the myringotomy imaging technique is there and detection is where this uh, raman proof is used and raman spectra is used for detection so that's all about the ear let's move on to our next part so let's discuss about the tongue let's discuss about the tongue and uh, if you're going through the tongue we have the features of the tongue that is a root tip and the body root of the tongue tip of the tongue and the body of the tongue the root is attached to hyoid bone mandible and the styloid process and uh, tip is attached to the central incisors connected to the central incisors body has a dorsal surface and a ventral surface let's look at the dorsal surface so you have the uh, uh, sulcus terminalis a uh, uh, sulcus which is separating the tongue into your posterior one third and the anterior two third and uh, the meeting point of two sulcus terminalis is the foramen cecum and uh, here here you have a uh, medial sulcus median sulcus median sulcus which is also called the median furrow and this foramen cecum which is a remnant of a thyroglossal duct is a remnant of a thyroglossal duct anterior two third is the oral part contains a medial furrow median furrow or median sulcus and posterior one third is pharyngeal part is a rough part and uh, lymph lymphoid tissue is present that is the lingual tonsils are present so you can uh, see here these are all the structures you can just take a screenshot of this diagram done okay so we have in the dorsal surface we have this superior epiglottic uh, we have this uh, lateral epiglottic fold glossa epiglottal fold this is our lateral glossa epiglottal fold and the medial ep glossa epiglottal fold and on the either side this is called the vallecula vallecula is present in the either side so we're talking about the oral part anterior two third lingual papillae are present projection of lamina propria which are projections of the lamina propria so this is your uh, dorsal aspect of the tongue this is the epiglottis and from epiglottis to the tongue there are 
two lateral gross epiglottic folds and a median epi gross epiglottic folds and vallicula are present in the uh, this part laterally and uh, here we have the posterior part which is full of lymphoid follicles and in the anterior part this is your main taste part which is carrying the taste sensation taste buds are present so we have this papillae this big papillae which are called as the circumvallate papillae circumvallate papillae which has the largest papillae diameter is 1 to 2 mm and 8 to 10 in number aligned in front of sulcus terminalis and taste buds are present only in the sulcus they this have this type of arrangement and taste buds are only present in the sulcus only present in the sulcus like uh, uh, it is not on the surface then not on the surface then of the foliate papillae foliate papillae which are rudimentary in uh, human uh, which is present in constant vertical groups and the location is in front of your sulcus terminalis then what papillae we have we have this fungiform papillae that are evenly distributed here these are your fungiform papillae which are red and round headed red and round headed diameter is 1 mm location is the apex and margins of the tongue the apex and the margins of the tongue contain this fungiform papillae contain this fungiform papillae and then this foliate papillae which are uh, like numerous in number these are the narrowest papillae most numerous and location is the dorsum of the tongue these are present the conical projections and located on the whole dorsum of the tongue. Then the pharyngeal part which has no papillae are present. This is uneven due to presence of lymphoid follicles. Lingual tonsils are present. Your mucous membrane is constant with the palatine tonsil and posterior to epiglottic by median and lateral glossopiglottical folds. And space between them is called as the vallicula. You know this. Let's talk about the ventral surface. The ventral surface. This is the ventral surface where you have a frenulum linguae. That is a lingual frenulum which connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Then you have on the either side we have deep lingual veins two deep lingual veins are present and in this space we have the presence of a sublingual papillae and here there are some furo like structures and some fimbrial like structures this is called as the plicae fimbriata plicae fimbriata and then we have two folds like a sublingual fold which overlay the sublingual gland <coughs> and the sublingual papillae which is the warton stuff the warton stuff opens into a sublingual papillae and this lingual artery and lingual nerve is also present medial to deep lingual vein but can't be seen in this diagram. So this is a ventral surface. Muscles of tongue, intrinsic muscles, four intrinsic muscles, four extrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscles not attached to bones, they are present in the upper part of the tongue like uh, your superior longitudinal, your transverse muscle, inferior longitudinal and the vertical muscles. And extrinsic muscles are bony attachments. That is, uh, they have genioglossus which is attached to the uh, superior genial tubercle of the mandible, hyoglossus attached to the hyoid bone, palatoglossus attached to the palate, styloglossus attached to the styloid process. Let's take a coronal section of tongue to see the intrinsic muscles. So here is our coronal section. We have like, slashed the tongue from this in this plane and uh, we are seeing. So we have this transverse muscle, this is a transverse muscle present which will narrow and elongate the tongue. It will contract there and the tongue will be narrowed like this and then we have the vertical muscles present in front like vert vertical muscles is like this here present here and here these vertical muscles are gonna broad and flatten the tongue this this will make the tongue this will make the tongue broad this will make the tongue broad and flat and then the superior longitudinal muscles present over here superior longitudinal muscles which will what will what will they do they will make the dorsum concave they will make the dorsum like this concave and this inferior longitudinal muscle inferior longitudinal muscle if they contract they will make the tongue convex they will make the tongue convex like this then we have the hyoglossus here and the styloglossus present we will see the extrinsic muscles in a while extrinsic muscles let's talk about this so we have a styloid process here, we have the palate here, we have the tongue here and the hyoid bone is present, the mandible is present. So uh, there is a muscle which is connecting the palate to the tongue which is called the palatoglossus which pulls the root of the tongue um, and your uh, genioglossus there which is also called the safety muscle, safety muscle of the tongue which has the upper band, middle band and lower band. Upper band is connected to the, uh, the body and the tip of the tongue you can say, middle band to the this uh, hyoglossus muscle and lower band to the hyoid bone. And then you have this muscle which is called the hyoglossus muscle. This is your hyoglossus muscle. And uh, there is a styloglossus muscle present which pulls the tongue backward and upward. You pull the tongue like this in this direction, the tongue will move in this direction backward and upward. And hyoglossus of the, uh, this will make uh, the dorsum of the tongue. This will uh, like depress the sides of the tongue to make the dorsum convex. Talking about genioglossus, genioglossus originates from a superior genial tubercular mandible, inserts into your upper fibers, insert into tip of the tongue, middle fibers into dorsum of the tongue, lower fibers into hyoid bone and upper fibers uh, tip of the tongue they are attaching so they will retract the tongue obviously middle fibers to the dorsum so will, they will depress the tongue lower fibers to the hyoid bone so what it will do is it will protrude the tongue so this is called the safety muscle of the tongue it prevents the falling of the tongue so it is providing a stability to the tongue 
let's talk about the arterial supply so we have the internal carotid artery here internal carotid artery the common carotid dividing internal and external this external carotid artery is giving an ascending pharyngeal branch and uh, it's giving a facial artery in this facial artery in this region facial artery is giving a tonsillar artery which is supplying the tongue then of the lingual artery which is dividing into a deep lingual artery and two dorsal lingual arteries which are also supplying the tongue also giving an innervation to your sublingual gland Let's talk about the venous drainage. So we have the deep lingual vein, which is the principal vein of tongue, and the vena comitantis, the vena comitantis, which runs with the lingual artery and uh, with the twelfth uh, nerve. Okay. Talking about the lymphatic drainage uh, from this part, the posterior part, these are drained to deep cervical lymph nodes. Mo you can see major of the structures of the head and neck are drained into a deep cervical lymph nodes only. Then we have submandibular uh, lymph nodes. We have the submandibular lymph nodes here and uh, uh, draining into sub uh, mandibular lymph nodes and this uh, from this upper part of the tip this draining to sub mental lymph node talking about nerve supply where the internal uh, laryngeal nerve is supplying this epiglottis part this uh, valicular part this is supplied by the internal laryngeal nerve ILN okay ILN which is the branch of your 10th nerve this whole posterior part is drained by the uh, ninth nerve, drained by the ninth nerve, and the cauda tympani nerve is taking the sensation of the anterior two third, anterior two third of the tongue, and to accept the circumvallate papillae, which are uh, like supplied by the ninth nerve, which is also supplied by the ninth nerve, and uh, we have also the lingual nerve that is supplying this whole part, the lingual nerve that is supplying this whole part. Talking about clinicals, so muscles of tongue are supplied by all the muscles supplied by your 12th nerve, all the muscles are supplied by the 12th nerve, except your palatoglossus which is supplied by the vagal accessory complex or you can uh, make, uh, or you can write the answer as the 10th nerve or you can write the answer as the 10th nerve. Your hypoglossal nerve injury on one side, uh, so if the patient protrude the tongue, there will be ipsilateral deviation. So right hypoglossal nerve paralysis will cause a right deviation of tongue. And sorbitate, what is sorbitate? It's a sublingual drug and it can directly go into your systemic circulation due to rich vasculature of the tongue in case of angina pectoris. So its sorbitate is given in case of angina pectoris and it is a sublingual drug. And ankyloglossal means tongue thread. This is due to a short lingual frenulum. Your lingual frenulum is very short like this. So there will be the patient will be tongue tied, tongue tied patient. And glossitis, we have many types of glossitis also. Glossitis means so, uh, there's inflammation of the tongue. This is normal tongue. There are many types like this uh, squamative and folded and candida glossitis, ulcerative glossitis. And then uh, this all, this all, this all, atropic blood, this is all. Okay. So that completes your tongue. Let's move on to the next part. Let's now talk about the muscles of the pharynx. What I did now. Yes. Muscles of the pharynx. So talking about this, we have three longitudinal muscles and three circular muscles that three longitudinal muscles are your stylopharyngeus your palatopharyngeus and your salpingopharyngeus stylopharyngeus palatopharyngeus and the salpingopharyngeus stylopharyngeus supplied by ninth palatopharyngeus by tenth that is a vac and salpingopharyngeus by vac again okay and this long uh, all these long muscles that are your long uh, this longitudinal muscles they are inserting in the posterior border of thyroid cartilage this is a thyroid cartilage so they are inserting in the posterior border of this thyroid cartilage they have a common insertion and three circular muscles we have the superior constrictor middle constrictor and the inferior constrictor this inferior constrictor has three parts that is thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus thyropharyngeus and this cricopharyngeus Talking, let's talk about the muscle origin, nerve supply, and the action. So, superior constrictor. Let's talk about the superior constrictor first. This one. We'll uh, see first. Uh, well, uh, let me discuss the origin and all. Uh, so, this is a superior. And this is a superior constrictor. This is a superior constrictor. It is attached. First attachment is to the pterygoid hemulus. First attachment is to the pterygoid hemulus. Then it is posterior to the mylohyoid line. Or you can um, like uh, post mylohyoid line is also present posterior to mylohyoid line pterygoid hemulus pterygomandibular raphe and also attaches to the glossopharyngeus muscle that is the side of the tongue also attaches to your glossopharyngeus muscle this is a pterygomandibular raphe you can see here where it is attaching that's originating sorry so these are the originates and insertion is again to the pharyngeal raphe insertion is to the pharyngeal raphe same common common uh, insertion uh, not the common insertion uh, sorry what have to do? Yes. Uh, so these are these are your origin and uh, insertion is to your pharyngeal raphe. Insertion is to your pharyngeal raphe. Com nerve supplies the vagus nerve and action is the constriction of pharynx. 
constriction of pharynx so all these muscles all these uh, pharyngeal muscles these are uh, supplied by the ninth nerve that is the stylopharyngeus ninth nerve superior constrictor ninth nerve middle constrictor ninth nerve inferior constrictor ninth nerve so we can write a statement that all the muscles let me make it thin all the muscles of pharynx are supplied by the ninth nerve except except two muscles except two muscles that is your palato pharyngeus let's see palato pharyngeus we have written bac that is a vagal accessory complex that is your 10th nerve and your salpingo pharyngeus salpingo pharyngeus that is also supplied by bac done so this statement is very very important it is often asked by the examiner by your teachers and all uh, such 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 statement we had also in your uh, uh, tongue part that all the muscles of the tongue are being supplied by your uh, 12th nerve but except which one except your palatoglossus which is supplied by which nerve palatoglossus was being supplied by your 10th nerve that is a vagal accessory complex then we have a middle constrictor middle constrictor again supplied by the vagus nerve i don't need to tell these all are constrictors so constriction of pharynx will be the action middle constrictor uh, it has the narrowest origin it has the narrowest origin it originates from the lower part of a stylohyoid ligament your ss ligament uh, this is a stylohyoid ligament this one this is a stylohyoid ligament uh, it is originating the middle constrictor is originating from the stylohyoid ligament from the lesser horn of hyoid bone this is originating from the lesser cornua lesser cornua the lesser horn of your hyoid bone and upper border of your greater cornua this greater cornua this is the greater cornua uh, like this and it is originating from the upper border of your greater cornua from a stylohyoid ligament from the lesser cornua and from the greater cornua this is the middle constrictor that is originating and this middle constrictor is supplied by the vagus nerve and it will do the constriction of pharynx let's talk about the inferior constrictor this is uh, like uh, originating from the oblique line of thyroid cartilage that is from your thyropharyngeus or your cricoid cartilage that is your cricopharyngeus two parts thyropharyngeus cricopharyngeus if it originates from the thyroid cartilage oblique line of thyroid cartilage we had an oblique line of thyroid cartilage is it visible yes thyroid cartilage uh, sorry cricoid cartilage is there and uh, this is your oblique line of thyroid cartilage this one this one oblique line of thyroid cartilage and this is your cricoid cartilage so the muscle that is uh, originating from the oblique line of thyroid cartilage is called as a thyro thyro thyropharyngeus okay thyropharyngeus and the muscle that is originating from the cricoid cartilage is also is called as a cricopharyngeus supplied by the vagus nerve and it will also do constriction of pharynx that's all that's all about your muscles of your pharynx and uh, let's now talk what is what is the uh, palato pharyngeus how it is going so you have your hyoid bone here and uh, the palato pharyngeus sorry your palate here sorry what i have done so palate here and your palato pharyngeus is going into the pharynx and uh, this this palato pharyngeus it, it forms a ridge this forms a ridge type of structure a uh, uh, like circular structure which is called the passavant ridge passavant ridge passavant ridge is formed by your stylo your superior superior constrictor as well as your palato pharyngeus it is formed combinedly a superior constrictor and and your uh, palato pharyngeus okay this is superior constrictor middle constrictor and your uh, that low in, uh, inferior constrictor this inferior constrictor has a thyropharyngeus part this is the thyropharyngeus part and the cricopharyngeus part this lower part is the cricopharyngeus part and um, this this uh, a reason is there in this uh, middle this this dotted one this is called as a kilian's dehiscence kilian's dehiscence which is a zone of weakness between your thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus as this have different nerve supplies there is neuronal incoordination the thyropharyngeus is supplied with the vagal accessory complex the thyropharyngeus is supplied with the vagal accessory complex the cricopharyngeus is supplied with the recurrent laryngeal nerve this recurrent laryngeal nerve is supplying that is a 10th nerve that is supplying your cricopharyngeus so there is a zone uh, there is a weakness so if there is a uh, neuronal incoordination between these two parts if there is neuronal incoordination this both are supplied with the 10th nerve but vagal accessory complex in this part and recurrent laryngeal nerve in this part neuronal incoordination is responsible uh, so the bolus may pull the uh, push the wall of pharynx at the side of this uh, bolus comes and push the walls of uh, your pharynx 
and uh, this may form which is called as your Jenkers diverticulum. Jenkers diverticulum. This is the mucosal diverticulum. Pouch like structure which will form due to uh, at the region at the region of your uh, Killian's Dyson's. This is called the Jenkers diverticulum. And this is present the posterior lateral wall of the pharynx. This is a Jenkers diverticulum. You can see this from behind. So this is the Killian's Dyson's, or you can say it is your Killian's tri uh, triangle. Killian's triangle. If it comes in your exam, you can uh, just explain like this. Then the thyropharyngeus is there, and uh, your cricopharyngeus is the cricopharyngeus muscle is there. The thyropharyngeus on both the sides, the cricopharyngeus. This is forming a triangle. Potential space between two parts of inferior constrictor muscle, that is oblique fibers of thyropharyngeus and the transverse fibers of cricopharyngeus. It is forming a triangle, or you can say like this that uh, it is forming a zone. Uh, thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus is forming a zone which is called the Killian's Dyson and here Jenkers diverticulum may be formed so this these are your things and uh, these are your muscles here also let's 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 uh, discuss this okay so this is the base of the skull this is the base of the skull how it is how the muscles are being arranged so you can see uh, you have your pharyngeal raphe, you have your pharyngeal raphe going uh, like this, vertically like this and then your superior constrictor is there, this medial constrictor is there and the inferior constrictor is there. <coughs> we have a sinus of morganglin that is formed in the base of the skull, between the base of the skull, pharyngeal raphe and the superior constrictor bounded by the base of the skull superiorly, laterally by your sinus of morganglin and the um, superior constrictor uh, inferiorly like below. <coughs> we have a sinus of morgagni and the sinus of morgagni what are the contents of sinus of morgagni so we have this auditory tube that is go, uh, going into a sinus of morgagni and then have the levator valley palati uh, palatine muscle which is uh, not much important we don't have to discuss this we have the pal palatine branch of your ascending pharyngeal artery palatine branch of your ascending pal uh, pa pharyngeal artery we have a palatine branch and an ascending palatine artery itself ascending palatine artery artery so we had a we have a palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery and an ascending pal palatine artery and your auditory tube which are the main contents of your sinus of morgagni uh, between the space of a middle constrictor and a superior constrictor, we have the stylopharyngeus muscle. Stylopharyngeus muscle is present and the ninth nerve is present here. And between the space in your uh, middle constrictor, between your middle constrictor and inferior constrictor, uh, we have the internal laryngeal nerve that is present and a superior laryngeal artery. Inferior laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal artery. And below, below the inferior constrictor, we have the inferior laryngeal uh, artery, inferior laryngeal artery and a recurrent laryngeal nerve. Done? And this membrane, there's a covenant membrane, this is called a thyrohyoid membrane. You can see this, this you can see this all. Uh, this is inferior constrictor. So, which two things are give, uh, going? Your recurrent laryngeal nerve that is going, and your in, inferior laryngeal artery that is going. And this is a uh, branch of your internal thoracic artery. Okay. Then your superior laryngeal nerve, superior laryngeal nerve, uh, and your. Uh, Superior laryngeal nerve was going and your inferior uh, in, uh, ILN that is the inferior laryngeal uh, ILN okay ILN inferior laryngeal uh, nerve and your superior laryngeal artery the superior laryngeal nerve and uh, ILN that is the inferior laryngeal nerve that is going uh, between this space well gone yes and uh, here what we have in the, this sinus of morgagni space we have this sinus of morgagni this is the sinus of morgagni which is formed uh, we, we uh, shown structure in a like uh, this format in a 2d format but here, here you can see the 3d it is not lying in this plane it is present uh, like deep this is sinus of morgagni it's a region it is recess type of thing and covered with the pharyngobacillar fascia your pharyngobacillar fascia is covering the sinus of morgagni and here uh, your stylopharyngeus muscle and this, this all are going into uh, in this part the stylopharyngeus muscle basically is present with the superior constrictor and the middle constrictor and your ninth nerve also this is also present um, here okay and in your uh, sinus of morgagni you will have our auditory tube that will be present you can have your auditory tube and your lvp muscle then palatine branch of ascending phy uh, pharyngeal artery and the ascending palatine artery so that completes your pharynx let's move on to the next concept
let's now move on to the gloss of pharyngeal nerve so what i did how is my approach i covered your whole tongue part and the pharynx part then i am going to gloss gloss of pharyngeal nerve you can correlate very well now you can correlate very very well now so it arises from your pons the uh, your uh, junction of the pons and medulla uh, you can say from the medulla oblongata just a little bit down it arises and uh, this gloss of pharyngeal nerve will arise and go down uh, through a jugular foramen it will form two ganglions that is superior and inferior ganglions superior and inferior ganglions from this uh, ganglions from this inferior ganglion superior inferior ganglion from this inferior ganglion there will be a tympanic branch that is called the jacobson's nerve remember the jacobson's nerve the ninth branch which is also supplying the inner surface of your tympanic membrane which was uh, like uh, going uh, from your uh, that floor of the this uh, part okay uh, and was reaching a medial wall of your uh, middle ear and from, um, like contributing to your tympanic plexus understood and uh, then from your tympanic plexus we will have a rising of a lesser petrosal nerve lesser petrosal nerve which will go via the foramen ovale and uh, like uh, relay with the otic ganglion relay the otic ganglion and from the otic ganglion your v3 nerve will arise v3 nerve that is a mandibular nerve uh, then your auricular temporal nerve and this auricular temporal nerve is gonna supply your parotid gland so this is a secretomotor path of the parotid gland we'll see about this how it is forming and then have another another branch another branch which is uh, gonna supply the tongue uh, can can you just uh, <coughs> like uh, find out which branch is this can you just find out so this is a gloss of angel nerve that's supplying the tongue it doesn't have any specific name it doesn't have any specific name of course but uh, we'll see this is uh, okay this is the tonsillar branch okay and we have a lingual branch so a is the tonsillar branch so this one this one is a lingual branch is supplying the tongue you can just call it lingual branch doesn't have any specific name and uh, there is a branch which is supplying the stylopharyngeus so just remember that glossopharyngeal nerve this ninth nerve ninth nerve only supplies one muscle that is a stylopharyngeus that is a stylopharyngeus so it has only it is only to supply one muscle that is a stylopharyngeus understood and it is a muscle of the pharynx and then um, we have from the lingual nerve we have your arising of your tonsillar branch this tonsillar branch is supplying the tonsil and it is giving innervation to the soft palate to the soft palate and it has another branch it's called the nerve of herring this nerve of herring what it will it is doing it is supplying your carotid body and your carotid sinus carotid body and your carotid sinus understood so this is all about your course of your uh, glossopharyngeal nerve let's uh, quickly go into the secretomotor pathway of parotid gland we know about the secretomotor pathways of your uh, lacrimal gland and your submandibular and sublingual glands let's discuss the secretomotor pathway of the parotid gland it starts from your inferior salivatory nucleus uh, ninth nerve goes uh, like forms a jacobson's nerve then contributes to the tympanic plexus the lesser petrosal nerve relays into your otic ganglion from this lesser petrosal nerve it relays into your otic ganglion and from this otic ganglion v3 nerve arises v3 nerve arises in the post ganglionic fiber the mandibular nerve this mandibular nerve reaches your um, forms your auricular temporal nerve gives up your auricular temporal nerve and this auricular temporal nerve is going to supply the parotid gland so this is a secretomotor pathway of your parotid gland just remember this and what is the use of your tonsil branch it carries general sensations from tonsils of soft palate of your lingual branch it carries taste from the posterior one third of tongue and from the circumvallate papillae and this anterior two third of the tongue is supplied by a facial nerve except your circumvallate papillae we know this fact understood so just let me give in uh, summary of your parasympathetic ganglion so ganglion topographic nerve and the functional nerve from the ciliary ganglion which is topographically connected to the nasociliary nerve just try to remember try to remember we discussed this in the trisaminal nerve and the functional nerve is the third nerve the third nerve is a functional nerve okay then the uh, that third nerve is, we, we know about the third nerve that is optic nerve understood sorry your oculomotory now not your optic now what i'm saying then your pterygopalatine ganglion pterygopalatine ganglion is there uh, sorry your ter uh, pterygopalatine ganglion is there yes and topographic nerve is a uh, maxillary nerve that is a v2 nerve and functional nerve is a greater petrosal nerve greater petrosal nerve is the uh, functional nerve so you can uh, it is visible here yes otic ganglion so what is the functional nerve? functional nerve is the v2 v3 nerve v3 nerve that is your um, that uh, great sorry what happened Oh, so oh, I am talking about otic ganglion and, and uh, pointing out pterygopalatine. 
so otic ganglion your uh, that uh, topographic nerve is a v3 nerve functional nerve is a lesser petrosal nerve lesser petrosal nerve terico palatine ganglion you know about this v2 nerve was coming like this and relaying into the ppg terico palatine ganglion and from that the greater petrosal nerve was arising and all okay you know about all this and uh, submandibular ganglion the topographic nerve is a lingual nerve smg lingual nerve is topographically uh, it is connected topographically to the lingual nerve and uh, functional nerve is a cauda tympani nerve so these are all your parasympathetic ganglions topographic nerves and their functional nerves and this is nerve of herring which is there this nerve of herring and nerve of cyan which we have read, uh, read in your respiratory physiology we are talking about this only so have function in your respiration and act as your uh, like peripheral chemoreceptors and baroreceptors understood so that's all uh, in glossopharyngeal nerve let's move on to the next nerve or your next part so guys let's talk about the larynx larynx uh, what you have is that just just see the uh, skeletal framework the cartilaginous framework of the larynx so we have your epiglottis here which is just like in covering like a hood and present backward and coming to the front like the snake's hood okay and uh, here we have the greater corner of the hyoid we, uh, here we have our hyoid bone this is a hyoid bone this is a membrane here that's called the thyrohyoid membrane thyrohyoid membrane is there and then we have your superior corner of your thyroid cartilage this is the thyroid cartilage being this superior corner the superior horn of the thyroid cartilage this is the lamina of the thyroid cartilage basically this is the lamina of the thyroid cartilage then you have a corniculate if we just turn posteriorly we can find a corniculate cartilage this this is again your thyroid cartilage which is present and here here we have this, this conical shape of cartilage the corniculate cartilage is okay corniculate cartilage is and the arytenoid cartilage this corniculate cartilage is basically it's lying above the arytenoid cartilage basically lying above the arytenoid cartilage uh, understood and uh, then we have another ligament present over here which is called the cricothyroid ligament cricothyroid ligament and the inferior cornu of your thyroid cartilage is this one this is your thyroid cartilage and this is the inferior cornu inferior cornu so thyroid cartilage is basically extending like this it, it, it has a superior cornu in present in upper part this is a superior cornu and uh, then we have this in, inferior cornu in this part okay so that that's about your uh, cartilages and all so skeletal framework we have the nine cartilages present unpaired cartilages three paired cartilages three or you can say four or you can say four the fourth one is optional the triticle cartilage or the triticate cartilage it may be seen it is optional so uh, we have this unpaired cartilages we can uh, like uh, remember the mnemonic cet unpaired means sit okay unpaired means sit and uh, cet so it is cet your required cartilage the thyroid cartilage and the epiglottis epiglottis is a elastic cartilage epiglottis is a is elastic cartilage the thyroid cricoid are just hyaline cartilages talking about the pair cartilages pair cartilages uh, so paired means cat okay paired means you can remember the mnemonic cat what is cat cat means your corniculate and cuneiform cartilage corniculate and cuneiform cartilage which are elastic cartilages again and uh, you have your arytenoid cartilage for a arytenoid cartilage arytenoid cartilage is a base base of the arytenoid is is your hyaline cartilage and apex is your elastic cartilage apex is your elastic cartilage and then your triticate cartilage which is a elastic cartilage not it, it is it may be present okay so we have uh, three unpaired and uh, three or four paired let's talk about the thyroid cartilage so thyroid cartilage uh, this is a thyroid cartilage from the uh, uh, like above so female thyroid cartilage we have the angle 120 degree and the male thyroid cartilage we have 90 degree angle we have 90 degree angle that's why adam's apple is more prominent in males because it's protruding more like angle is less so it protrudes more okay and uh, talking about this we have the thyrohyoid lig uh, ligament we have the thyrohyoid ligament present over here just pay attention to this green parts the thyrohyoid ligament which is connecting the thyroid cartilage to, uh, from the base uh, from the uh, hyoid bone from the superior core horn of your hyoid bone so it, uh, this thyrohyoid uh, 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 ligament this thyroid ligament is generally providing attachment of the greater corner of the hyoid the thyroid ligament is connecting to the greater corner of the hyoid and to the superior horn the superior horn of this thyroid cartilage so it is connecting a superior horn and the greater corner of your thyro uh, your hyoid membrane understood and uh, we have we have all these things i have all these things so this uh, this uh, there is an oblique line that in the thyroid cartilage there is an oblique line in the thyroid cartilage which is uh, providing at muscle attachments to your thyrohyoid sternothyroid and the styro uh, and the thyropharyngeus the thyrohyoid sternothyroid and the thyropharyngeus this oblique line of the thyroid cartilage uh, just you can uh, 
correlate with the muscle this uh, thyropharyngeus just you can remember uh, like uh, you, you have heard the thyropharyngeus in when you were discussing the pharynx okay and it, it, it uh, attachment is your was your oblique line right and we have the cricothyroid joint here this is a cricothyroid joint this is a cricothyroid joint present over here which is a plain synovial joint and this part is called the conus elasticus conus elasticus just uh, let me uh, talk about this cartilages and uh, about arytenoid cartilage this is uh, arytenoid cartilage it is just present like uh, arytenoid cartilage has uh, this, uh, the corniculate cartilages are just lying above your arytenoid cartilages like uh, uh, like that uh, in the arytenoid cartilage this, uh, the, uh, talk about the cric cricoid cartilage let's show the cricoid cartilage this cricoid cartilage as you can see it is signet ring shaped this is a ring shaped cartilage cricoid cartilage cartilage is a signet ring shaped cartilage and we have this small cuneiform cartilages small cuneiform cartilages okay uh, which are uh, again your unpaired cartilages and corniculate cartilage corniculate cartilage which is just lying above your arytenoid cartilages and this about talking more about the arytenoid cartilage we have this as the arytenoid cartilages you can have this and this these are your arytenoid cartilages we have the posterior surface anterior lateral surface anterior medial surface and a medial surface these all are surfaces and uh, we have a muscular surface also we have a muscular surface also uh, in this in this uh, the the cartilage in this the anterior surface is this is the anterior surface of the cartilage okay this is the anterior surface of the cartilage or you can say uh, if it, it, it's the anterior medial surface you can say uh, so this notch this this notch which is called as your base okay uh, this part this part is providing attachment to uh, like uh, attachment of the vocalis muscle attachment of the vocalis muscle so you can just remember like this just don't go into complexity your attachment of the vocalis muscle is in your arytenoid cartilage and your vocal cord is attached to this vocal process of this arytenoid cartilage vocal cord is attached to the vocal process of this arytenoid cartilage just see uh, this uh, again these things are there uh, okay let's discuss these things so we are basically looking uh, at uh, the um, cartilages the cuneiform cartilage was this this section is there generally this this, this section i'm talking about this section this this section but now we have the membranes intact this section is there but the membranes are intact now membranes are intact now so we have a quadrangular membrane that is present quadrangular membrane from which is extending from epiglottis which is extending from epiglottis and to the arytenoid cartilage the arytenoid cartilage this is your arytenoid cartilage so the, the quadrangular membrane is basically extending from epiglottis to your arytenoid cartilage we have a cuneiform cartilages here the corniculate cartilages are arytenoid cartilages are here and the hyoepiglottic ligament is there there is a hyoepiglottic ligament which is connecting generally the hyoid bone with the epiglottis the hyoid bone is connected to the epiglottis by this by this ligament or you can say membrane hyoepiglottic membrane and hyoepiglottic ligament like this okay and uh, we have again a ligament which, uh, this this one you have again a ligament this part this is called the vestibular ligament and this is the lower thickening of your uh, quadrangular membrane okay the lower lower thickening of this quadrangular membrane is called as your vestibular ligament this 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 pink parts this pink parts are the vestibular ligament this is thickening of your quadrangular membrane only and then you have a vocal ligament then you have a vocal ligament which is called as the true vocal cord and then you have a cricovocal ligament also cricovocal ligament cricovocal membrane sorry not ligament and you can in this section also you can just observe uh, if you if you are uh, getting an uh, if you are just uh, if not uh, able to appreciate the things uh, just uh, i am explaining the section how it is there so basically what is happening we are seeing the posterior surface this is your posterior surface okay we have uh, cut many parts and um, cut this anterior little surface now and we are basically seeing the posterior surface here you can see the epiglottis and epiglottis must be coming to the front and if it comes to the front it will look something like this okay so we are, we are seeing this uh, this type of section we are seeing this type of section and here is a quadrangular membrane that is present and this quadrangular membrane is connecting your epiglottis to your arytenoid cartilage and lower thickening is called a vestibular ligament understood we have the vocal ligaments the true vocal cord and the cricovocal uh, cricovocal membrane also let's talk about the interior of the larynx so we have cut the larynx in coronal section we have we, had, uh, we are into the interior of the larynx so here is the quadrangular membrane here is the quadrangular membrane and the lower thickening is the vestibular membrane here is the cricovocal membrane and these these are your vocal ligaments that is your true vocal cord this vocal ligaments this vocal ligaments is a true vocal cord 
and uh, in this we have this space which is called the rv rv what is rv your rima vestibuli and rg is a rima glottidis your rima glottidis so the space between two and the false vocal cords are is called as a rima glottidis so we'll talk about that and the mucous membrane is surrounding the uh, this part like this mucous membrane is surrounding this part and it is forming a thickening here which is called as a sinus or a ventricle sinus or a ventricle and posteriorly it is forming a saccule also which is called as a saccule of the larynx Uh, so it is the anti uh, your anterior upward extension of sinus behind the thyroid cartilage so it's behind like forming behind the thyroid cartilage okay and this is called the saccule of the larynx it has many mucus glands with increased density of mucus glands present so it is called the saccule of the larynx is called as your oil can of larynx oil can of larynx and uh, this is a supraglottic space or a vestibule of the larynx is supraglottic space of the vestibule of the larynx and have a infraglottic infraglottic space is a cricoid cartilage where um, the crico vocal ligament is being attached so this is all about the interior of the larynx you can see uh, in the interior here also you can uh, relate these are your ventricles okay the ventricles and or the sinus you can say and uh, these are false vocal cords what so the false vocal cords these are uh, your uh, that uh, ligament that is a vocal ligament uh, not a vocal ligament this, is a, this false vocal cords are just just the linings okay the linings are formed by this quadrangular membrane the projections that are being formed and uh, the vocalis muscle and all this muscles are not much important. like we'll talk about the muscles in a bit lining epithelium of larynx is a respiratory epithelium that is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium where exceptions are the vocal cord in the vocal cord is stratified squamous epithelium is present in the upper and anterior surface of epiglottis here also stratified squamous epithelium is present but lining epithelium is a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium larynx is a part of a respiratory system you can say vocal cords are devoid of mucus glands vocal cord don't have mucus gland they receive mucus from saccules is called the oil can what are the muscles of larynx so we have muscles controlling the inlet muscles controlling the rima glottidis and muscles con- that are controlling the tension in the vocal cord so uh, first we have the muscles containing uh, your inlet the okay, muscles containing your inlet let's discuss about that muscles containing your inlet and uh, let's let's talk about that so we have this all muscles we have this all muscles uh, this is the epiglottis part this is epiglottis we have a muscle above uh, like uh, extending uh, anterior lateral the posterior lateral this is a thyroepiglotticus muscle thyroepiglotticus muscle and this is opening the inlet this is opening the inlet and we have the arid airy epiglotticus muscle airy epiglotticus this airy epiglotticus muscle what is this doing it's, it's, it's uh, present like this present in this manner and it is causing the closing of the inlet closing the inlet of larynx and we have uh, this we have the arytenoid cartilages arytenoid cartilages uh, so here we have the oblique arytenoid muscle oblique arytenoid muscle is like crossing decussating fibers are there oblique arytenoid which is a part of an interarytenoid the part of an interarytenoid and we have another muscle that is a transverse arytenoid between uh, that uh, part okay so oblique arytenoid transverse arytenoid this forms an interarytenoid muscle so these are uh, muscles which are controlling the inlet of the larynx so talking about this you can uh, see the muscles here you can see the muscles in this section you can see appreciate the epiglottis just wait yes you can appreciate the epiglottis the higher bone and all uh, and uh, here here you have the airy epiglotticus airy epiglotticus this is uh, like uh, going in this manner going in this manner like this and here also we had this going in this manner the airy epiglotticus and the transverse arytenoid muscles were there this is the transverse arytenoid muscle in this manner and the oblique arytenoid in this manner transverse arytenoid are just extending posterior to the oblique arytenoid and uh, the thyro epiglotticus the thyro epiglotticus is present like this these are your thyro epiglotticus thyro epiglotticus can easily draw this schematic section which is uh, showing the muscles that are controlling the la- uh, inlet okay then we are if you are seeing from the superior view if you are seeing from the superior view then this must be the thyroid cartilage these are your uh, that cornua of the uh, thyroid cartilages and uh, here we can appreciate what muscles this is the rima glottis the space between your vocal cords and uh, this is a vocal ligament this is a vocal ligament which is a true vocal ligament and this thyroarytenoid this thyroarytenoid muscle is called as a uh, like uh, false vocal ligaments okay <clears throat> so we have the um, another things like uh, rima glottis this is rima glottis and these are the muscles which are just uh, there 
so Riemann clot it is as an intermembranous part intermembranous part and the intercartilaginous part so this is the intercartilaginous part which is present between this uh, cartilages that are the vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage between the vocal process of this arytenoid cartilage there is an intercartilaginous part of the Riemann clot it is and we have the intermembranous part that is present uh, that is that is present here okay but in the membranes this this uh, vocal ligaments the surrounding the intermembranous part of this Riemann clot it is so you have these two parts you can just mark and draw it like this okay and uh, your rhymoglottid is intermembranous part and your intercartilaginous part <clears throat> so what muscles are controlling the rhymoglottid is controlling the in uh, like uh, causing the adduction and the abduction of the vocal cords causing the abduction and the adduction of the vocal cords so you have the arytenoid cartilage here with the arytenoid cartilage again here and uh, we have the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle the posterior cricoarytenoid and we have a lateral cricoarytenoid posterior cricoarytenoid and the lateral cricoarytenoid so uh, posterior cricoarytenoid is just present like this so if if they will contract if they will contract just just uh, you can see what what will happen this uh, this will go in that manner this will go in that manner that is causing an abductor so posterior cricoarytenoid it is uh, the only abductor of vocal cord only abductor of vocal cord it is the only abductor of vocal cord and posterior cricoarytenoid is called, called as a safety muscle of the larynx it is called as a safety muscle of the larynx and uh, talking about your lateral cricoarytenoid these are your lateral cricoarytenoid this and this these are lateral cricoarytenoids this when they will contract it will cause your adduction of the vocal cord adduction of the vocal cord so this uh, cords will come together like this uh, like if, if they are present like this if, if it will, they will contract like this so uh, like they are present here like that like in that manner if, if they will contract the of course the movement will be in this manner okay so there will be this type of movement and the rhymoclotidis will be narrowed down so basically opening the airways and closing the airways opening the airways and closing the airways the muscles which are acting the posterior cricoarytenoid and the lateral cricoarytenoid okay so that completes your uh, muscles and yes here you can see your lateral cricoarytenoid like this your lateral cricoarytenoid is present like this and your posterior cricoarytenoid so you can see your posterior cricoarytenoid muscle in this manner these are the posterior cricoarytenoid muscles and uh, talking about a lateral cricoarytenoid these are the lateral cricoarytenoid these ones these ones these ones are the lateral ones posterior one is above and lateral one is just present laterally okay this is a vocalis muscle this is a vocalis muscle and uh, beneath the vocalis muscle we have the vocal ligament that is present let us show the ligament we can have our vocal ligament present in this part this, uh, these are your vocal ligaments here here you have the vocal ligaments present and uh, here you have the thyroarytenoid muscle this is a thyroarytenoid okay so you can see the diagram and uh, let's uh, discuss the muscles which are controlling the tension in the vocal cord the muscles which are controlling basically the tension in the vocal cord two muscles which is the vocalis muscle which is the vocalis muscle and the thyroarytenoid muscle vocalis muscle and your thyroarytenoid muscle okay and um, also also your your, your cricothyroid muscle cricothyroid cricothyroid muscle is supplied to the external laryngeal nerve so vocalis muscle what is the vocalis muscle vocalis muscle is present somewhere like this so vocalis muscle is present somewhere like this and it is intrinsically connected intrinsically connected to this uh, vocal ligaments it is intrinsically connected to this vocal ligaments and this is called the modulator of larynx vocalis muscle is called as the modulator of the larynx and it creates tension in the anterior one third of the vocal cord creates tension in the anterior one third of the vocal cord then you have the thyroarytenoid muscle thyroarytenoid this thyroarytenoid uh, it is it is uh, causing a relaxation of the vocal cord it is causing a relaxation of the vocal cord and this vocalis muscle it is creating tension in anterior one third creating tension in anterior one third and relaxing relaxing your posterior two third relaxing your posterior two third creating tension in anterior one third relaxing your posterior two third and this thyroarytenoid what it is doing it is causing the relaxation of the vocal cord relaxation of the vocal cord understood and uh, then we are uh, gonna talk what are the different things which are there here mm, and uh, cricothyroid and the origin the insertion and, and uh, all about that so let's discuss the cricothyroid cricothyroid so we have basically our thyroid cartilage present over here and the cricoid cartilage present over here so this is a cricothyroid cricothyroid muscle which is connecting uh, the insertion is this part insertion is this part origin is this part okay and uh, this cricothyroid 
it bends the thyroid cartilage forwards it is what it is doing it is causing bend bending of the thyroid cartilage forward it's causing like this this is the action this is the action of this cricothyroid cricothyroid and it decreases the distance between the thyroid and the erythroid decreases the distance between the thyroid and the erythroid so it tenses the vocal cord if there is increased distance between the thyroid and, uh, it sorry it increases the distance okay between the thyroid and the erythroid so it tends it will tense the vocal cord understood and is supplied with external laryngeal nerve and is called the tuning fork of the larynx tuning fork of the larynx so what we have we have a tuning fork of the larynx that is your cricothyroid cricothyroid we have a vocalis muscle which is called the modulator of larynx vocalis muscle is called the modulator of larynx and we have posterior cricoarytenoid which is called the safety muscle of the larynx safety muscle of the larynx and the other thing we have no such special names i guess okay saccule uh, it's not a muscle saccule is your oil can of larynx as i discussed earlier so basically uh, nerve supply what is the nerve supply sensory nerves like above vocal cord above the vocal cord we have an internal laryngeal uh, nerve supply and below the vocal cord we have a recurrent laryngeal nerve supply and motor nerve all muscles are supplied with a recurrent laryngeal nerve okay cricothyroid by external laryngeal nerve except your cricothyroid which is supplied with the external laryngeal nerve that's why written here that is supplied by your external laryngeal nerve blood supply above vocal cords superior laryngeal artery uh, that is a branch of a superior thyroid artery and below vocal cord we have our inferior laryngeal artery that is a branch of a internal thoracic artery inferior thyroid artery sorry not thoracic okay clinical clinical is a singers nodule in pathology will uh, study singers nodule or a teachers nodule uh, when some teachers teachers in uh, like uh, say some more words which are just beyond the capacity so there is a nodule which is formed there is a nodule which is formed here in this parts and this is called a singer's nodule that is a teacher's nodule and uh, this has well, many histological findings these are not much in your uh, course like it is uh, it may be a dilated vasculature like areas of hem hemorrhage may be present over here and uh, the edematous or mixoid variety is the most common type of your uh, singer's nodule it is four histological subtypes edematous fibrous vascular and hyaline edematous fibrous vascular and hyaline these are your four types uh, subtypes so it can have various types of this another thing is your pyriform fossa or you can say smuggler's pouch this pyriform fossa is there is some smuggler's pouch is there this this part this part is called the py pyriform fossa you can see this part this part is a pyriform fossa or your pyriform fossa or your uh, smuggler's pouch and uh, this in this pyriform fossa the internal laryngeal nerve is present behind the mucosal covering the internal laryngeal nerve will be present behind uh, and if any food item gets lost in in this smuggler's pouch or your uh, pyriform fossa it can damage your internal laryngeal nerve so there will be no sensation in the upper vocal cord because you know and the upper vocal cord is supplying supplied by your internal laryngeal nerve so there will be no sense no sensations above the vocal cord no sensations above the vocal cord and uh, here there will be uh, there will be the loss of the protective cuff, cuff reflex the cuff reflex will be lost so that completes your larynx with all the clinicals let's move on to the next part of this chapter so let's come to our 10th nerve that is a vagus nerve so vagus nerve uh, and that's why i discussed the larynx because we will see uh, the effects of vagus nerve the vagus nerve is uh, like internal laryngeal external laryngeal which are supplying this uh, things so that that's why i discussed your ear and your uh, pharynx and then your larynx i discussed the whole of your larynx so as so as you can understand the uh, course of vagus nerve so vagus nerve there's a superior ganglion and inferior ganglion um then it arises from a medulla oblongata it arises from medulla oblongata it goes via the jugular foramen at the level of jugular foramen it gives a branch that is called the meningeal branch this meningeal branch will supply the dura mater posterior cranial fossa then till another branch that is auricular branch auricular branch this auricular branch is going to supply the skin of the external auditory canal and the adjoining areas remember we talked about this in your uh, ear that uh, the skin of the external auditory canal and the adjoining areas are being supplied by the vagus nerve and being supplied by the vagus nerve and uh, then we have uh, it, it moves down this is your inferior cervical ganglion superior cervical ganglion is this one inferior cervical ganglion is this one and in this uh, at this level it divides into a pharyngeal branch pharyngeal branch which will contribute to the pharyngeal plexus it will uh, give your superior laryngeal nerve superior laryngeal nerve will come down like this okay and uh, it will form your internal laryngeal nerve and the external laryngeal nerve this internal laryngeal nerve 
and external laryngeal nerve so this internal laryngeal nerve basically supplied your thyroid membrane and all the internal laryngeal nerve was supplying above uh, it was uh, like sensory for above the vocal cord okay sensory for above the vocal cord and then you have the external laryngeal nerve that is basically giving your inner vision to the cricothyroid muscle remember we talked about the section and the cricothyroid muscle we told that is supplied with the external laryngeal nerve so you can very well now correlate as i have taught your pharynx so your larynx not your pharynx okay and uh, then we have another branch another branch which is coming down another branch is coming down and giving two branches that is sccb and iccb your superior cervical cardiac branch and your inferior cervical cardiac branch superior cervical cardiac branch and your inferior cervical cardiac branch okay uh, th this this branches will uh, discuss in the cervical plexus i'm not sure if we will discuss the cervical plexus or no and then we have the recurrent laryngeal nerve this is your recurrent laryngeal nerve which will come down but extend up also Okay, which will come down but uh, like ascend up and this will supply the mucosa of larynx below the vocal cord plus all the muscles of larynx except the cricothyroid all the muscles of larynx except the cricothyroid cricothyroid is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve and uh, all muscles of larynx all the muscles of larynx these are uh, maybe it uh, it may be an, any muscle which are which you can name and uh, Uh, mucosa of larynx below the vocal cord supplied with the recurrent laryngeal nerve it uh, wounds around the arch of aorta on the right side or right subclavian vein on uh, on the left side and uh, another thing is that this auricular branch this is auricular branch which is given to the skin of external auditory canal in the adjoining areas this is called also called as the elderman's nerve or the arnold's nerve elderman's nerve or your arnold's nerve understood and there is a sinus nerve also present which supplies your carotid body and your carotid sinus carotid body and your carotid sinus so that completes your the course of your vagus nerve that completes your course of the vagus nerve in your head and neck uh, then uh, then we'll uh, uh, move on to the next part of this chapter talking about the cervical plexus a bit again uh, it is formed by the ventral rami of c1 to c4 nerves rami comes out between scalenus anterior and the medius muscle it is also called the plexus of loops plexus of loops so the post anterior branches and the posterior branches just what you can do uh, uh, here we are showing the superficial branches so in the superficial branches c1 to c5 uh, segments are there just connect uh, your c1 and c2 segment it is not much important here the uh, superficial branches connect c2 c3 c3 c4 and from c2 c3 there will be a nerve arising which is called as a great auricular nerve so this great auricular nerve remember it was supplying the scalp and uh, this great auricular nerve we are uh, writing the root value c2 c3 and then another nerve is arising from the uh, c2 segment alone which is called as a lesser occipital nerve this is root value c2 and uh, then we will have another nerve that is your transverse cutaneous nerve of neck which is the anterior branch arising from your uh c2 and c3 segments so enter and so skip in the number of neck root value c2 c3 again and again your c3 c4 these are giving a origin to supraclavicular nerves these are three are supraclavicular nerves and this this have also root value c3 c4 c c3 and c4 sorry c5 is not there c4 i am writing with phrenic now yes Uh, so these are your uh, superficial branches talking about the deep branches or the deep branches let's see in the diagram here so if there is superficial branches and the deep branches present in one diagram so it gets a little bit uh, gets very complex okay uh, talking about this you have a c1 segment c2 segment then you have a c3 segment c4 segment and the c5 segment from the c2 c3 just connect the c1 and, uh, sorry just connect your c1 and c2 c1 and c2 and the c1 nerve the c1 comes and supplies your geniohyoid and your thyrohyoid it supplies your geniohyoid and your thyrohyoid and it is running along with your 12th nerve it is running along with the 12th nerve okay and running along with the 12th nerve so we'll uh, talk about the hypoglossal nerve when we'll talk we'll discuss so this is supplying the geniohyoid and thyrohyoid and uh, again it is giving a branch which is called as a descendants hypoglossi descendants hypoglossi it is giving a branch which is descendants hypoglossi then what we have we have a c2 and c3 segments which are joining c2 and c3 are joining and giving a descendant cervicalis these are giving a descendant cervicalis c2 c3 joining giving a descendant cervicalis this descendant cervicalis this descendants hypoglossi these are combining to form a ansa cervicalis these are forming a ansa cervicalis and this ansa cervicalis is uh, supplying uh, which four muscles three muscles and the uh, superior and inferior belly of your omohyoid sternohyoid sternothyroid inferior belly of omohyoid and the superior belly of omohyoid these are supplied by ansa cervicalis from the c3 c4 c5 segments we have our phrenic nerve arising 
from the c2 and c3 segment uh, we uh, from c2 and c3 segment these are joint and the c3 and c3 segment are also joint from the c2 segment alone from the c2 segment alone there will be a nerve arising to the sternocleidomastoid this are this is your c2 nerve and this is connecting with the spinal accessory nerve from the c3 and c4 segment there will be a nerve arising to the trapezius uh, so root value will be c3 and c4 and this is also connecting to the spinal accessory nerve and this both nerves are proprioceptive nerves okay so that completes the cardiac plexus so we have a quick discussion of the cardiac plexus let's move on to the next part so let's now talk about another nerve that is a spinal accessory nerve uh, it has two parts this 11th nerve has two parts cranial accessory part and the spinal accessory part cranial accessory part originates from a nucleus ambiguous and the spinal accessory part part from your c1 to c5 segments okay so you have the medulla oblongata here and uh, this is a nucleus ambiguous in, this in uh, your white this is a nucleus ambiguous let's take some other color yes nucleus ambiguous and from here originating is your from nucleus uh, ambiguous your cranial accessory nerve is uh, originating like this your cranial accessory nerve is coming like this and uh, it's forming your uh, s and the superior cervical ganglion inferior cervical ganglion and your uh, cranial accessory the spinal accessory nerve that is arising from this five segments then of the spinal cord this is also coming and going via jugular foramen so this both parts the spinal uh, spinal accessory as your, as well as your cranial accessory these are going via the jugular foramen this uh, spinal accessory nerve goes and uh, supplies the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle and uh, this uh, cranial accessory part this cranial accessory part this is going via the jugular foramen and supplying the pharyngeal plexus is contributing to your pharyngeal plexus and uh, pharyngeal plexus it supplies muscles of palate except your tbp that is a tensor valley palatine muscles of palate we'll discuss about the muscles of palate and the muscles of pharynx uh, except your stylopharynges muscles of pharynx except your stylopharynges this is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus understood so that completes the course of your accessory nerve let's move on to the next part let's talk about your external carotid artery so there are about uh, eight branches of the external carotid artery and uh, among this five branches are present in a carotid triangle we discussed about the carotid triangle remember yes so you can remember the mnemonic some anatom anatomists like freaking out poor medical students so s is for superior thyroid artery so uh, this common carotid artery, internal carotid, we are not going into the internal carotid, we will read in the neuro part and uh, this is your external carotid artery. This is the first branch of this external carotid artery that it is giving is your ST, ST. So first is the ST that is your superior thyroid artery and uh, another branch is ascending pharyngeal artery, this is the medial branch. All the branches that are present over here are the lateral branches and we have one uh, medial branch that is your uh, ascending pharyngeal artery only one medial branch that is your ascending pharyngeal artery so sta superior thyroid artery then we have the uh, that uh, ascending pharyngeal artery like like is for lingual artery so lingual artery is arising from here lingual artery freaking freaking is a facial artery facial artery again from here like this facial artery it is facial artery o is for occipital artery here occipital artery occipital artery and uh, p is for posterior auricular artery the p is for posterior auricular artery this is a posterior auricular artery so occipital artery posterior auricular artery this both and these are your posterior branches so posterior auricular artery and the occipital artery these are your posterior branches and again m is for your maxillary artery m is for your maxillary artery which is also a uh, lateral branch maxillary artery and uh, again superficial temporal artery st superficial temporal this is also st don't get confused this is your superior thyroid artery and uh, this one this one is your superficial temporal artery this maxillary artery and this superficial temporal artery these are terminal branches these are terminal branches okay so what is the terminal branches of ec that is a maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery understood and uh, this maxillary artery is the largest branch just note this part after that let's move on to the subclavian artery you know about the subclavian artery three parts it has one two and three this is divided by a scalenous anterior muscle which is uh, dividing the artery into three parts one two and three and originates the scalenous anterior originates from your anterior tubercle of transverse process of c3 and c3 to c6 you can just uh, see c3 c3 c4 c5 or you can up to go up to c6 level and uh, inserts into the first rib inserts into the first rib and divides this uh, 
artery that is your subclavian artery into th three parts so what are the parts you can remember vitamin c and d to uh, know about the parts with wit c and d wit c and d so what are the parts first part has three branches wit wit means first is the vertebral artery so first part first is a vertebral artery which will go extend upwards by a foramen transverse cerium of c7 c6 to c7 which will extend upwards uh, under the uh, foramen transverse cerium of c6 to c7 so first one is the vertebral artery then you have i i is the internal thoracic artery this is the internal thoracic artery we told uh, in the breast part that internal thoracic artery arises from the first part of the subclavian artery this is the internal thoracic artery or the mammary artery and then t t is for the thyrocervical trunk t is for your thyrocervical trunk this is the thyrocervical trunk and it is giving other three branches one i s and t i s t you know about the i s t code that is there you can just remember like this ist means your inferior thyroid artery inferior thyroid artery your superior thyroid artery was a direct branch was a direct lateral branch of your external carotid um, but uh, your inferior thyroid artery is the branch of your subclavian artery first part of subclavian inferior thyroid artery then you have the suprascapular artery remember the suprascapular artery is forming your anastomosis uh, around the scapula and then you have the transverse cervical artery tc it has a uh, superficial branch and a deep branch and this deep branch of this transverse cervical artery was also called as a dorsal scapular artery and this was also uh, forming a scapular anastomosis and the second part which is posterior to the scalenus atia muscle it is uh, like uh, giving one branch that is a costo cervical trunk so uh, from second part one branch costo cervical trunk and from uh, third if uh, this is optional branch in the third part there is an optional that is called the dorsal scapular artery dorsal scapular artery okay uh, so dorsal scapular artery may be this uh, you can uh, uh, say dorsal scapular artery to this deep branch of transverse cervical artery or if this deep branch of transverse cervical is, uh, is arising directly from here we call it directly dorsal scapular artery okay so that completes and uh, talking about the relations of the scalenus anterior muscle what are the relations of the scalenus anterior so this is the scalenus anterior which is arising from the c3 to c6 segments and is inserting into the first rib this is a clavicle uh, and it will insert into the first rib so what are the things that subclavian vein is passing uh, just superficial to it Subcla your artery is going deep and the suprascapular arteries these are uh, from your first part and all this are this is a part of your first part okay of your thyrocervical trunk which is coming in front like this and uh, the first part is there second part is posterior to this and third part is there then uh, what we have you have your trunk subbrachial plexus and the subclavian artery trunk subbrachial plexus and subclavian artery which is going posteriorly and then your phrenic nerve is there here is the phrenic nerve here is the phrenic nerve that is coming in front and here is your carotid sheath here is the carotid sheath this carotid sheath has your internal carotid artery internal jugular vein your vagus nerve so this is a carotid sheath and with its contents and the posterior relation of the carotid sheath is a sympathetic chain a sympathetic chain so that completes your relations of your scalenus anterior muscle which are anterior relations what are the posterior relations anterior relations you can write easily your ascending cervical artery phrenic art phrenic nerve your inferior thyroid artery transverse cervical artery sub suprascapular artery thyrocervical trunk your subclavian vein subclavian vein and your sympathetic chain sympathetic chain as a sympathetic chain posterior relation of this so it will form an anterior relation of this scalenus anterior muscle so that completes uh, about your arteries if you introduction to your arteries let's move on to the next one so let's get into our dural venous sinuses uh, talking about the dura mater and dural venous sinuses we have to discuss this so dura mater is the thickest meninges and the cranial dura mater has an endosteal layer and the meningeal layer and uh, this dural venous sinuses are formed like this and the meningeal layer this meningeal layer is forming dural folds this dural folds and this folds are creating some spaces which are called as the dural venous sinuses so what are the dural folds we have a fax cerebri falx cerebelli tentorium cerebelli diaphragma cellae fax cerebri fax cerebelli tentorium cerebelli and your diaphragma cellae so these are your uh, dural folds let's discuss about the fax cerebri cerebri 
okay so this is your dual fold what are the extent you have the crista gyli which is your anterior end is attached to the crista gyli and the posterior end is attached to your superior surface of tentorium cerebelli tentorium cerebelli is another dual fold lower margin is a free margin and upper margin is attached to your sagittal sinus sagittal sinus so the superior sagittal sinus which is running like this your inferior sagittal sinus is running like this in this direction in this direction superior sagittal sinus is running in this direction and the straight sinus is like this and uh, this uh, this this, this uh, inferior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus these are present only in the meningeal layer these are not related with the endosteum these are only present in the meningeal layer right after this uh, let's move on to the next part that is your tentorium cerebelli so talking about the tentorium cerebelli tentorium cerebelli separates your cerebellum cerebrum and the cerebellum so it can be asked as a uh, question that what separates your cerebrum and the cerebellum this is a tentorium cerebelli you can see the tentorium cerebelli from here it is attached to the petrous part of your temporal bone it's attached to the petrous part of the temporal bone that is attached like it has a free margin and uh, then we have a uh, attached margin okay attached margin this is a free margin of this and attached margin this is a attached margin so uh, you, it is attached to the anterior clinoid process anterior clinoid process this to its, to its free margin is attached then you have a posterior clinoid process here posterior clinoid process this is called a tentorial notch it is present in this shape in this shape you have a superior petrosal sinus running along here like this in this angle and the inferior petrosal sinus running in this angle and we have the straight sinus that is draining into it and this uh, straight sinus is again like uh, uh, we have our uh, transverse sin your uh, sinuses that are a transverse sinus which are going like this one and transverse sinus two so you have uh, your uh, superior petrosal sinuses superior petrosal sinuses and uh, these are your superior petrosal sinus we have only one straight sinus and two transverse sinuses two transverse sinuses anterior laterally it is connected to superior border of a petrous temporal bone it is connected to the superior border of the petrous temporal bone you can see here superior border of the petrous temporal bone and uh, posteriorly it is posteriorly connected to a transverse sulcus posteriorly it is connected to a transverse sulcus this is called a transverse sulcus to which it is connected posterior laterally okay and this anterior lateral and posterior lateral, these are called as your attached margins so that's about your tentorium cerebelli let's move on to the next part that is the fox cerebri fox cerebri fox cerebelli fox cerebelli fox cerebri we talked about this fox cerebri uh, how to draw you know about this okay this is the diagram and uh, we talked about your tentorium cerebelli this is the tentorium cerebelli you can draw it like this and uh, then we have the fax cerebelli which is not present which is present just perpendicular to this plane of uh, the tentorium cerebelli uh, so the fax cerebri this is uh, in which the free margin is there and the attached margin which has your occipital sinus that is running in this manner occipital sinus and this is attached to the in, uh, internal occipital crest attached to the internal occipital crest then we have a diaphragma cellae diaphragma cellae uh, so this is the diaphragma cellae uh, through which the stock of the pituitary gland is going through this is called as diaphragma cellae so we are just uh, looking at all the dural venous sinuses how they are arranged in the space let's move on to the uh, schematic section this is the superior sagittal sinus this is the inferior sagittal sinus this is the straight sinus just can you uh, correlate which which one is that this is your this 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 thing is your fox cerebri it's a fox cerebri okay and uh, then we had a uh, tentorium cerebelli right tentorium cerebelli so here we have the tentorium cerebelli in this manner in this manner in this manner we have the tentorium cerebelli in the uh, mutually perpendicular this all three sinuses are mutually perpendicular to each other okay so in the tentorium cerebelli we have our transverse sinus that is running in this manner transverse sinus that is running and here also will be there will be transverse sinus that will run this point is called the confluence of sinuses because your superior sagittal sinus then your uh, straight sinus and again your occipital sinus of your uh, this this part is a fox cerebelli right this is a fox cerebelli so your occipital sinus is also running and draining to this confluence of sinus region and from this all the transverse sinus it will drain into a sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus and from sigmoid sinus uh, it will connect with the inferior petrosal sinus inferior petrosal sinus and uh, through the jugular foramen they will go via, uh, to the internal jugular vein they will go to the internal jugular vein okay so this internal ju uh, jugular vein this is formed by sigmoid sinus plus in inferior petrosal sinus sigmoid sinus plus inferior petrosal sinus 
let's discuss about the cavernous sinus which is the largest sinus cavernous sinus is called the largest sinus so we have our cavernous sinus present like this this is one of the cavernous sinus this one another one uh, so it has many inputs and outputs what are the these are called as the input channels the uh, inflowing channels and the outgoing channels of the cavernous sinus so input channels that are uh, okay uh, so what are the incoming channels or so the input channels so we have from orbits from brain and from meninges from orbits veins and the meninges so we have one from the orbit one from the brain one from the meninges these are your um, uh, the channels that are influencing the influencing channels or incoming channels so from orbit we have the superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior ophthalmic vein which are draining and also the central vein of retina from the brain we have superficial medial middle cerebral vein superficial middle cerebral vein and the inferior cerebral vein we'll talk about these veins in neuroanatomy tomorrow and from the meninges we have the splenoparietal sinus and the middle meningeal sinus which are draining into this into the cavernous sinus splenoparietal sinus splenoparietal sinus and your middle meningeal sinus this both just have to remember this what are the outgoing channels or drainage channels so the superior petrosal sinus your inferior petrosal sinus your superior ophthalmic vein how because the superior ophthalmic vein is draining in incoming channel also how can we be a outgoing channel because the superior ophthalmic vein this is a emissary vein which doesn't have valves this emissary veins don't have valves so uh, the blood can flow in both the ways the blood can flow in both the ways so it uh, this uh, superior ophthalmic vein is also a outgoing channel and the spheroidal emissary veins spheroidal emissary veins which are also outgoing channels so talking about this uh, let's see uh, how they are arranged this is superior petrosal sinus this is a inferior petrosal sinus again superior petrosal sinus and inferior petrosal sinus we know from this uh, from magnum this straight sinus is there left transverse sinus and the right transverse sinus okay right transverse sinus and left transverse sinus this is a sup, uh, superior sagittal sinus which will be present uh, in uh, like perpendicular to this plane superior sagittal sinus which is combining the right transverse sinus and uh, draining the sigmoid sinus and left transverse sinus draining into a sigmoid sinus so straight sinus mainly continues at the left transverse sinus the straight sinus uh, this one it mainly continues at the left transverse sinus and the superior sagittal sinus mainly continues at the right transverse sinus the superior sagittal sinus this mainly continues at the right transverse sinus the right transverse sinus is greater uh, is larger than the right left transverse sinus okay let's talk about a dangerous connection a dangerous connection by which the prostatic carcinoma will tra uh, can travel to your brain okay prostatic ca carcinoma can travel to your brain let's see how it is uh, done like uh, we in in your spinal cord in spinal cord we have our vertebral venous plexus that is a bateson's plexus that is a bateson's plexus so bateson's plexus basically all the prostatic plexus and all the plexus which are present in the lower part of the body they connect to the bateson's plexus like prostatic plexus is connected to this bateson's plexus and from this it we, it have a connection to your basilar venous plexus it has a connection to your basilar venous plexus and uh, this vascular venous plexus has mainly valveless connections valveless connections to both of your cavernous sinus and this aics and pics you know these are your anterior intercavernous sinus posterior intercavernous sinus so uh, just you can know this cavernous sinus connected with valveless connections to the batson's venous plexus sorry your basilar venous plexus and the vascular venous plexus is connected to your batson's plexus so if there is any carcinoma in the prostate so it will travel by the prostatic plexus reach the batson's plexus and go into the basilar venous plexus and can reach the cavernous plexus and cause the cancer of the brain so carcinoma of prostate may cause cancer of the brain so these are your paired duodenal sinuses what are they your cavernous sinus is paired yes superior petrosal paired yes inferior petrosal two yes transverse sinus paired sigmoid sinus is paired spinoparietal sinus is paired middle meningeal sinus is paired and petroscomus sinus is paired we, we don't have to read this three sinuses these are not in our course we have unpaired dural venous sinuses that is a superior sagittal sinus we have eight paired and seven unpaired so superior sagittal sinus inferior sagittal sinus straight sinus occipital sinus aics pics and bvp aics pics and bvp aics pics do you realize where you read yes and a bvp is this one these are unpaired dural venous sinuses let's discuss the structures and the relations of the cavernous sinus very important part let's discuss the structures and what are the relations uh, of your cavernous sinus so here what we have is that uh, let's read so getting into this uh, we have a cavernous sinus present here and here 
ओके एंड योर स्पिन योर स्पिनोइडल एयर साइनस स्पिनोइडल एयर साइनस इज प्रेजेंट हियर देन वी हैव द ऑप्टिक कायजमा व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट सुपीरियरली सुपीरियर टू योर कैवर्नस साइनस बोथ कैवर्नस साइनस हियर इंटरनल कैरोटिड आर्टरी दैट इज फॉर्मिंग योर सुपीरियर रिलेशन एंड दिस इंटरनल कैरोटिड आर्टरी इज आल्सो सीन हियर व्हाई बिकॉज़ देयर इज ए फॉर्मेशन ऑफ अ कैरोटिड साइफन जस्ट सी यू कैन कोरिलेट इन दिस डायग्राम दिस इंटरनल कैरोटिड आर्टरी this is like turning like this this is turning like this posteriorly and appearing in front also in the section so you can see the internal carotid artery it, it will be seen two times in this section because it is present like this it, there is a formation of carotid siphon this carotid siphon it dampens the pulsations of your internal carotid artery okay so talking about this we have the internal carotid artery and uh, just uh, inferior lateral to infer internal carotid artery we have our sixth nerve sixth nerve is present here sixth nerve is present here then we have spinoidal air sinuses we know about the spinoidal air sinuses which are which are present here and about the pituitary gland in the uh, cella tricuspida and the this stalk of pituitary uh, then four nerves four nerves are present in the wall of a cavernous sinuses in uh, bdc and uh, other text or the indian textbooks it is given four nerves that is a third nerve fourth nerve V1 nerve and the V2 nerve. Third, fourth V1 and V2. Ah, uh, third, fourth you know, and uh, V1 and V2. Ah, uh, which nerves are there? These are uh, the uh, branches of a trigeminal, the ophthalmic nerve and the maxillary nerve. Yes, and the this maxillary nerve in Gray's Anatomy it is written that it is not present in the lateral of a cavernous sinus. Okay. Then what are medial relations? We have our pituitary gland, cella tricuspida, body of spinoid, and spinoid air sinuses. In medial relation, you can just observe this. You can easily see these are medial relations. What are medial relations? Your optic chiasma is there. Your cella, stalk of pituitary, your pituitary gland, and the spinoid air sinuses. These all are your medial relations. Pituitary gland, cella tricuspida, body of spinoid, and spinoid air sinuses. What are the lateral relations? Your uncus, the part of brain which is not so shown here. This this part, this part is your uncus of brain. These are your uncus of the brain. Okay, uh, which is forming a lateral relation. And the roof is formed by your internal carotid artery and the optic chiasma. Optic chiasma and internal carotid are forming the roof part. Okay, and uh, floor is formed the forearm and lacerum. Floor is the forearm and lacerum. Uh, here is the forearm and lacerum. You can see uh, this is the forearm and lacerum. You can observe here, which is which will be forming its floor. Here must be a carotid, uh, the cavernous sinus must be lying, and uh, here is the floor formed. Okay, and nerves present in lateral wall. We have the third, fourth V1 and V2 nerve. V2 nerve is controversial as it is not given in Gray's. If you if you are following the Gray's, you just write your three nerves. Structure inside cavernous sinus is the internal carotid artery and the sixth nerve. Done. Anterior relations the superior orb orbital fissure. Posterior relations the petrous temporal bone. What is the clinical? If there is rupture of internal carotid artery aneurysm inside the cavernous sinus, the pulsation of the cavernous sinus will occur. uh with with your internal carotid artery if there is rupture of your internal carotid artery aneurysm okay so the the carotid the cavernous sinus will pulsate along with the internal carotid and it will push the contents of orbit with each pulsation which is called the pulsating exophthalmus uh, pulsating exophthalmus or a pulsating proptosis let's talk about the nerve supply of the cranial dura mater so what what nerves are supplying the cranial dura mater so the dura mater here what are the nerve supplies let then talk about the blood supply so we have to divide links in anterior cranial fossa middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa so if you if you can uh, correlate with this let's discuss so anterior cranial fossa this acf anterior cranial fossa uh, this is supplied mainly by your meningeal branch of v2 nerve and your anterior ethmoidal nerve Your B1 nerve that was giving a nasociliary nerve and anterior ethmoidal nerve, right? Nasociliary nerve was giving an anterior ethmoidal nerve. So A E N and P E N. Remember, your nasociliary nerve was giving A E N, P E N, and was continuing uh, like that. Okay, so this this part is supplying is uh, supplying your and uh, anterior cranial cranial fossa and meningeal branch. Meningeal branch of B2 nerve is supplying your anterior cranial fossa. This part. And your uh, middle cranial fossa is mainly supplied by nervous spinosus, that is a V3 nerve. And half is supplied. The superior lateral part is supplied by your meningeal branch of V2 nerve only. And then your posterior cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa, the area that is proximal, area that is nearer to your foramen magnum is supplied by the C1, C2, C3 spinal nerves. C1, C2, C3 spinal nerves. And area which is far, like uh, distal to the uh, foramen magnum. Away from the foramen magnum, supplied by the tenth and the eleventh nerve. Tenth and the eleventh nerve. Okay. Then the blood supply. Talking about the blood supply, we have our uh, uh, supplying the cribriform plate is the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, which are again the branches of your ophthalmic artery. 
and ophthalmic artery is a branch of an internal carotid artery so we'll talk about the internal carotid artery then uh, we have our foramen ovale foramen uh, spinosum and foramen lacerum so this foramen lacerum is supplied by the internal carotid artery okay and the foramen ovale foramen ovale by accessory meningeal artery accessory meningeal artery and uh, foramen spinosum by middle meningeal artery and you can just correlate that accessory meningeal this middle meningeal artery are branches of the maxillary artery and this maxillary artery is a branch of a external carotid artery yes okay uh, let's uh, go into like with the post the junction between the middle and posterior cranial fossa so here uh, the the middle and the posterior cranial fossa this this parts are supplied by your meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery and the foramen magnum is supplied by your vertebral artery which is a branch of your subclavian artery understood so this is a blood supply of the dura mater the uh, dura mater that is surrounding this parts and uh, this is a nerve supply of the cranial dura mater nerve supply of the cranial dura mater okay after that uh, we'll we'll talk about another things of this chapter let's move on let's talk about the infratemporal fossa infratemporal fossa uh, so infratemporal uh, fossa is like this this one this fossa is called the infratemporal fossa okay and uh, what are the boundaries the anterior boundary is the posterior surface of the body of the maxilla so we have the posterior surface of the body of maxilla which is the anterior boundary this one is the anterior boundary posterior surface of the body of the maxilla roof is the infratemporal surface of the greater wing of spinoid so this is the roof uh, infratemporal wing this this one we have the greater wing of spinoid is the greater wing so we have the infratemporal surface of a greater wing of spinoid is forming the roof and medial wall is the lateral pterygoid plate medial wall is the lateral pterygoid plate here we have the lateral pterygoid plate you can see lpp here is the lateral pterygoid plate this is forming the medial wall it's forming the medial wall lateral wall is the ramus of the mandible lateral wall is the ramus of the mandible uh, uh, the, the mandible must be present somewhere like this it is like uh, not visible in this diagram and posterior wall and floor are open posterior wall and floor this these are open these are open what are the contents? What are the contents in fretable fossa? With the lateral pterygoid muscle, medial pterygoid muscle, mandibular nerve, otic ganglion, maxillary nerve, and posterior superior alveolar nerve, corda tympani nerve, first and second part of maxillary artery, third part of maxillary artery, that is the posterior superior alveolar artery, and your pterygoid venous plexus. These all, all things are present here. Lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid muscles, okay. Which nerve? Your mandibular nerve and the corda tympani nerve okay this both nerves are there and the posterior superior alveolar nerve also which artery we have our we have our first and second part of maxillary artery and the third okay that is uh, the three parts the three parts of your maxillary artery which plexus the medial uh, pterygoid venous plexus okay which ganglion the otic ganglion you can just remember like this understood so that's what infratemporal let's discuss about the maxillary artery after infratemporal fossa we'll discuss the maxillary artery which is the terminal branch of external carotid artery is the largest branch it has 16 branches on its own okay just don't be scared of the 16 branches we'll discuss about this it has about 16 branches of its own and this is three parts one two and three one first part second part and the third part first part second part and the third part and uh, this one is the external carotid artery that is going this is a maxillary artery one two and three parts let's discuss one by one first part this first part is lying deep to the neck of the mandible this first part is lying deep to the neck of the mandible the second part is lying over the uh, two heads of the lateral pterygoid lying between the two heads of the lateral pterygoid muscle and uh, this uh, third part third part is the pterygo like uh, it's lying in the pterygo maxillary fissure in the pterygo palatine fossa pterygo maxillary fissure this is the pterygo maxillary fissure this one and uh, this is the pterygo palatine fossa so it's lying like this pterygo maxillary fissure and the pterygo palatine fossa okay so you can know this uh, how the things are going how the things are going so let's discuss about the first part it has five branches first part has five branches what are the five branches you can remember the amadmi party okay uh, so what are the branches a is for accessory meningeal artery a is for anterior tympanic artery d is for deep auricular artery m is for middle meningeal artery and i is for inferior alveolar artery accessory meningeal anterior tympanic middle meningeal deep auricular inferior alveolar understood so this is the first part first part what are the branches you can just draw foramen ovale foramen spinosum and uh, there's tympanic uh, plate and this your uh, internal artery meters iam okay the internal surface this this one this one 
so what are the branches uh, the first is your accessory meningeal artery this is your accessory meningeal artery that is going via the foramen ovale and uh, second one is the anterior tympanic artery anterior tympanic artery this is the anterior tympanic artery which is going inside and supplying the middle ear cavity in the inner surface of a tympanic membrane okay anterior tympanic artery remember we know wrote about the uh, anterior tympanic artery in the middle ear also and also about inner surface of tympanic membrane was also supplied by your anterior tympanic artery and a deep auricular artery d is for deep auricular artery which is following the same course as the anterior tympanic artery m is the middle meningeal artery which is going via foramen spinosum so foramen spinosum is giving passage to middle meningeal artery okay and uh, just you can remember middle meningeal artery and uh, it, it it goes via the space created by auricular temporal nerve and uh, damage of auricular temporal nerve phrase syndrome and all that i is your inferior alveolar artery this is your inferior alveolar artery which is uh, continuing inside the mandible and coming out as the mental artery from the mental foramen and this is uh, again giving a branch is called the artery to mylohyoid artery to mylohyoid so this inferior alveolar artery is again is giving a branch called the artery to mylohyoid let's talk about the second part so second part has also five branches second part has also five branches let's discuss them all are muscular branches so we have the artery to medial pterygoid artery to lateral pterygoid mesenteric artery deep temporal artery that is supplying the temporalis uh, temporalis artery temporalis muscle and the buccal artery supplying the buc buccinator muscle so here we have the here we have our um, second part so second part lateral pterygoid giving a branch to lateral pterygoid giving a branch to your medial pterygoid and a mesenteric artery is there your buccal artery is there and two deep temporal arteries are there two deep temporal arteries are there these are your two deep temporal arteries understood what happened so if you just understood what are the branches and how is arterial arrangement let's move on to the next part so next part is the third part third part has six branches just pay attention to the six branches and this six branches are so uh, like present like this that you can't visualize these branches it's it's get very difficult in, in order to visualize the branches so the mnemonic is a big pass big pass uh, the first one the first part uh, mnemonic was your uh, amadmi party for, for the second part we have no mnemonic that's the mus muscular branches you can just uh, see and write your buccal branches are there and uh, your medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid and mesenteric artery and all that arteries okay and uh, for your uh, third part we have the mnemonic pig pass p is for the posterior superior alveolar artery posterior superior alveolar artery which is supplying the molars premolars and the maxillary sinus molars premolars and the maxillary sinus i is for the infraorbital artery remember infraorbital artery which is giving you two branches that is a middle superior alveolar and anterior superior alveolar artery okay asaa and msaa these are branches of your infraorbital artery these are supplying your maxillary sinus and alveoli and face and the lower eyelids too okay infraorbital artery then we have the greater palatine artery greater palatine artery which is just uh, running like this uh, incisive foramen is there like this okay we'll discuss about that greater palatine artery so you can just uh, see um, how it is running so greater palatine artery we have the greater palatine artery and the lesser palatine artery which is like uh, uh, coming down like this and uh, this lesser palatine artery is supplying a soft palate and uh, giving a branch to a palatine tonsil also this greater palatine artery is going in uh, like beneath your hard palate it's going beneath your hard palate and comes out by the in incisive foramen to the sub to supply your nasal septum to supply your nasal septum okay this is your greater palatine artery greater palatine artery pass is a pharyngeal artery which is supplying the nasopharynx artery to pterygoid canal that is supplying auditory tube and a spinopalatine artery which is the largest branch it is supplying a nasal cavity spinopalatine artery and the spinopalatine artery is also called the artery of epistaxis epistaxis epistaxis, epistaxis is the nose bleeding so <coughs> spinopalatine artery is basically called as the artery of epistaxis which is also called the artery of nose bleeding okay nose bleeding so that completes uh, whole your all your arteries and uh, your infratemporal fossa the maxillary artery all branches of maxillary artery let's move on let's get on to the next concept let's talk about the mandible and uh, let's see at the muscles which are being attached that are the muscles of mastication let's see about them what are the external features of the mandible is that there is the head of the mandible then we have your pterygoid phobia is the uh, opening type of structures the pterygoid phobia this is the neck of the mandible red part 
and uh, here we have the coronoid process here we have one coronoid process or another coronoid process then we have the man mandibular foramen mandibular foramen mylohyoid line is there mylohyoid line is there or uh, mylohyoid groove you can say mental foramen where the mental artery comes out okay and uh, this is the body of the mandible this is the angle of the mandible angle of the mandible and uh, this part this whole part this whole part is called as the ramus of the mandible this is your ramus of the mandible and this is a mandibular notch you just know all these things okay let's uh, talk about some other things like uh, this part this part it, uh, you have two tubercles like a superior genial tubercle two superior genial tubercles you have and you have two inferior genial tubercles so superior genial tubercles are giving origin to a genioglossus muscle we talked about this muscle when we are discussing the tongue and this inferior genial tubercles will give them uh, muscle that that is a genohyoid genohyoid origin okay and uh, digastric uh, fossa is that this is a digastric fossa where the anterior belly of digastric is attached muscles of mastication so we have first uh, this temporalis muscles there are many muscles are there the temporalis muscle is the largest muscles of the mastication it has three types of fibers so you can see the temporalis muscle three fibers are there first first one is the anterior fibers which are vertically downwards you can see these are anterior fibers which are running vertically down you can note the uh, direction of the fibers vertically downwards anterior fibers are vertically downwards and the posterior fibers post middle sorry middle fibers which are a bit oblique obliquely downwards the middle fibers are obliquely downwards and uh, then you have the posterior fibers posterior fibers which are horizontally forwards these are horizontally forwards like this in this angle in this angle so we have uh, three fibers an anterior fiber the middle fiber and a posterior fiber this is a large fan shaped muscle origin is the entire temporal fossa and the temporal fascia and these are the fibers inserts into the tip and the medial surface of coronoid process tip and medial surface of the coronoid process of the coronoid process and to the anterior borders of the ramus of the mandible so if the ramus of the mandible here this is attached to the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible here anterior border ramus of the mandible nerve is a deep temporal nerve which is going to supply uh this type of muscle okay it's from your anterior division of your v3 nerve anterior division of your v3 nerve v3 nerve is a mandibular nerve so mandibular nerve and a division of that that is your deep temporal nerve this deep temporal nerve is supplying your temporalis muscle okay so of course you know that uh, your uh, v3 nerve that is a mandibular nerve the anterior division uh, gives branches to a lateral trigeminal medial trigeminal and your uh, masseter muscle and has a buccal branch also which doesn't supply the um, the buccinator uh, what is the action let's we'll talk about that later what is the action of this so it will do the elevation of mandible that is a closing of mouth and retract the protruded mandible you can easily note from this direction elevation as the fibers are running in, the, in this direction when it will contract there will be the elevation of the mandible that is a closing of mouth and uh, as the direction the fibers are moving like this so there will be retraction of mandible retracted of the protruded mandible you can easily you are easily understood temporalis muscle let's talk about the masseter muscle masseter muscle the strongest muscle of mas mastication m for masseter m for mastication so it is the strongest muscle for a mastication it is a quadrilateral shaped of muscle okay quadrilateral muscle this is a masseter muscle the whole part uh, so we have middle fibers and the superficial fibers of masseter okay origin is from superficial layer middle layer and the deep layer superficial layer and anterior two third of the lower border of your zygomatic arch anterior two third of the lower border of zygomatic arch middle fibers from posterior one third of the lower border of zygomatic arch and deep layer is from medial surface or deep surface of the zygomatic arch so basically uh, muscle is originating from the zygomatic arch superior from the anterior border of two third anterior two third middle fibers are originating from the posterior one third of lower border and deep layer originating from the deep surface of the zygomatic arch okay and uh, talking about uh, what is the insertion insertion in the outer surface of the ramus of the mandible okay outer surface of the ramus of the mandible and this temporalis was uh, being attached the temporalis was being attached to the tip and the medial surface of coronoid process anterior border of the ramus of the mandible and it is it is this uh, masseter is inserting on the outer surface of the ramus of the mandible what is the direction direction is downward and slightly backward downward and backward downward and backward okay this is the your direction you can see this this is a masseter and the fibers are like downward and backward the fibers are downward and backward nerve supply is a masseteric nerve that is the anterior division of v3 nerve i told it 
so down and backward if the fibers will contract it will pull the pull the mandible forward and upwards pull the mandible forward and upwards forward means elevation of mandible and upwards means protraction of the mandible sorry a uh, forward uh, your uh, what is told so elevation elevation is your upward upward movement and uh, protraction is the forward movement right so that was about your masseter muscle let come to a little bit complex muscle as the visualization is concerned okay as uh, your visualization is concerned uh, so on uh, this spinoid bone actually the bone is like uh, it has many features so it gets sometimes very messy to discuss all this so i will discuss in a very simplified manner you will just like in the discussion so let's talk about the lateral pterygoid lateral pterygoid originates from the upper head originates in the lower head lateral pterygoid has two heads you can see here upper head and the lower head this is the upper head of the lateral pterygoid this is the lower head of the lateral pterygoid so upper head originates from the crest on the greater wing of spinoid the originates from the crest on the greater wing of spinoid so the greater wing of spinoid and there is a crest okay so from it is uh, originating a lower head from your lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate you can see the lateral pterygoid plate here i had a picture probably okay i had a picture there it is not present here maybe lateral pterygoid plate, pterygoid plate. okay picture is not there you can just manage right Okay, uh, lateral pterygoid plate is present in this in this manner, and the lateral surface lateral pterygoid plate is giving origin to this part. Okay, so here we have right what I'm finding here. Here is a lateral pterygoid plate, lateral pterygoid plate, and this lateral pterygoid plate, the lateral surface lateral pterygoid plate is giving origin to the lower head, to the lower head of a lateral pterygoid muscle. What is the direction? Backward and laterally, backward and laterally. So what will the action? The action will be forward action will be forward so action will be depression of the mandible that is the opening of mouth protraction of the mandible that is upward okay pull the mandible to the opposite side sideways movement sideways movement of mandible okay uh, so depression of mandible protraction of mandible and pull the mandible to the opposite side that is sideways movement and insertion is the pterygoid phobia remember we discussed the pterygoid phobia right pterygoid phobia uh, we talked about right here pterygoid phobia so this is a pterygoid phobia and it is inserted here. Nerve supply is the nerve to lateral pterygoid. It is the anterior division of V3 nerve. Action is told depression of mandible, protraction of mandible and pull the mandible to opposite side, sideways movement. Let's talk about the medial pterygoid. This is the medial pterygoid below the lateral pterygoid muscle. So we have the deep and superficial head. So superficial head originates from the maxillary tuberosity. Superficial head originates from this maxillary tuberosity and the deep head from the medial surface of lateral pterygoid plate. Deep head from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. So lateral pterygoid plate has a lateral surface and a medial surface, right? So it originates from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. What is the direction? Downward, backward and laterally. Downward, backward and laterally in this direction. Downward, backward and laterally in this direction. So action will be like this. Action will be like this. Like elevation will be there. Your protraction will be there. And sideways movement it will also allow. Elevation, protraction and sideways movement. This lateral pterygoid. Lateral pterygoid has the action of your depression, protraction and sideways movement. It has elevation, protraction and sideways movement. Understood? Of mandible. Nerve supply is the trunk of the V3 nerve, which is going to supply this trunk of the V3 nerve inserts into the inferior surface of the angle of mandible. It inserts here. You can see here. Angle of mandible, this one. It inserts into the inter inferior surface of the angle of the mandible. Okay. Understood? So that's all about your um, uh, mandible and your muscle mastication. This is a very important part. The muscle mastication may also come as a long question. Okay, you can, may get a long question. You have to draw all the fibers and all. You have to show the actions, the origin, the nerve supply and all. And uh, if it comes as a short question, it will just pass separately like a temporalis. Write a short note on temporalis. Like, write a short note on masseter muscle. You can get questions like this. Let's move on to the next parts of this chapter. Let's talk about the temporomandibular joint that is your TMJ. It is a type of condylar sin synovial joint. It's a type of condylar synovial joint. Okay. It's a type of condylar synovial joint. What are the similar uh, the articular structures? So articular structures uh, are your a fibrocartilaginous disc which is a remnant of your lateral pterygoid muscle. 
ओके एंड योर मैंडिबुलर फॉसा इज द मैंडिबुलर फॉसा इज द मैंडिबुलर फॉसा इज आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल इज आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल दिस वन आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल एंड देन यू है टिम्पैनिक प्लेट सो टॉकिंग अबाउट द अपर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेसेस अपर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेस इज द आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल एंड एंटीरियर टू थर्ड ऑफ ए मैंडिबुलर फॉसा दिस मैंडिबुलर फॉसा दिस इज द एंटीरियर टू थर्ड एंटीरियर टू थर्ड ऑफ मैंडिबुलर फॉसा एंड आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल एंड आर्टिकुलर ट्यूबरकल दिस आर फॉर्मिंग योर अपर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेसेस एंड लोअर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेसेस दिस आर फॉर्म द हेड ऑफ द मैंडिबल दिस हेड ऑफ द मैंडिबल द हेड ऑफ द मैंडिबल इज फॉर्मिंग योर लोअर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेसेस ओके द हेड ऑफ द मैंडिबल इज फॉर्मिंग योर लोअर आर्टिकुलर सर्फेसेस Talking about this, uh, this is a lateral pterygoid muscle. This is lateral pterygoid muscle which is attaching. Okay, this is your, art, uh, your articular tubercle. This is your articular tubercle present, and uh, this is a mandibular fossa. This is articular tubercle, mandibular fossa, EAC. That is external auditory canal. Uh, this is the articular disc. This is articular disc, and uh, we have we have the the uh, bands like this. This this whole part is whole part is called the articular disc. Now, if you just look at the articular disc in a little bit detail, we have the uh, this type of arrangement. We have this type of arrangement, and uh, this articular disc is the remnant of the tendon of a lateral pterygoid. Tendon of lateral pterygoid. And this articular is mainly dividing the TMJ into two joint cavities. Two joint cavities are being formed. Okay, the upper joint cavity and the lower joint cavity. So in the upper joint, this is the upper joint cavity that is being formed by the articular disc, and this is the lower joint cavity that is being formed by the articular disc. so uh, if you look at the structure there is anterior part there is anterior band a thickening of the anterior part intermediate part a posterior band and posterior bilaminar part which is again attaching to this so this is your articular disc and to this your lateral pterygoid muscle is attached then tmj tmj or the two joint cavities are separate by articular disc as i told earlier the upper, upper joint cavity where there will be gliding sliding movement here in the upper joint cavity there will be gliding and sliding movement the lower joint cavity there will be rotatory movements there will be rotatory movements in the lower joint cavity right what are the supports of tmj so have true supports and modified supports capsule true supports what are the true supports these are a capsule okay these are a capsule and lateral temporo mandibular ligament capsule lateral temporo mandibular ligament are your true supports okay so this is a lateral temporo mandibular ligament and uh, the fall support what the fall uh, or modified supports the stylo mandibular ligament and the spino mandibular ligament we'll talk about them so talk about the capsule capsule has uh, like Uh, two parts of the capsule that is ll and tt what is ll your loose laxative that is the upper part upper part is loose and laxative it's lax it lags it is very loose and the uh, the deep part the lower part is your tense and thick part tt tense and thick so ll is the upper part loose and laxative tt is the lower part tense and thick okay and then of the lateral temporo mandibular ligament lateral temporo mandibular ligament you can see in the diagram here like this and here also we have drawn the which is uh, connecting the articular disc to this uh, like like man, mandible okay it prevents the hyper retraction of the mandible then on the stylo mandibular ligament and the spino mandibular ligament just you can focus on this diagram so we have from the spine of the spinoid the spine of the spinoid and uh, here is a mylohyoid groove or the mylohyoid line so extending from this to the spine of the spinoid to a mylohyoid groove we have our we have a spino mandibular ligament and extending from the styloid process uh, styloid process the inferior angle of the mandible is is, is our stylo mandibular ligament the spino mandibular and the stylo mandibular ligaments okay so spine of spinoid to a point which is called the lingula lingula is the projection mainly you can also write your uh, mylohyoid group no problem in that so spine of spinoid to your lingula is your spino mandibular ligament and from styloid process uh, to this inferior angle of the mandible it is your stylo mandibular ligament stylo mandibular ligament clinical is that posterior dislocation of tmj that is a breaking of lateral leg, um, lateral ligament causes fracture of the tympanic plate okay if the lateral ligament is fractured like uh, you can uh, see the view okay of the fracture if there is uh, the lateral ligament is fractured the la sorry the lateral ligament is damaged okay breaking the lateral ligament breaks if there is very posterior dislocation the mandible is dislocated very posteriorly then the lateral ligaments breaks and uh, due to this there may be an uh, the problem to the tympanic plate the tympanic plate may fracture very commonly tympanic plate fracture is very common in this conditions what are the movements on the muscles so for elevation what muscles we have your temporalis mesenteral medial pterygoid 
for depression what muscle we have your lateral your lateral pterygoid right and another muscles for depression are the anterior belly of digestive mylohyoid and your genio geniohyoid okay mylohyoid geniohyoid and anterior belly of digestive are also for your depression protraction which muscle is there lateral pterygoid medial pterygoid and masseter you can just think of the muscles you can just think of the fibers which are which were going and how they were going and then easily write this muscle don't no need to mug up these things retraction which which was doing the retraction which is running that forward your temporalis yes the third fibers of temporalis is running like this yes and they will cause the retraction sideways movement medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid done nerve supply is the auricular temporal nerve and your mesenteric nerve right your auricular temporal nerve and your mesenteric nerve blood supply is the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery the superficial temporal artery is a branch of the external carotid artery this maxillary artery is of course a branch of the external carotid most common dislocation of tmj is the anterior dislocation the anterior dislocation if the mouth is excessively opened like yawning so anterior dislocation is most common in in your clinical years in your clinical classes or when you become a, a doctor a physician then uh, you will uh, see many cases of this tmj dislocation like uh, anterior dislocation they come uh, with open mouth in dentist in a dentist clinic to many patients uh, come like this and the dentist have to do uh, the methods okay uh, which are used to reduce this uh, temporal mandibular joint dislocation okay like this type of method is that traditional extra oral and a syringe method is that okay this type of method is that okay so that completes your temporal mandibular joint let's move on to the next concept Let's discuss about the parotid gland. Very important gland. Parotid gland is the largest salivary gland. You can get a long question on this parotid gland. It's mainly a serous gland. Uh, what is the extent? So this is a TMJ, your external artery canal, and your mastoid antrum. Uh, sorry, not your mastoid, the mastoid process. This is antrum. This is a masseter muscle. Is a masseter is uh, there in your mandible. This is a masseter, and this is a sternocleidomastoid. So you can have this blue region. It's your parotid gland that is present. This is the extent. You can draw this diagram. Capsule is covered by investing layer of the deep cervical fascia, superficial lamina and the deep lamina. Superficial lamina is thick and adherent to the gland. This is also called the parotidomesetric fascia. Parotidomesetric fascia. It is attached to the zygomatic arch, right? And due to this property, and uh, due to this uh, thick and adherent property, the mumps are very painful. The parotiditis or mumps are very painful. The deep lamina is thin and attached to the styloid process, the tympanic plate and the posterior border of ramus of mandible, okay? understood and uh, what are the borders we have we have an anterior border of uh, patrick gland posterior border anterior border posterior border and your medial border right your pharyngeal border then we have anterior medial surface your posterior medial surface and your superficial surface right so we have four surfaces the superior surface that is the base superficial surface that is the outer surface anterior medial and posterior medial surface in this we have uh, not shown our that superficial surface superficial surface a uh, superficial surface is seen your superior surface is not seen because we are looking at this okay so talking about this uh, what are the um, like uh, relations so superior surface what are the relations of the superior so superior surface th these are the things uh, you can see the things here external uh, this ex external acoustic meters is present this is a superior surface which we are discussing about uh, then this is a superior surface we are discussing about so this is your external acoustic meters present over here with the auricular temporal nerve that is going inside like this and uh, superficial temporal artery superficial temporal vein and the temporal branch of facial nerve also you can say uh, tmj also temporal mandibular joint okay so you can write external auditory canal tmj superficial temporal artery and super auricular temporal nerve okay so talking about the superior surface let's uh, uh, look from the uh, su superior surface and uh, we'll see the superficial surface superficial what is present superficially so skin superficial face are common okay and the rhizodius muscle uh, your platysma muscle is there platysma is there first then we'll get your rhizodius muscle that is a grinning muscle in the face and your parotid lymph nodes that are forming a superior uh, surface relations okay understood let's discuss the borders of so the anterior border posterior border and the medial border okay what are the that uh, relations of this so we can discuss the relations in anterior medial surface and the posterior medial surface okay 
so what are, what are the relations this is a parotid gland this is your ECA that is present okay and uh, your 12th nerve is lying like this your 12th nerve is going like this so uh, sorry not a 12th no, 7th now okay uh, re reading 7th but uh, saying 12th okay no problem the seventh nerve is going like this okay of course your facial nerve will uh, like uh, going like this and uh, this will form a anterior a relation of your anterior medial surface we have the ramus of the mandible let's see the cut section of the ramus of the mandible which will also form your anterior relation yes and the masseter muscle here masseter muscle is present over here which will form the anterior relation and the medial pterygoid this is the medial pterygoid which will be present over here the medial pterygoid which is also form your anterior medial relation so facial nerve, ramus of mandible, masseter muscle, medial pterygoid. Okay, and talking about the posterior relations, so posterior medial relations. These are your anterior medial surface. The relations of the posterior medial surface are your uh, styloid process and the related muscle. Uh, related muscles is a styloid process, and these are the muscles related to the styloid process. We have our mastoid process and the muscles attached to this mastoid process are your sternocleidomastoid, sternocleidomastoid and your posterior belly of digastric. So what are the uh, posterior medial uh, rela surface relations? You have the styloid process and related muscles, you have the posterior belly of digastric, mastoid process and the sternocleidomastoid, right? Done. So let's talk about the borders, uh, anterior border, it's related to a parotid duct, transverse facial artery and seventh nerve through terminal branches, parotid duct. The transverse facial artery and the seventh nerve to terminal branches posterior border is related with the sternocleidomastoid right sternocleidomastoid and medial border with the pharyngeal wall talking about the structures within the parotid gland deep to superficial what what structures we have first is the artery first is the artery artery is the most deepest then the veins are there that are little bit little bit superficial then the nerves are there that are like superficial most superficial okay so let's uh, discuss the parotid gland um, in the arteries, nerves and vessels, okay? So what arteries you have? You have a superficial temporal artery like this, superficial temporal artery. You have a transverse facial artery that is connecting the superficial temporal artery, okay? And uh, then what we have here, let's, let's say, let's discuss like that. You have an external carotid artery that is going inside and is continuing as a superficial temporal artery in the upper part. Okay, external carotid arteries, you can say branch is given. Uh, external carotid artery, what branch is given? A maxillary artery is also given. Okay, uh, this is a maxillary artery. And uh, which branch is a posterior auricular artery is given by the uh, that uh, external carotid artery. It also gives a transverse facial artery. It also gives a superficial temporal artery. Okay, so these are the arteries that are being given inside the parotid gland, inside the parotid gland. Your external carotid artery which will give your maxillary artery your posterior auricular artery your transverse facial artery and the superficial temporal artery right superficial temporal artery so you, you know the mnemonic some anatomists some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students so you know the mnemonic and you know the branches of your external carotid artery so first one the superior thyroid artery you won't see here okay superior thyroid artery you, uh, you won't see here then uh, what was a what was a uh, what was a so it was an ascending pharyngeal artery right which will also not be seen l is your lingual artery it is also not seen f is your facial artery it is also not seen o is your occipital artery not seen then your posterior auricular artery is seen posterior auricular artery is seen your maxillary artery is seen and your superficial temporal artery is seen okay superficial temporal artery is seen understood so these are your all your arteries okay these are all your arteries which are uh, present inside the parotid gland let's talk about the veins which are present inside the parotid gland talking about the veins so we have uh, what veins we have your superficial temporal vein that we have a transverse facial vein, transverse facial vein and a maxillary vein, okay? And uh, this superficial temporal vein, transverse facial vein, maxillary vein, it is coming down from the retromandibular vein. This maxillary vein, this transverse facial vein are generally forming a retromandibular vein. And this retromandibular vein is dividing into anterior division and the posterior division. So these are your veins which are present inside the parotid gland, present inside the parotid gland, right? The nerve, what are the nerves? 
so we have our seventh nub that is uh, going inside okay seventh nub is going inside it is forming two parts so your temporofacial trunk temporofacial trunk it forms a tft that is a temporofacial trunk and c is the cart cervicofacial trunk cervicofacial trunk so temporofacial trunk divides into temporal branch zygomatic branch right and your uh, cft that is a cervicofacial trunk it divides into a lower buccal your upper buccal lower buccal and upper buccal okay your marginal band mandibular branch and your cervical branch marginal mandibular and your cervical branch okay and uh, this isthmus part of this uh, parietal gland the isthmus this part is uh, like uh, surrounded by facial nerve twice so it is called the petis facios facio venous plane it's called the petis facio venous plane superficial part and deep part uh, there is uh, like Isthmus is present, which is supplied with the uh, facial vein twice. Okay, so it is called the facies, uh, petis facio venous plane. Blood supply parotid gland is the ECA and the branches within the gland, and the um, nerve supply, uh, the, the venous drainage is the external jugular vein and your internal jugular vein, right? Nerve supply is a sensory supply, secretomotor pathway and the sympathetic pathway. Three pathways are there. Sensory supply, secretomotor supply and the sympathetic pathway. So, uh, you know about the sensory, sensory nerve is a great auricular nerve. That is a C2 to C3 segment, great auricular nerve that supplies the skin and the fascia over the parotid gland, sensory supply. Secretomotor pathway, remember we discussed earlier uh, in the parotid, parotid gland, secretomotor pathway we discussed in uh, that uh, uh nerve the nerves part okay and your parasympathetic pathway that is a secreto uh parasympathetic secretomotor pathway okay uh that 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 is that was how it was going so we are just talking about the secretomotor path pathway again so inferior salivary nucleus then your ninth nerve jacobson's nerve it will form and jacobson's nerve will be contributing to your tympanic plexus and coming via this middle middle layer cavity and all and lesser petrosal nerve this lateral petrosal nerve relays in otic ganglion this otic ganglion from this functional nerve the b3 nerve will arise and this v3 nerve will give rise to auriculotemporal nerve this auriculotemporal nerve will supply your parotid gland sympathetic supply how from the T1 segment, it relays into this uh, sympathetic chain, and from the sympathetic chain, there arise uh, the postganglionic fibers. They arise and wound around the middle meningeal artery and supply the parotid gland. You can just draw this diagram in a sympathetic supply. Let's talk about lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic drainage, the parotid or pre-auricular lymph nodes, which drain again into a deep cervical lymph nodes. As I told, the deep cervical lymph nodes are the major structure in which all are draining. Parotid duct is a Stenson's duct which is 5 cm long. We know this. What are the relations of the Stenson's duct? So this is the Stenson's duct. This is the parotid gland. So uh, talking about the relations, we have a transverse facial vessel that is like going here. The transverse facial vein and your upper buccal nerve. Upper buccal nerve is like going inside. Okay, uh, going inside. Uh, then now uh, we have our inside. We have the lower buccal nerve in this part. Okay, so talking about the relations, the, uh, the relations that are uh, there. Okay, uh, we have our relations are very simple. Your uh, transverse facial vein and nerve, and upper buccal nerve. Uh, these are your uh, upper relations, your uh, superior relations. Inferior relation is just your lower buccal nerve. Very simple. Yes. What are the structures that are pierced by this? Pierced by this tension duct. Okay, there are the structures pierced by the parotid gland, not the parotid gland. You can write your parotid duct to be specific in this part. Okay, you can write easily your parotid duct. So from outside to inside, from outside to inside, there are BBBM structure. Okay, BBBM structure. What is this BBBM structure? First, the outside one is the buccal fat. This is your buccal fat. This is your buccal fat. And uh, B is again your buccopharyngeal fascia. We have our buccopharyngeal fascia. Remember, uh, uh, you are, we are discussing the D, uh, DCN, the deep cervical fascia of the neck. So we have the buccopharyngeal fascia, right? Then we have the buccinator muscle that it is piercing. Buccinator muscle is pierced by this. And then we have the mucous membrane. M is for your mucous membrane. Uh, for your mucous membrane. Okay. So it is supplying this four things bbbm from outside to inside and this opens into a vestibule opposite to your upper second molar it opens to your vestibule opposite to your upper second molar let's discuss the clinicals so clinicals you have parotid abscess parotid abscess is an o into oral cavity by the stenson's duct so parotid abscess can go into the oral cavity by the stenson's duct parotid canaliculi it's an injection of radio opaque dye inside the duct uh, and uh, parotid duct pathway can be seen via dye in your x-ray 
which is called the sialogram and uh, show a picture of the sialogram fred syndrome what is fred syndrome so you have a par parotid gland and uh, auricular temporal nerve was a secretomotor nerve that was suffering uh, the parotid gland and great auricular nerve was a sensory nerve great auricular nerve was a sensory nerve which will carry the sensations right so there is a valerian degeneration of this auricular temporal nerve this part of the auricular temporal nerve and when it regenerates when it regenerates the auricular temporal nerve fibers fuse with the great auricular nerve accidentally this fuse with the great auricular nerve accidentally after regeneration with tn and gn this main nerves this this nerves are involved in this uh, phase syndrome okay so uh, this will fuse and uh, the effect what will be the effect the salivary stimulus will cause the sweating so the person if there is any salivary stimulus look at the uh, child he is about he is about to sweat he is uh, like sweating his cheeks are red and he will start sweating so on salivary stimulus if uh, sweating will occur it is your phrase syndrome this is a parotid abscess this parotid abscess uh, like uh, it is uh, very dangerous and it also prevents the closing of eye eye and this parotid abscess causes the closing of eye why because this uh, this branch the temporal branch this one yes the temporal branch this uh, temporal branch is a gigomatic branch this gigomatic branch temporal branch is just going above the head like this so this gigomatic branch is basically supplying your orbicularis oculi muscle which is responsible for the closing of eye okay which is responsible for closing of eye so the patient won't be able to close his eye in a parotid abscess it is often asked as a assertion reason based question and this is parotiditis parotiditis is the swelling of the parotid gland this is a parotid abscess this is a sialogram okay the dye is injected here you can see the dye being injected here dye is injected and uh, this uh, x-ray is done then the uh, opacity is noted the silvery uh, streaks are there uh, to visualize the duct and the gland okay this is a sialogram so that completes your major major topic that is your parotid gland okay which is a uh, main part which is asked in your exams understood so afterwards let's move on to the next concepts after the parotid gland let's move to an uh, important like uh, interesting concept that is your lacrimal apparatus often it is asked uh, you can get a long question also if in uh, cases and uh, you can get a short note on lacrimal apparatus also so we have the lacrimal gland the lacrimal ducts the conjunctival sac the lacrimal punctum the lacrimal canaliculi lacrimal sac and your nasolacrimal duct nasolacrimal duct so what are the things you can see you can uh, uh, see here is your eye okay and this is the conjunctival sac of the eye conjunctival sac of the eye this one this is a lacrimal canal here a lacrimal canal are there this lacrimal canals are converging to form a lacrimal sac this lacrimal sac and this lacrimal sac um, like extends to form a nasolacrimal duct okay and here also we have the lacrimal ducts that are connecting the conjunctival sac to this uh, lacrimal uh, gland and uh, you have the levator and uh, the lps that is your uh, lps is your levator palpebrae superioris uh, which is dividing the lacrimal gland into palpebral part and the orbital part palpebral part and the orbital part so here are all uh, your structures lacrimal gland is a j-shaped gland it's a serous gland j-shaped serous gland and around uh, your levator palpebrae superior uh, that uh, the levator palpebrae superior is the gland is divided into two parts that is large orbital part and small palpebral part so this large orbital part is present in the lacrimal fossa and the small palpebral part is present in the lateral part of upper eyelids lateral part of upper eyelids okay what are the ducts there are uh, 12 ducts so 4 to 5 ducts from the orbital part 6 to 8 ducts from the palpebral part and 1 ml of lacrimal fluid is produced per day accessory lacrimal glands if they are present this is called the gland of cross gland of cross this glands of cross there are small serous glands near the conjunctival fornices. Small serous glands are present, which are called the gland of cross, and uh, which are present near the conj conjunctival fornices. Upper eyelid is 30, 35 to 40 glands, and lower eyelids have 6 to 8 glands. Okay, these are your accessory lacrimal glands. Understood? Also called the glands of cross. Arterial supply, lacrimal artery, which is a branch of your ophthalmic artery, venous drain is the ophthalmic vein. Nerve supply is the sensory nerve. Sensory nerve is the lacrimal nerve. That is a V1 branch. V1 branch is uh, that V1 nerve branch. Okay, that is your uh, branch of your ophthalmic nerve. That is a trigeminal nerve. Okay, 
and a parasympathetic innovation how is the parasympathetic innovation to a lacrimal apparatus so the superior salivatory nucleus that is uh, forming a nervous intermedius that is seventh nerve the small branch of nervous intermedius this is uh, relaying the greater petrosal nerve and relaying into the pterygopalatine ganglion this relays into the pterygopalatine ganglion from where the v2 nerve arises v2 is a maxillary nerve this goes via the zygomatic nerve um, gives the zygomatico temporal nerve which innervates the lacrimal nerve and the lacrimal gland so this was the pathway we discussed also in the facial nerve part let's talk about the sympathetic innervation so the sympathetic innervation starts from the t1 level it goes into superior cervical ganglion post ganglionic fibers this go on sympathetic plexus around the ica with the deep petrosal nerve sympathetic plexus give rise to a deep petrosal nerve this deep petrosal nerve also uh, like uh, relays in the pterygopalatine ganglion which is a v2 nerve v2 nerve is zygomatic nerve zygomatic temporal nerve same same pathway from this lacrimal nerve lacrimal gland okay this is sympathetic pathway just the difference is that from the uh, sim in the sympathetic pathway first we have the t1 from the t1 uh, the it is going to the superior cervical ganglion from the superior cervical ganglion the post ganglionic fibers are forming the sympathetic plexus from the sympathetic plexus we have a deep petrosal nerve and this deep petrosal nerve is connecting is uh, last lastly merging with the pterygopalatine ganglion this relaying into the pterygopalatine ganglion right this is a sympathetic pathway Let's talk about the conjunctival sac. Conjunctival sac is present in the bulbar and the uh, palpebral conjunctiva. Okay. And the lacrimal canaliculi. Lacrimal canaliculi. These are your lacrimal canaliculi. Vertical part is 2 mm. This vertical part is 2 mm like this. The horizontal part is 8 mm. Horizontal part is 8 mm. Right. Lacrimal sac is 12 mm into 5 mm wide. 12 mm long into 5 mm wide. This is present behind the medial palpebral ligament. Nasolacrimal duct. Nasolacrimal duct. It runs backward laterally and uh, downward backward downward and laterally this is a nasolacrimal duct just i have to show you a diagram yes this one this one is a nasolacrimal duct so this nasolacrimal duct which is running downward backward and laterally it opens into the inferior meters and valve of hasner what is the valve of hasner valve of hasner is basically a valve that is guarding your nasolacrimal duct okay this valve of hasner guards the nasolacrimal duct Clinical lacrimal gland inflammation is called the dacrocystitis. You can see there is very uh, uh, pus formation is that this uh, inflammation of lacrimal gland here below the just below the uh, lower sub, um, eye margin. Okay, or here in the lateral part of the eye you can have it dacrocystitis. And all the ducts pass on palpebral part of the lacrimal gland. Removal of palpebral part is equal to the removal of the anterior gland because all the ducts. Pass from the palpebral part of the lacrimal gland, right? Epiphora, what is epiphora? Epiphora is the excessive watery eye. This lacrimal fluid over the cheeks due to incomplete canalization of nasolacrimal duct. Like there is a problem in the nasolacrimal duct due to which the uh, fluid is leaking. Okay, the fluid is leaking every minute and the tears are coming each and every second. Okay, so there is excessive tears, excessive eye watering that is called as the epiphora. epiphora. And this is due to incomplete canalization, canalization of your nasolacrimal duct, right? So that completes your lacrimal apparatus. Let's move on to the next part. Let's discuss about the palate after the lacrimal gland. Let's talk about the soft palate. Soft palate functions to separate the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. The two surfaces, anterior surface, this is the anterior surface, and your posterior surface, this is the posterior surface. Anterior surface is also called as the oral surface. It has two borders, superior border that is attached to the posterior border of hard palate. Superior border is attached to the posterior border of the hard palate. Okay. And the inferior border. The inferior border is the free. Is a free border. Inferior border is the free border. That is free and bounds the pharyngeal isthmus. Contains eviola. This uh, inferior border of this uh, palate, soft palate is containing your eviola. Right. So this is your hard palate and this is your soft palate. You can uh, see this is your tongue and there is a muscle that is a palatoglossus this is a muscle that is called the palatoglossus and there is a muscle which is called the palatopharyngeus going from palate to the pharynx okay the palatoglossus is called the anterior pillar while the palatopharyngeus is called the posterior pillar posterior pillar right so what is palate and aponeurosis it is the extensor of your tensor velli palatini muscle extensor of the tensor velli palatini muscle so what you have you have an auditory tube here you have an auditory tube here your tensor velli palatini is like that your levator velli palatini is like that okay your tensor velli palatini and levator velli palatini okay so if 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 these muscles are there 
there is a that uh, aponeurosis here is the, this green part is the aponeurosis that is formed and uh, this has this part is called the musculus evil this uh, uh, like uh, widespread part or you can say dilated part okay and uh, this is again formed by palatopharynges and palatoglossus okay so this all are contributing to the formation of a palatine aponeurosis and basically it is an extension of a tensor villi palatine right what are the muscles of palate? So, a tensor valley palatine origin from the spin up, spin, spine of the uh, spinoid and an auditory tube. It originates from the spine of spinoid or auditory tube. Inserts into the pterygoid, winds around the pterygoid humulus and attaches to the palatine crest. Attaches to the palatine crest. This is the palatine crest. Okay, uh, we are talking about the tensor valley palatine attaches to the palatine crest. Okay, and forms your, and forms your palatine aponeurosis, right? Palatine aponeurosis. Okay. And the nerve is to nerve to the medial pterygoid. Action is to tense the soft palate. Very simple. Tensor valley palatine tenses the soft palate. Levator valley palatine. This auditory tube and petrous part of temporal bone is its origin. Origin is from auditory tube again. And a petrous part of the temporal bone. Inserts into the palatine aponeurosis. Nerve supplies the VAC. Vago accessory complex. Vago accessory complex. Right. And elevates the soft palate. Then on the palatoglossus, palatoglossus again originates from the, this originates. Just remember that this originates from the palatine aponeurosis. The originates from the palatine aponeurosis like this. This all muscles are these are attaching to this uh, aponeurosis. But what about the palatoglossus? The palatoglossus. This is originating, right? This is originating from the aponeurosis. It is originating from the palatine aponeurosis and attaching to the side of the tongue. Palatoglossus, we know this, is supplied by the vago accessory complex. All the muscles of tongue are supplied by dash. Yes, 12th nerve. And this vago, this palatoglossus is supplied by the vagal accessory complex. Pulls the root of the tongue and narrows the uh, oroesophageal constriction. Why it is crashing? Just, just a minute. We were, where were we? Basically, we were discussing about the palate, right? Yes. Okay, and here what we have, we have our palatopharynges, palatopharynges muscle, and this palatopharynges muscle, what it is doing, so it is originating from the palatine aponeurosis and attaching to the posterior border of thyroid cartilage, right? Posterior border of thyroid cartilage of the pharynx, posterior border of thyroid cartilage, and nerve supplies a VAC, vagal accessory complex, and it elevates the pharynx. Okay, palatopharynges elevates the pharynx, right? The musculus evoli, musculus evoli, this uh, uh, originates the posterior border of hard palate and inserts in the mucous membrane of uvula, supplied by the VAC and elevates the uvula. Musculus evoli elevates the uvula. Very simple, right? This is the uvular muscle, musculus evoli. Okay, this is a tensor valley palate, you can see. This is the levator valley palate, you can see. And uh, palatopharynges is this part. What is the nerve supplied to the palate? Motor nerve, all muscles are supplied to the VAC except the tensor valley palatine. Tensor valley palatine is supplied by the V3 nerve, right? Supplied by the fifth nerve, that is uh, the mandibular nerve, mandibular nerve, supplying the TVP. Talking about general sensations, lesser, lesser palatine nerve and uh, uh, lesser palatine nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, these both nerves are you're gen taking a general sensation like lesser palatine and your glossopharyngeal nerve, right? And the secretomotor fibers arises from the superior salivary nucleus uh, by seventh nerve, greater petrosal nerve, pterygopalatine ganglion, lesser petropalatine nerve. Take from the pterygopalatine ganglion, lesser palatine nerve and lesser palatine nerve will supply the glands in the soft palate, right? Glands in the soft palate. And the taste sensation, taste from soft palate moves by the lesser palatine nerve. Uh, uh, there is, it doesn't relay into PPG but goes into PPG. And from that, greater petrosal nerve will arise. It will go by the geniculate ganglion, the sixth, seventh nerve, and the nucleus of to the nucleus of the tractus solitarius, right? It is going in a retrograde manner from the taste to the nucleus of tractus solitarius. What is the blood supply? Greater palatine artery, ascending palatine artery, palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery. Greater palatine artery is a branch of your maxillary artery. Peak pass, remember? Peak pass, mnemonic, remember, you know? And ascending palatine artery was the facial artery branch. Remember the branches given by the facial artery in the neck? Stag branches, yes, yes. And palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery is a ECA, external carotid artery branch. Okay. 
venous drainage pterygoid venous plexus and the tonsillar venous plexus and lymphatic drainage lymphatic drainage the upper deep cervical lymph nodes upper deep cervical lymph nodes and retropharyngeal lymph nodes upper deep cervical lymph nodes and your retropharyngeal lymph nodes so here we complete our palette uh, now we'll uh, let's uh, let's move on to the next topic let's move on to the next topic of this chapter okay Okay, so let's complete our thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is mainly an endocrine gland. Two lobes and isthmus are present. This isthmus is also called the pyramidal lobe. Isthmus is also sometimes called the pyramidal lobe. You can see uh, there is a muscle that is levator glandular thyroidia. This is connecting it to the hyoid bone. The isthmus. Situation and extent. It arises on C5 to T1 level. C5 to T1 level. Just the root value of the brachial plexus you can just remember like this. Okay. Thyroid gland. C5 to T1 level. C5 is the lower border of C5. That is the oblique line of thyroid cartilage. Okay. And uh, T1. The lower border of T1. Right. And isthmus is present in front of a second to fourth tracheal cartilage. We will see in the posterior relation of this isthmus. Right. And... Uh, Talking about dimensions, we have the gland that is 5 cm, 2.5 cm into 2.5 cm. For the isthmus, we have 1.2 cm into 1.2 cm. Talking about the capsule, capsule, true capsule is condensation of the gland's own stroma, right? The capillary plexus is deep to it, and the false capsule, false capsule is covered with the pre tracheal layer of deep cervical fascia, right? Pre tracheal layer of a deep cervical fascia is covering the thyroid gland. Remember this? Yes. Modification of suspensory ligament of berry. We talked about this, right? This is a pretracheal fascia, it is covering the uh, thyroid gland and then a ligament is there which is connecting to the cricoid cartilage. So when there is deglutition, when there is deglutition, there is the pull by the longitudinal muscles of pharynx and uh, due to this, the whole gland, the thyroid gland will also move up. The thyroid gland will move up in deglutition, okay. Apex, talking about apex, apex is limited by superior thyroid artery related to superior thyroid artery and external laryngeal nerve. And base is the inferior thyroid artery. Base is the inferior thyroid artery. Talking about the blood supply uh, here. Superior thyroid artery is present in its apex. And the base is your inferior thyroid artery. So we are going to see the structure. Uh, remember this structure we saw also uh, when we were discussing about the deep cervical fascia, right? We have the trachea, we have the esophagus and the thyroid gland. This one is the thyroid gland. This is uh, I'm marking as a thyroid gland, right? And it's covered, it's covered by your uh, pretracheal layer of a deep circle fascia. Muscles are there, some muscles are there. In front of this gland, in two sides, we have the sternothyroid. Then in this side, we have a sternohyoid muscle. And then your bellies of omohyoid. Bellies of omohyoid. That's the superior belly of omohyoid. Superior belly of omohyoid is present. Okay. Which will form your anterior relation. This is sternocleidomastoid. You can very well observe. And this is a carotid sheath is from the posterior lateral relation. Okay, so talking about the surfaces, we have the superficial surface that is a sternocleidomastoid, sternothyroid, sternohyoid, and superior belly of omohyoid. All this muscle, all this muscle, which are forming a superior relations or forming a superior or lateral relations. Medial surface, medial surface that is following the rule of two. Medial surface is following the rule of two. Uh, two tubes that is trachea and esophagus. Two muscles that is inferior constrictor and cricothyroid okay and the two nerves that is your external laryngeal nerve and your recurrent laryngeal nerve which are just supplying the medial surface like not supplying you can say present in the medial surface right and posterior lateral surface we have our carotid sheath and carotid sheath contains you know internal carotid artery external jugular vein and your vagus nerve right and the answer cervicalis is present at the wall of your carotid sheath Talking about the borders, borders is anterior border, superior thyroid artery, middle posterior border is the anastomosis between the superior thyroid and the inferior thyroid artery plus the parathyroid gland. We have isthmus, the isthmus part is there, which has two surfaces and two borders. Anterior surface of isthmus, it has anterior and posterior surfaces. Anterior surface is related to sternothyroid and sternohyoid. Posterior surface to the second and second to fourth tracheal rings. Superior border to the superior thyroid artery, inferior border to the thyroid ema, thyroid ema. Okay, thyroid ema is a direct branch of your aorta. Present in some 75, 7.5% 7 of your uh, population. The arch of aorta, direct branch comes, which is called the thyroid ema. So, talking about the arterial supply, this is your thyroid gland. So, uh, this is a common carotid artery. Common carotid artery is giving an internal and external carotid. This external carotid artery is coming and, and the superior, th th superior thyroid artery is basically supplying the gland. Basically supplying the gland. And uh, from the thyrocervical trunk, 
ओके दिस इज ऑल्सो दिस थायरो सर्वाइकल ट्रंक वॉज ऑल्सो प्रेजेंट द फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ द सब क्लीव इन आर्टरी फ्रॉम द थायरो सर्वाइकल ट्रंक वी हैव आवर इन्फीरियर थायरो आर्टरी विच इज कमिंग लाइक दिस एंड सप्लाइंग एंड डिवाइडिंग टू फोर टू फाइव ब्रांचेस विच इज एनास्टोमोजिंग विद द एक्सटर्नल कैरेटेड आर्टरी विद द सुपीरियर थायरो आर्टरी राइट सो ए ब्रांच ऑफ योर सुपीरियर थायरो आर्टरी एंड ए ब्रांच ऑफ योर ए ब्रांच ऑफ योर इन्फीरियर थायरो आर्टरी दिज आर एनास्टोमोजिंग इन दिस पॉइंट राइट and this superior thyroid artery is supplying the isthmus from this part and this thyroid ema is supplying the isthmus from the uh, posterior end like from the uh, below inferior end superior th- uh, we can have the nerves here uh, the nerve that is lying uh, like uh, running with the superior thyroid artery closely is the external laryngeal nerve and the nerve that is running like closely a little bit closely with the internal thyroid artery internal thyroid artery in uh, sorry inferior thyroid artery what i am saying inferior thyroid artery is a recurrent laryngeal nerve so superior thyroid artery should be ligated close to the gland to spare the external laryngeal nerve it should be ligated close to the gland right so as to prevent any ligation and inferior thyroid artery is selectively ligated close to the gland so as the blood supply to parathyroid gland is also not compromised right Talking about the venous drainage, we have the in- internal jugular vein. This is the internal jugular vein. We have a right subclavian, right brachiocephalic, left brachiocephalic, left subclavian. This internal jugular vein is draining into a right subclavian and right brachiocephalic vein. The junction between them, right, and uh, this uh, upper part is drained by is being drained by super, superior temporal uh, superior thyroid vein, and uh, middle part of the middle thyroid vein, and the in- inferior part by the inferior thyroid vein. inferior thyroid vein is not draining the inferior part it is basically draining the blood from your isthmus part draining blood from your isthmus part another uh, special branch is there which is uh, draining into your right brachiocephalic vein this special branch it is called as your fourth vein of kocher fourth vein of kocher which is not always present and uh, talking about uh, your inferior thyroid vein itv itv is also there and this is draining the left brachiocephalic vein left brachiocephalic is longer than the right brachiocephalic vein lymphatic drain is upper part with the upper deep cervical lymph nodes lower part in the lower deep cervical lymph nodes nerve supply superior cervical ganglion middle cervical ganglion inferior cervical ganglion done these are vasomotor sympathetic ganglions and this middle cervical ganglion this is the main nerve supply so that completes your thyroid gland that completes your thyroid gland now we'll move to the next part next concept So guys, let's talk about palatine tonsils. So you can see here is our palate, hard palate and the soft palate, and here is our tongue. Uh, in the palatoglossal fold and the palatopharyngeal fold, you have a palatine tonsil here. Palatine tonsil. What are the borders? Border anterior border is the palatoglossal arch. What the palatoglossus muscle? Posterior border is the palatopharyngeal arch. What palatopharyngeal muscle? Yes, easy. What the poles? Upper pole is formed by the soft palate. This is the upper pole from the soft palate and lower pole. Lower pole, the dorsal surface, a posterior one third of tongue. You can see here, dorsal surface of posterior one third of tongue. Let's talk about surfaces. We, we take a transverse section of this. We take a transverse section of this. Uh, so what will you observe? That uh, these are your tonsillar crypts. There are some tron- tonsillar crypts, and uh, here we have the intra tonsillar cleft. Intra tonsillar cleft. That is called as crypta magna. Crypta magna. Then uh, palatopharyngeus. Here also pa- here palatopharynges and here palatoglossus, right? Palatopharynges was forming an anterior boundary. So um, this this part is the anterior part and this uh, posterior part. And afterwards we are looking for the superior part. Okay. So intra tonsillar cleft or intra tonsillar cleft is the largest of the tonsillar crypts, and it is the site of opening of the third uh, the second pouch. Okay, site of opening of the second pouch. You talk about. Uh, I'm talking about your uh, that pharyngeal pouches, right? And here's the capsule. Here's the capsule, and we have the pharyngobasilar fascia, buccopharyngeal fascia, and all. So tonsillar bed. How the tonsillar bed is formed? Your pharyngobasilar fascia, pharyngobasilar fascia, the superior constrictor muscle, and the buccopharyngeal fascia. So we are here. We have the pharyngobasilar. Here we have the pharyngobasilar fascia, right? And uh, here we have the superior constrictor muscle, and then. Your buccopharyngeal fascia, which are forming a tonsillar bed, right? Medial surface, it is uh, stratified lined with stratified squamous epithelium. It has 12 to 15 crypts like this. The medial surface 12 to 15 crypts. And largest one is the intra tonsillar 
left largest one is the intratonsillar cleft which is the site of opening of the second pouch which is called the crypta magna right this intratonsillar cleft this is also called as the crypta magna lateral surface is between capsule and the tonsillar band and loose erigular tissue is present in them so now in the plane of cleavage or incision in case of tonsillectomy is this lateral surface right and here is a peritonsillar abscess you can see okay just in front of insertion of palatoglossus and palatopharyngeus there is a suspensory ligament of tonsil suspensory ligament of tonsil which prevents the swallowing of tonsil of course the tonsil is present in this part okay uh, present in this part so we can like some somewhere it may happen that the tonsils are swallowed but uh, this is prevented by the suspensory ligament of the tonsils right vestigial mucosal folds so let's talk about them so here is our tonsil so have a mucosal fold at the upper pole that is called the plica semilunaris a semilunar type of fold at the upper pole and the lower pole at the anterior inferior but not exactly the lower pole we have a, another uh, like fold it is called the plica triangularis plica triangularis Let's talk about the blood supply of the tonsil. So we have our external carotid artery going like this. External carotid artery has a maxillary artery, remember? And maxillary artery gives a branch, which is called the greater palatine artery. Greater palatine artery, which supplies the tonsil. Then another branch of ascending pharyngeal artery was the medial branch of ECA, which was again giving a branch. Is the palatine branch of your asc uh, ascending pharyngeal artery that will also supply your tonsil, right? And facial artery, facial artery, we had a tonsil artery, remember? does the main artery of the tonsil main artery of the tonsil is tonsil artery remember that this tonsil artery also gives a branch to your tongue right this is a tonsil artery and another branch of facial artery is a ascending palatine artery ascending palatine artery which is also giving a branch to your tonsil and from your knee, lingual artery lingual artery is also a branch of your external carotid we have a dorsal lingual artery dorsal lingual artery which is also giving a branch Remember the dorsal ling the lingual artery was going like this. It was uh, dividing into deep lingual artery and two dorsal lingual arteries, right? Which was supplying the tongue. The dorsal lingual artery is also giving a branch to your tonsil. So that 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 is the blood supply of the tonsil. Blood supply of the tonsil. Talking about the venous drainage. Venous drainage is in the lower part of tonsil. The veins will pierce your superior constrictor and drain into your palatine vein, pharyngeal vein, and the facial vein, right? Palatine vein, pharyngeal vein, and the facial vein. Lymphatic drainage is a jugulodigastric lymph node. Jugulodigastric lymph node. We'll talk about a lymphatic drainage of your head and neck uh, in great detail after we complete all these parts. And nerve, the nervous supply is the ninth nerve and lesser palatine nerve, which is a branch of your pterygopalatine ganglion. Ninth and a lesser palatine nerve. Clinical tonsillitis, referred pain of tonsillitis is uh, lateralis to the ear, ear anterolateral to the ninth nerve, anterolateral to the ninth nerve. So tonsillar pain, tonsillitis pain is uh, referred to the ear. What is quincy? Quincy is your peritonsillar abscess where incision is given at the most prominent part of the abscess. Okay, incision is given at the most prominent part of the abscess. Tonsillolith, tonsillolith is a calculi in the tonsil. You can see there is a tonsillolith. Stones are formed in the tonsil. And uh, there is, for tonsillectomy, tonsillectomy we have a guillotine method. Guillotine method, which is which was used in earlier times, like uh, this has invasive nature. This had an invasive nature, and the tonsil tonsils are just removed surgically by using this method. But it is abandoned due to the risk of bleeding. So there is more risk of bleeding nowadays. The tonsils are drained in uh, uh, using an advanced techniques. So this is now abandoned. Okay. So uh, that's that's about a palatine tonsil. We'll move to the next part now. So guys, let's talk about the eustachian tube, eustachian or auditory tube, or your pharyngotympanic tube, or your pharyngotympanic tube. Uh, so eustachian tube is like uh, present like this. This is your eustachian tube. This uh, direction is a downward, forward, and medially. Downward, forward, and medially. And uh, this it has a bony part. It has a bony part. It is bounded by bone and a cartilaginous part. Cartilaginous part. So eustachian tube has a bony part and cartilage part. Let's look about this. What is the function? Connects your nasopharynx. Connects your nasopharynx to the middle ear. It connects your nasopharynx to your middle ear, right? And direction is downward, forward, and medially. Downward, forward, and medially. Understood? So this is a middle ear. This is a middle ear, and uh, this middle ear is being connected to your nasopharynx. It's being connected to opening of the nasopharynx, and uh, this is connecting like this. Uh, if I have another diagram to show you how it is connected, just let me. Okay, well, this this one. Just uh, look at this. 
this is a pellet and uh, here this is a open this is a whole part this is a whole part is a nasopharynx okay uh, we'll talk about this nasopharynx we'll talk about this nasopharynx and how it is connected to the middle ear uh, we'll discuss let's first discuss the uh, the uh, features external features of this eustachian tube so it has a bony part and a cartilaginous part bony part and a cartilaginous part and uh, in the cartilaginous part is a fibrous membrane stretched in it bony part is 12 mm long posterior laterally present posterior laterally and between the tympanic and the petrous part of the temporal bone understood this present the petrous part this is a petrous part of the temporal bone uh, it is present and uh, it opens on the anterior wall of the middle ear opens on the anterior wall of the middle ear opens the anterior wall of the middle ear right cartilaginous part is 24 mm long that is anterior medial so this was 12 mm and the double is 24 mm and uh, made up of fibroelastic cartilage cartilaginous part is made up of fibroelastic cartilage this one is made up of fibroelastic cartilage right and uh, uh, this medial wall roof and the upper part of lateral wall these are made up of fibroelastic cartilage and uh, fibrous membrane makes up the floor and the lower part lateral lower part and the floor is made up of by this this fibrous membrane and the cartilage is making up the lateral wall the roof and your middle wall right upper part of the lateral wall medial wall and the roof then lining epithelium pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium that is again your respiratory epithelium arterial supply ascending pharyngeal artery middle meningeal artery and artery to pterygoid canal these are branches of your maxillary artery so maxillary artery branches like your ascending pharyngeal artery middle meningeal artery and the artery to pterygoid canal these are supplying your station tube venous plexus we have the pterygoid venous plexus and the pharyngeal venous plexus uh, which are supplying it which are taking the blood away from it and lymph nodes we have the retropharyngeal lymph nodes for your station tube we have retropharyngeal lymph nodes nerve supply the ostium the cartilaginous part and the bony part for the ostium ostium is supplied by the v2 nerve okay v2 nerve is the maxillary nerve and cartilaginous part is sub supplied by the nervous spinosus that is a v3 nerve branch of v3 nerve that is mandibular nerve and your bony part is supplied by the tympanic plexus bony part by the tympanic plexus that is a ninth nerve so v2 nerve v3 nerve and ninth nerve that is your uh, supplying your eustachian tube right and then the tubal tonsils present like this so in infants just a, a, a common uh, clinical that infants the eustachian tube is horizontal so there is more chances of middle ear infection that is the otitis media so there are more chances of otitis media in infants due to uh, horizontally placed eustachian tube and uh, as they grow up in age there are less chances of uh, infections as it becomes you are medially forward and like this okay talking about the nasopharynx and uh, here you have your uh, auditory tube you have your auditory tube here you can see the auditory tube is present over here and then you are taking a sagittal section right sagittal section so this will appear like this and uh, above the auditory tube you have a tubal tonsil present or tubal tubal tonsil present and here here you can see the hard pellet the soft pellet it is attached to the uh, this uh, soft pellet and hard pellet lining okay and uh, a pouch is there here this is called the rathkis pouch a rathkis pouch is there and this rathkis pouch is an remnant of anterior pituitary gland remnant of anterior pituitary gland okay means that case pouch is generally uh, is present in seen embryonic stage and it uh, means like it, it is uh, forming an anterior pituitary gland right and the pharyngeal tonsils are there your nasopharynx nasopharyngeal bursa is there which is also called the pouch of lusca pouch of lusca is a nasopharyngeal bursa in addition of notochord to dorsal part of foregut it does the addition of notochord to the dorsal part of the foregut right and here what folds we have we are zooming into this structure we are zooming into this structure let's come here so here you have your auditory tube and two folds i told yes the one is the salpingo palatine fold salpingo palatine fold one is the salpingo pharyngeal fold salpingo palatine salpingo pharyngeal right so salpingo palatine fold is connecting to the palate and salpingo pharyngeal is connecting to this pharynx okay so here we have your salpingo pharyngeal fold which is formed by the levator villi palatini right and the salpingo pharyngeal fold is formed by the salpingo pharyngeus salpingo pharyngeus muscle okay so that completes the eustachian tube let's move on to the next part so guys let's talk about the nasal cavity now so you can uh, see uh, there are these are your sinuses some are pointed here frontal sinus this is your frontal sinus and uh, this is your crista galli crista galli ethmoid sinus is there like this frontal sinus ethmoid sinus then um, we have your maxillary sinus this is a big maxillary sinus that is present 
and maxillary sinus is present in a disadvantageous position that is it is the most dependent sinus and the largest sinus okay so when there is uh, any accumulation of any fluid or pus and uh, it, it, it drips down to a maxillary sinus is the most dependent sinus okay afterwards let's discuss about the nose and all okay nasal septum let's discuss about the nasal septum it is osseo cartilaginous structure that is it has a bony part and a cartilaginous part let's talk about all the parts this is the diagram for nasal septum okay let me show you this diagram this type of diagram this type of diagram is your uh, schematic diagram right so it is made of bony part is made up of this one what is this one this one is your perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone one is a perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone this is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone which is making it two is a vomer you can see the two this one this one is a vomer this one is a vomer which is making it then we have nasal spine of frontal bone which is making it this is the nasal spine of the frontal bone nasal spine of the frontal bone then four what is four the crest of the nasal bone four is a crest of the nasal bone crest of the nasal bone front and uh, nasal spine frontal bone crest of the nasal bone perpendicular plate perpendicular plate of your ethmoid bone and the vomer yes then we have five is a spinoidal crest five is the spinoidal crest this one is a spinoidal crest this one is a spinoidal crest right and then we have six is the nasal crest of palatine bone six is the nasal crest this is the nasal crest of palatine bone six is the nasal crest of palatine bone and seven is the nasal crest of maxilla it is the nasal crest of your maxilla nasal crest of your maxilla right so you can now uh, uh, you can now identify all the structures right so uh, and we have cartilage what cartilage we have septal cartilage and the septal part of alar cartilage which are making it we have a septal cartilage and the septal parts the septal processes of the two alar cartilages right this is the septal cartilage septal cartilage and uh, this one is the septal part of your alar cartilage and you, you have the things that are labeled here this is the crest of the nasal bone uh, first is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone second one is the um, that uh, vomer second one is the vomer so you can just remember the perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone and the vomer these are main things these are main which are forming and uh, rest are just uh, like sideways things and they have, have ma minor contributions in that okay and the crest of nasal bone is there crest of nasal bone is there and uh, your uh, frontal process of your uh, front uh, your nasal process of the frontal bone is that this is the frontal process of the nasal uh, sorry nasal process of the frontal bone this is a nasal process of frontal nasal process of the frontal bone okay and uh, then what we have we have your uh, that crest of spinoid of the crest of spinoid right and uh, maxilla the crest of maxilla and the crest of your palatine bone okay so that completes a uh, bone bone and the this things the bone bony part and the cartilaginous part of this nasal septum and then of the respiratory epithelium is the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium lines it talking about the blood vessels we have our ophthalmic artery branches that are your anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal artery which are uh, going to supply this part which are going to supply this part and then from the uh, spinoid bone from here was the spinoid bone right here was your spinoid bone and all spinoid bone and all so from the spinoid bone we have our spino palatine artery spino palatine artery that is going to here and then we have the septal branch of superior labial artery superior facial artery branch of facial artery is the septal branch of superior labial artery okay and uh, then your greater palatine artery also greater palatine artery which was going like this greater palatine artery was going like this through the incisive fossa this is the incisive fossa that is present okay and this spino palatine artery and the greater palatine artery these are branches these are branches of your third part of maxillary artery remember yes of course these all are separate uh, supplied by external artery that is giving a facial artery as well as your maxillary artery right and here we have this anastomosis of this four points which is called the little seria or a kieselbeck's plexus kieselbeck's plexus where which arteries are going your anterior ethmoidal artery is coming anterior ethmoidal artery the spino palatine your spino palatine artery anterior ethmoidal spino palatine this is not spino palatine this is spino palatine right your anterior ethmoidal spino palatine artery greater uh, greater palatine artery greater palatine artery and the palatine uh, receptal branch of a superior labial artery right this is a kids kissel wax plexus talking about the venous drainage we have the facial vein that is draining from this part facial vein and uh, this part is drained by the spino palatine vein spino palatine vein right uh, which is uh, cut uh, drains in the pterygoid venous plexus and this facial vein drains into internal jugular vein you know this 
talking about the nerve supply what is the nerve supply we have our anterior ethmoidal nerve which is supplying this cartilaginous part anterior ethmoidal nerve okay and we have some olfactory rootlets which are supplying this anterior ethmoidal nerve is a branch of your nasociliary nerve and nasociliary nerve was a branch of your ophthalmic nerve right v1 nerve uh, v1 nerve and this v1 nerve was again a branch of your trigeminal nerve that is fifth nerve then another nasopalatine nerves nasopalatine nerve that is uh, like uh, given up by the pterygopalatine ganglion lymphatic drainage anterior part is drained by submandibular lymph nodes and posterior part by retropharyngeal lymph nodes this uh, of course you can see the submandibular gland will be like more close to this more close to this so it will be draining into anterior part of your nasal septum draining into submandibular lymph node and posterior part the posterior part is uh, drained mainly by the retropharyngeal lymph nodes okay Clinical is the DNS. DNS is the deviated nasal septum. This is due to irregular or prolonged growth of any ethmoid or vomer bones. Uh, in this uh, in this radiograph, you can see the nasal septum is deviated in this in this manner. Deviated in this manner here, you can see, right? And uh, deviated nasal nasal septum. This is septum displacement. It blocks the nasal passage and there's difficulty in breathing. Difficulty in breathing. Cribriform fracture. There's cribriform fracture in tearing of meninges. The CSA will drip. Uh, from the nasal cavity and this will cause a csf rhinorrhea csf rhinorrhea so what happens is that there is uh, your so what happens is that there is the fracture of the cribriform plate this cribriform plate is fractured due to is the meninges will be teared you can see the meninges the meninges are being teared and uh, the csf leaks out through your nose csf will leak out through your nose which is called the csf rhinorrhea csf rhinorrhea understood Let's draw, discuss the lateral wall of the nose. Lateral wall of the nose. So we discuss the nasal septum. Now we'll discuss the lateral wall of the nose. So what are the bones which are forming it? Nasal bone, frontal process of maxilla, lacrimal bone, ethmoid bone, superior middle concave, inferior nasal concave, perpendicular plate of palatine, and medial pterygoid plate. Right? What are the cartilages? Superior nasal, uh, inferior nasal cartilages, and three to four alar cartilage. Let's see how it is formed. You can uh, see in this diagram. In this diagram. This type of diagram is majorly uh, like. Uh, good to note these things and see the things then we'll correlate with this diagram also you can see the diagram which is very simple if i just discuss this diagram you can easily easily you can uh, understand this uh, like a real time section okay so this is the nasal uh, this is your nose and this is we are seeing at the lateral wall of the nose so we have uh, this nasal bone present over here this nasal bone is present right this bone is will be forming the lateral wall and uh, in cartilages we have the inferior and superior nasal cartilages these are inferior and superior nasal cartilages then we have the alar cartilages this, these are your alar cartilages you can uh, very well observe here major alar cartilages the minor alar cartilages alar cartilages are present and the septal cartilage is also present right then what bones we have we have the ethmoid bone superior and middle concave of the ethmoid bone superior and middle concave uh, are the parts of the ethmoid bone so they are considered only one bone and inferior nasal concave is separate so it is another nasal concave okay so if you just calculate the number of bones in uh, that phase so there is a confusion due to which you will say that these three are separate no these both are same okay this and this is a part of your ethmoid bone there is also your uh, la uh, l l what is l l is a lacrimal bone l is a lacrimal bone right and m m is the frontal process of a maxilla this frontal process of maxilla will also be forming the lateral wall of nose and perpendicular plate of palatine and medial plate of pterygoid perpendicular plate of palatine and medial plate of pterygoid so you can easily draw this type of section you can easily draw like this and uh, just make a uh, like frontal process of maxilla then inferior nasal concave can form and you can form this middle uh, superior nasal concave and uh, snc like this mnc like this okay and the lacrimal bone you can easily form like this and medial plate the perpendicular plate of pterygoid and the medial plate of medial plate of pterygoid medial pterygoid plate right this this diagram can easily draw in your exam talking about uh, meters what are the meters that are present over here these are meters are generally openings which are there in the lateral wall of nose so we have first uh, uh, what what meters we have like uh, we have uh, many sinuses okay we have many sinuses that are present so let's let's discuss some things which are there okay there's a parallel sinuses are also have to discuss okay 
okay let's uh, let's start discussing so we have the frontal layer sinus fas uh, which is communicating which is communicating uh, here and is opening here it's opening here in this region we have uh, this uh, that uh, uh, the uh, conche that's a uh, superior nasal conche inferior nasal conche the middle, middle nasal conche right middle nasal conche and the inferior nasal conche you can see here we have the uh, this this parts you can see superior turbinate middle turbinate and inferior turbinate and this turbinates are removed from here turbinates are removed from here so what what uh, observe uh, what you can observe is uh, there's a region called a hiatus semilunaris type like this in this region called a hiatus semilunaris this is a spinoidal recess okay this is a spinoidal recess and that is a spinoidal recess or a spinoidal recess and uh, here we have a hiatus, which is called a hiatus semilunaris and a bulla ethmoidalis. This is a bulla ethmoidalis, which is a projection of a middle ethmoidal air sinus, bulla ethmoidalis, this yellow part, bulla ethmoidalis, and uh, surrounding is, is the hiatus semilunaris, hiatus semilunaris, in which uh, mainly what opens, in which uh, your uh, all three, your ethmoidal air sinuses, uh, which part, which part of ethmoidal air sinus, your uh, first, that is uh, anterior ethmoidal air sinus, anterior ethmoidal air sinus, this opens here, At the anterior ethmoidal air sinus, this opens here, you can see, the air sinuses are uh, arranged in this direction, of posterior, middle and the anterior, this is the posterior, middle and the anterior, so this one is the posterior, this one is the middle and this one is the anterior, right? So, uh, and we have the FAS, FAS is the frontal layer sinus, frontal layer sinus is also uh, like appearing, also uh, we can uh, see the opening of the frontal layer sinus in this uh, part that is your hiatus seminal, uh, that is hiatus right? And uh, we have the maxillary air sinus also which is opening in this part, maxillary air sinus, right? So, FAS, maxillary air sinus and the uh, thing that is your anterior ethmoidal air sinus these three things are opening these three things are opening then in the bulla ethmoidalis we have the middle ethmoidal air sinus middle ethmoidal air sinus which is opening middle ethmoidal air sinus which is opening right and uh, below this inferior concave we have the nasolacrimal duct opening which is an inferior meters and hasnas valve guards it the nasolacrimal duct is guarded by the hasnas valve you have observed you have seen this in your lacrimal apparatus i have also discussed your lacrimal apparatus you can go and check talking about vestibule this is a vestibule of nose and this is a atrium we have a atrium and a vestibule don't call it artery and ventricle okay so atrium and the ventricle a vestibule and uh, this vestibule has some fine nasal hair which is called a vibrissi vibrissi to condition the air and remove the microbes uh, this frontal air sinus, this uh, opening, this duct type of thing that is uh, one in the present, this is called infundibulum. We have a spinoethmoidal recess. This is a spinoethmoidal recess that is above your superior concave. Okay, and uh, this are your spino this, this is a spinoidal air sinus. Spinoidal air sinus is there, and bulla ethmoidalis and the hiatus semilunaris you, you saw. Okay. Let's discuss about the blood supply of the lateral wall of nose. So blood supply is anterior ethmoidal artery, anterior superior quadrant. We have uh, like quadrants like this. This is anterior superior quadrant, anterior superior quadrant, anterior inferior quadrant, and posterior superior quadrant, posterior inferior quadrant. So anterior uh, superior quadrant AEA that is your anterior ethmoidal artery, right? And uh, this uh, posterior inferior uh, posterior superior quadrant is drained by a spinopalatine artery. Spinopalatine artery which is uh, supplying a posterior superior posterior superior quadrant and branches from facial artery facial artery branches and your greater palatine artery these are supplying uh, your anti uh, your anterior inferior okay anterior inferior quadrant and uh, this posterior inferior quadrant is supplied with the greater palatine artery which pierces the plate of the palatine okay talking about venous drainage we have the facial vein draining pterygoid venous plexus and the pharyngeal venous plexus Retrocolumnar vein, what is the columella? This part of the nose is called a columella. We are seeing the nose from the inferior view, you can uh, correlate. This part is called the columella, and uh, uh, it runs down the columella and then goes and joins the venous plexus, the lateral wall of nose, the common site of a venous bleeding. Retrocolumnar vein is the common site of a venous bleeding. Lymphatic drainage, anterior part in submandibular lymph node and posterior by retropharyngeal lymph node. Same thing, same thing. Same thing as the uh, that nasal septum. Talking about the nerve supply, we have this olfactory rootlets again, the anterior ethmoidal nerve again, okay, and posterior superior lateral, uh, posterior superior lateral branch of pterygopalatine ganglion, because it's supplying a posterior superior quadrant, okay, and the nasal branch of your greater palatine nerve, this is uh, supplied on this quadrant, that is the posterior inferior quadrant. 
and this part is applied to the anterior superior alveolar nerve anterior superior alveolar asan asan remember asan yes it is a branch of your infraorbital nerve and this infraorbital nerve is again a branch of your maxillary nerve so you can just uh, see how the trigeminal ganglion and the trigeminal nerve is very important okay most of the teachers don't teach and what you'll understand if you uh, don't uh, know about your trigeminal nerve this maxillary this all nerves okay document clinicals the nasal cavity examination is called the rhinoscopy so anterior rhinoscopy and the posterior rhinoscopy uh, this this is called the anterior rhinoscopy which is visualized which is visualizing the floor middle and the inferior concave all the meters and the nasal septum and the posterior rhinoscopy mirror is there there is a mirror for posterior nasal like rhinoscopy you can visualize the concave coene and the part of the nasal cavity concave coene and the part of the nasal cavity so anterior nasal copy is uh, like in the speculum is inserted inside the nose only posterior rhinoscopy we have the mirror type of thing which is uh, inserted through the mouth okay and uh, reaching the nasophyng spot let's discuss the paranasal air sinuses this is also very very important you have uh, you can get short notes you can get a long question on all this paranasal air sinuses there are four in number and each sinus is a short node each sinus is a short node where the maxillary sinus we have to discuss it in detail the frontal air sinus uh, can be short node this uh, like it's you can't like you can't get a short node on the spinoidal air sinus okay because two three points are there what will write and but you can get a question on your maxillary air sinus this is very important maxillary air sinus or the antrum hymore this is very very important we'll talk about the boundaries artery lymphatic drainage nerve supply and all okay so we'll discuss about the maxillary air sinus let's uh, start get on this air sinuses air sinuses are mucosal diverticulum the main nasal cavity these are mucosal diverticulum that are uh, diverted okay lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium again because this is respiratory epithelium frontal air sinus is not present at birth starts developing at three to four years of age and drains into anterior part of hyter semilunis uh, remember this was draining hyter semilunis was there uh, frontal layer sinus is was draining here okay and the duct is was called the infundibulum and all remember the right frontal layer sinus is uh, bigger than your left frontal layer sinus nerve supplies the supraorbital nerve supraorbital nerve is supplying the air sinuses right frontal layer sinus and frontal sinusitis front, frontal sinusitis is called the office headache because this headache this occurs in office time that is from 9 to 5 okay uh, so it occurs in office time that's why it is called the office headache frontal layer sinus Let's talk about the ethmoidal air sinus now. Air sinuses, these have anterior ethmoidal up to 11 cells are there. Middle ethmoidal, 1 to 3 cells are there. And then a posterior ethmoidal, that is 1 to 7 cells. And uh, this anterior ethmoidal air sinus and middle ethmoidal drained by the anterior ethmoidal nerve. But the posterior ethmoidal air sinus is drained by the posterior ethmoidal nerve, supplied by the posterior ethmoidal nerve. And an anterior uh, ethmoidal air sinus and this middle ethmoidal air sinus is a draining to middle meters and posterior ethmoidal is draining to superior meters. <coughs> we saw this in, in this diagram, in this diagram above, we saw about this in which meters they were draining, right? Your uh, <coughs> middle meters, which uh, superior meters, this posterior air sinus superior meters, okay? And this middle and anterior air sinus are draining to the middle meters, middle meters, right? After that, uh, we are going uh, going forward and uh, talking about the spinoidal layer sinus. It is draining to a spinoethmoidal recess. Spinoethmoidal recess. Remember, we talked about spinoethmoidal recess, which is present between the superior layer sinus and between uh, that uh, just above the superior layer sinus, the superior concave. Okay, so called the spinoethmoidal recess are there, and posterior ethmoidal nerve supplies the spinoethmoidal sinus, uh, the spinoid, spin, uh, spinoidal layer sinus. Talking about the maxillary air sinus, the largest sinus drains into the posterior part of hyter semilunaris. Drains into the posterior part of hyter semilunaris. We talked about this also. Also called the antrum of hymore. So it developed, that is the first paranasal air sinus to develop. It appears in the fourth month of intrauterine life, rudimentary at birth, rapidly grows at the age of 6 to 7 years, and fully developed with eruption of permanent teeth at puberty. Right? And measurement vertically, it is 3.5 uh, cm. Transversely 2.5 cm, vertically 3.5, okay, vertically 3.5, transversely 2.5, and anterior posteriorly, this is 3.5 cm. Again, shape is pyramidal shape, that's why we have vert vertical transverse and the anterior posterior uh, axis. And then the base, base is formed by the lateral wall of nose, lateral wall of nose is forming the base, you can see here, lateral wall of nose is forming the base, and the apex is the gigomatic bone, these are the gigomatic bones forming the apex, right? 
and uh, talking about the boundaries what are the boundaries of this so here we have here we have the orbits and the nose that the lateral wall of nose this this is this is formed by a lateral wall of nose the base and the apex this apex is formed by the zygomatic bone zygomatic bone right here you have the cheekbone that is zygomatic bone so making the apex and floor is the alveolar process of maxilla the alveolar process of maxilla is forming the floor of this uh, especially the upper molars and the premolars are forming the floor you can see this alveolar process of maxilla that is upper molar and premolars roof is from the roof of the orbit you can see easily the roof of the orbits are forming the roof uh, base is the lateral wall of nose apex is the zygomatic process of maxilla anterior wall is the maxilla anterior wall is the maxilla you can see anterior wall is the maxilla it, there must be the maxilla that would be covering here like that okay and uh, if you remove the maxilla you will uh, see this uh, maxillary air sinuses and posterior wall is again the maxilla okay again the maxilla and pierced by posterior superior alveolar nerve and artery artery which arteries are supplying it posterior superior alveolar artery middle superior alveolar artery anterior superior alveolar artery okay this all this is psan the artery in the nerve this is asan the artery in the nerve and uh, this one and this is msan so the this one this is the middle superior alveolar artery middle and uh, this one is the uh, anterior superior alveolar artery artery and anterior superior alveolar nerve not artery artery is your uh, uh, infraorbital artery that is uh, sorry your nerve is the infraorbital nerve then the artery is uh, is the anterior superior alveolar artery right lymphatic drain is submandibular lymph nodes and nerve supply is the posterior superior alveolar nerve and middle superior alveolar nerve and anterior superior alveolar nerve same as the arteries arteries and the nerves they are same only this posterior superior alveolar artery is the branch of maxillary artery middle superior and anterior superior branches of, of your in, infraorbital artery and uh, this uh, nerve supply posterior superior alveolar nerve is the branch of maxillary nerve while the middle superior and anterior superior are branches of your infraorbital nerve maxillary hiatus is reduced in size why the maxillary hiatus is reduced due to the uncinate process of the ethmoid uncinate process of the ethmoid from above descending process of lacrimal bone from front descending process of lacrimal bone from the front ethmoidal process of inferior nasal concave from below ethmoidal process of inferior nasal concave and perpendicular plate of uh, palatine bone from behind just have to remember this all these are not much important talking about the clinicals what are the clinicals that are associated so most susceptible to sinusitis it is most susceptible to sinusitis acts as a secondary reservoir of pus that is maxillary sinus is drained out by um, like uh, it is the most dependent sinus it, it is present in a disadvantageous position so generally that is uh, pus accumulation occurs here so maxillary sinus is drained out by the anteral puncture which is called the anthrostomy anthrostomy is the anteral puncture and caldwell look surgery caldwell look surgery you can see this called caldwell look surgery this is uh, done to drain the maxillary sinus right so that uh, completes the nasal cavity let's move on to the next part let's talk about the orbit the orbital walls medial wall is the thinnest wall of the orbit you can uh, see the first this is a medial wall which is the thinnest wall middle wall is formed by the frontal process of maxilla this is the frontal process of maxilla which is forming the middle wall and uh, second one is the lacrimal bone lacrimal bone is forming orbital plate of ethmoid is forming the third one is the orbital plate of ethmoid and fourth one is the body of the spinoid the body of the spinoid so these are forming a medial walls these are forming a medial walls of the orbit and features we have a lacrimal fossa and anterior and uh, posterior ethmoidal foramina right you have a lacrimal fossa present and anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina lateral wall is the strongest wall of the orbit the strongest wall is the lateral wall this wall uh, it is formed by the orbital process of zygomatic bones formed by the orbital process of the zygomatic bone zygomatic bone orbital process there and the orbital surface of greater wing of spinoid second one is the orbital process orbital surface of the greater wing of spinoid the body of spinoid was forming the medial wall body of spinoid the body of spinoid and the orbital process uh, of the, uh, orbital surface of the greater wing of spinoid is forming your lateral wall right and uh, what are the features of lateral wall we have a whitnall's tubercle here the projection is there it's called the whitnall's tubercle and a zygomatic foramen a zygomatic foramen so the floor of the orbit uh, is made up of orbital surface of the maxilla that is this part orbital surface of maxilla then uh, your uh, orbital surface of the zygomatic bone this one is zygomatic bone orbital surface and the orbital process of palatine bone this is the orbital process of palatine bone so these three things are making exactly the floor of your orbit talking about the roof roof is made by this one that is the orbital plate of frontal bone orbital plate of frontal bone and lesser wing of spinoid this this one is the lesser wing of spinoid lesser wing of spinoid orbital plate of frontal bone and the lesser wing of spinoid what are the features of, <coughs> of the roof so first we have this uh, that is called your trochlear notch okay 
and uh, a, a part that is a fossa for lacrimal gland the fossa for the lacrimal gland we have discussed the lacrimal gland just uh, you can see and uh, there is a, a tunnel type thing here which is called the optic canal talking about the orbital margins uh, so we have many margins like a supra orbital margin this is a supra orbital margin right uh, which, which is made up of the frontal bone supra orbital margin formed by the frontal bone lateral orbital margin this is the lateral orbital margin that is formed by zygomatic bone plus the frontal bone that is frontal process of zygomatic bone and zygomatic process of frontal bone right and me medial orbital margin this one is formed by you can identify these three bones two bones right the frontal bone plus his maxilla your frontal bone plus your maxilla <coughs> and this infraorbital margin it is made up of by this one infraorbital margin made up of by maxillary bone and your zygomatic bone maxillary and zygomatic so uh, here inside you have a optic canal i told the optic canal is a feature of your uh, that uh, roof right optic canal then we have your superior orbital fissure this is a superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure optic canal superior orbital fissure and your inferior orbital fissure there is a tendinous ring of gin which is surrounding the optic canal optic canal has two contents optic canal has optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery optic nerve and ophthalmic artery right and uh, here is our superior inferior orbital uh, that part okay so superior orbital fissure let's talk about the superior orbital fissure then we will go to the inferior orbital fissure right so this part is a superior orbital fissure it has a lacrimal nerve you can uh, just like uh, remember lft lft is a liver function test right lacrimal nerve frontal nerve and the trochlear nerve we have three nerves here and we have sov that is a superior ophthalmic vein also which is a content then of the oculomotor nerve oculomotor nerve that is uh, a superior division of oculomotor nerve and the inferior division a superior division of in oculomotor and inferior division and then the nasociliary nerve is there nasociliary nerve is there and then your abducens nerve is also there your abducens nerve this one is also there so these are the contents of your superior orbital fissure contents of inferior orbital fissure are the branch of inferior ophthalmic vein iov superior ophthalmic vein and superior orbital fissure inferior ophthalmic vein is in inferior orbital fissure and this infraorbital nerve infraorbital nerve is there then zygomatic infraorbital artery vein and nerve okay and your zygomatic nerve understood so you can just remember this lft lft and you can remember 36n 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 means 3 means your oculomotor nerve that is superior inferior division 6 is the abduction nerve right and n uh, stands for nasociliary nerve and you can easily remember this uh, contents of your inferior orbital fissure let's discuss about the contents of the orbit now discussing on the contents of the orbit we have our eyeball fascia extraocular muscles nerves vessels lacrimal gland and orbital fat talking about the fascia the dura mater of middle cranial fossa it uh, comes in optic canal divides into outer layer and your inner layer outer layer forms the periosteum of orbit which is called the periorbita inner layer forms the dural sheath for optic nerve which is called the fascia bulbi periorbita and fascia bulbi this outer layer is the periorbita inner layer is the fascia bulbi and this is your uh, the continuation of this dura mater of this middle cranial fossa right so you can see here periorbita this is periorbita this spot periorbita okay this is the um, that uh, layer middle cranial fossa dura mater is there this is also periorbita this green green uh, type part okay and uh, the there is a sheath around the optic uh, this is all the optic sheath the optic nerve is lying inside the optic sheath we have uh, um, that uh, fascia bulbi also okay so periorbita posteriorly continues with dura mater in the sheath of the optic nerve anteriorly lines the orbital margin and projects into eyelid as orbital septum this periorbita is projecting into the eyelid as orbital septum this is the orbital septum which is there uh, sorry this is this was the periorbita right yes this was the periorbita so it was projecting into this and forming an orbital septum also forms the lacrimal fascia if it's visible uh lacrimal fascia no it's not visible okay no problem and contributes to the fibrous pulley for superior oblique muscle so superior oblique muscles these have a fibrous pulley inferior oblique and superior oblique so fibrous pulley for superior oblique muscle is also formed by your also formed by your periorbita right talking about the bulbar fascia or the tenon's capsule this is your tenon's capsule the green shaded part these are all your tenon's capsule like this is going like this and this 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 one it's called a tenon's capsule tenon's capsule also called the bulbar fascia bulbar fascia bulbar fascia 
बल्वर फेशिया विथ ऑयल फेशिया बल्बाई दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल द बल्वर फेशिया और फेशिया बल्बाई और योर टेनस कैप्सूल यू कैन ऑल्सो राइट इफ यू आर गेटिंग कन्फ्यूज दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल द फेशिया बल्बाई द सेम थिंग इज दैट द सेम थिंग ओके सो वट इज दिस दिस इज द बल्वर फेशिया इट इज फॉर्मिंग ए शीट अराउंड योर ऑप्टिक नर्व दिस इज फॉर्मिंग ए शीट अराउंड योर ऑप्टिक नर्व सो इट फॉर्म्स मेम्रेन शीत अराउंड द आई बॉल ऑल्सो फॉर्म्स ए मेम्रेन शीत अराउंड द आई बॉल and uh, separates the eyeball from orbital fat it separates the eyeball from the orbital fat this is the orbital fat part it separate separating the eyeball from your orbital fat right and uh, extend is the optic nerve to sclerocorneal junction extend is from optic nerve optic nerve to the sclerocorneal junction this is sclerocorneal junction up to which it is extending and what are the modifications so modifications we have the lateral check ligament the medial check ligament and the suspensile ligament of lockwood okay like a lateral lectus is there medial lectus muscle is there this is the eyeball and this is the orbit so we have what you have we have the posterior lacrimal crest to the posterior lacrimal crest your medial check ligament is being attached which forms a sheath around the medial rectus muscle and uh, to the whitnall tubercle remember we have we had a whitnall tubercle right in the orbit uh, where 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 is it yes 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 lateral wall in the lateral wall we have the whitnall tubercle thus the whitnall tubercle and the zygomatic foramen uh, zygomatic foramen we had so in the whitnall tubercle in the whitnall tubercle this is uh, okay the whitnall tubercle is giving attachment to a lateral check ligament lateral check ligament which is forming a sheath around the lateral rectus and this lateral check ligament medial uh, mid, that uh, um, the ligaments that is connecting the lateral check and medial check ligaments is the suspensile ligament of lockwood Uh, which encompasses the inferior rectus and inferior oblique muscle let's talk about the extraocular muscles this extraocular muscles is a important long question uh, for university exams so it is present outside the eyeball so if we uh, talk we have the voluntary muscles and the involuntary muscles voluntary muscles are superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus and lateral rectus involuntary muscle and then other voluntary muscles are superior oblique inferior oblique and seventh one is the levator palpebris superioris remember we were writing our lps lps everywhere this was the levator palpebris superioris and involuntary muscles we have the superior tarsal muscle which is called the muller's muscle muller's muscle the inferior tarsal and orbitalis superior tarsal inferior tarsal and orbitalis let's talk about the rectus muscles so we have the superior rectus muscle here you have the mid middle rect medial rectus muscle here lateral rectus here inferior rectus here and the superior oblique superior oblique is going posterior and medially posterior medially and uh, your uh, that uh, in, inferior oblique inferior oblique was also there like going like this we'll uh, see this structure this structure is a bit like uh, realistic but we'll see the uh, how it is arranged in a schematic diagram and all these muscles the superior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus inferior rectus they have a common origin that is a common tendinous ring common tendinous ring they originate from the common tendinous ring you can here appreciate a superior oblique here you can appreciate a superior oblique that is going uh, like that and the inferior oblique is like this inferior oblique is like this okay let's talk about the <coughs> extraocular muscles so levator palpebral superioris superior oblique inferior oblique superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus and lateral rectus so we have all this um, uh, the origin insertion innervation okay and the main action and all clinical testing also how can you test this okay <clears throat> so just first uh, understand how the muscles are oriented in the space so we have this orbit here uh, sorry we have the eyeball here and uh, your superior oblique is like connecting like this it has a pulley this pulley is formed by dash i told this this pulley is formed by periorbita superior rectus is this lateral rectus is this one medial rectus is this one inferior rectus is this one because i have taken a section so the muscles uh, this muscles must be extending back right lateral rectus superior rectus and this all but if you draw the section you, you can just show the muscles like this okay this is inferior oblique this is the superior oblique what are the actions of the muscles uh, so which muscles are doing what action so first of all we have the superior rectus superior rectus is uh, it, it, its action is like this it, its action is like this okay so what is it doing it is doing the intorsion if if you just can calculate the resultant it is doing the intorsion of the orbit intorsion of the orbit. intorsion means the clockwise rotation right intorsion means clockwise rotation and medial rectus is like pulling the orbit towards this pulling the sorry not the orbit your eye ball right this is your eye and uh, the eye is the medial deviation of eye ball the medial deviation of eye ball is done by medial rectus the lateral deviation of eye ball is done by your lateral rectus obviously okay and uh, 
then what happens your inferior rectus inferior rectus the mode of action is this and this inferior rectus so what is it doing inferior rectus is basically causing the extorsion of the eyeball extorsion that is which rotation that is your uh, in anti clockwise rotation like and superior oblique is also working in the same manner superior oblique superior oblique is doing intorsion but superior oblique is doing intorsion like this so what what muscles are doing what uh, so intorsion is done by superior oblique superior rectus extorsion by inferior oblique inferior rectus right and uh, the medial rectus is doing medial deviation lateral rectus is doing lateral deviation very easy yes let's talk about all the muscles so the levator palpebrae superior is it originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid lesser wing of the sphenoid inserts into the superior tarsus and the skin of the superior eyelid so it is basically having a skinny attachment the skin of the upper eyelid it is attached to this supplied by your oculomotor nerve that is your third nerve third nerve supplies it main action it elevates the upper eyelid right uh, you have to open the eye right it elevates to open um, superior eyelid elevates the superior eyelid it doesn't move the eyeball it does not move the eyeball very important point and clinical testing you can uh, close the eye can open okay if the closed eye can open if the closed eye can open then your levator palpebrae superior is correct right let's discuss the superior oblique superior oblique uh, originates from the body of the sphenoid levator palpebrae is uh, lesser wing of sphenoid and the superior oblique is from body of the sphenoid tendon passes through the trochlea uh, trochlea on the superior medial orbital surface superior medial orbital surface right uh, we talked about this the tendon passes in superior medio, uh, medial orbital surface and inserts into the superior sclera deep to superior rectus muscle and um, <clears throat> that is uh, supplied by you have to just uh, remember you have to just remember so4 and lr6 so4 and lr6 rest all the supplied by your uh, that uh, muscle uh, which now uh, so just just pay attention here so4 lr6 so your superior oblique is being supplied by your trochlear nerve and your lateral rectus and your lateral rectus is being supplied by the abducens nerve rest all rest all are supplied by the oculomotor nerve that is third nerve three rest all are supplied by the oculomotor nerve understood these all are exceptions so4 lr6 <coughs> sorry okay so trochlear nerve uh, superior oblique supplied by the trochlear nerve uh, that is your fourth nerve okay and what it does it abducts lateral and uh, depresses and medially rotates the eyeball abducts abducts even lateral depresses and medially rotates the eyeball you can just see uh, the action superior oblique it it will do abduction it will do abduction the taking of the eyeball like this it will do depression also abduction depression and medial rotation this this intorsion this intorsion is also called as a medial rotation okay just pay attention here also called as a medial rotation so it is also causing the medial rotation of the eyeball medial rotation of the eyeball and uh, clinical testing the eye will look laterally and downward laterally and downward if the patient can do lateral and downward movement of eye then he and its uh, superior oblique is fine inferior oblique uh, third nerve supplied by the oculomotor nerve anterior part of orbital floor uh, originates to the anterior part of your orbital floor Okay, and lateral sclera deep to lateral rectus muscle inserts in lateral sclera deep to a lateral rectus muscle easy point deep to the lateral rectus muscle uh, it is inserting in the lateral sclera right inferior oblique is this and deep to the lateral rectus obviously it is deep to the lateral rectus origin insertion you can just uh, uh, like easily write and uh, just uh, pay attention that these all muscles the superior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus and inferior rectus this have a common origin that is a common tendinous ring okay and uh, what is the function of inferior oblique it abducts abducts elevates and laterally rotate abduct elevate and laterally rotate you can easily note that uh, it is ab abducting of course same action and elevating elevating and laterally rotating laterally rotating this extorsion extorsion is called as a lateral rotation right lateral rotation lateral rotation so if you just understood this let's move ahead and uh, talk about your superior uh, inferior oblique is done i looks laterally and upwards i look laterally and upwards let's discuss the superior rectus superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus originates in the common tendinous ring superior rectus uh, inserts into superior sclera just posterior to sclerocorneal junction 
इन्फिडक्टस इन्फिरियर स्क्लेर जस्ट पोस्टियर टू स्क्लेरोकॉर्नियल जंक्शन सो एवरेज डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम द लिम्बस दैट इज स्क्लेरोकॉर्नियल जंक्शन एवरेज डिस्टेंस मिडिल डक्टस इज फाइव एम एम इन्फिरियर डक्टस सिक्स एम एम लेटरल डक्टस सेवन एम एम सुपीरियर डक्टस एट एम एम ओके दिज आर द एवरेज डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम द लिम्बस फ्रॉम द स्क्लेरोकॉर्नियल जंक्शन एट विच दिस मसल्स आर अटैच्ड राइट दिस हैव टू बी रिमेंबर्ड सो दिस मीडियल डक्टस फर्स्ट देन इन्फिरियर डक्टस लैटर डक्टस एंड योर सुपीरियर डक्टस ओके एंड यू नो द एक्शंस यू नो द एक्शंस फ्रॉम दिस फ्रॉम दिस डायग्राम यू नो द एक्शन सो आई नीड नॉट जस्ट एंड लैटर डक्टस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एबड्यूशंस नाउ एबड्यूशंस नाउ इज सप्लाइंग इट so here you can see the statement been written okay these are the actions of the individual muscles you can take a screenshot if you want this part done okay let's talk about the ophthalmic artery which is not uh, important for exam but let's discuss this so internal carotid artery ophthalmic artery goes by the optic canal and crosses optic nerve lateral to the medial side from lateral to medial side crosses the optic nerve from lateral to medial side what are the branches we have the central artery of retina lacrimal artery lacrimal artery has even five branches a glandular branch to lacrimal gland to lateral palpebral artery zygomatic temporal zygomatic facial artery um, and uh, recurrent meningeal artery and your muscular branches the near posterior ciliary arteries the supra orbital arteries there posterior ethmoidal anterior ethmoidal dorsal nasal supra supra trochlear and the medial palpebral branches these are all your branches of your nine branches of your ophthalmic artery talking about the ophthalmic vein this is ophthalmic artery you can see this is ophthalmic artery you can see here okay ophthalmic artery that is going it's so ophthalmic artery and uh, it is crossing crossing the nerve from the lateral to the medial side crosses the optic nerve from lateral to medial side like this okay after that uh, ophthalmic vein let's discuss the ophthalmic vein uh, so what is the course of ophthalmic vein is that uh, we have first your angular vein angular vein is there angular vein and uh, superior ophthalmic vein which is draining to cavernous sinus angular vein is coming and uh, here your inferior ophthalmic vein is there so superior ophthalmic vein inferior ophthalmic vein these are forming a venous uh, type uh, a sheath or a plane venous plane uh, in your eyeball and supplying the eyeball also so superior ophthalmic inferior ophthalmic veins these are draining into your cavernous sinus uh, continuing the angular vein then of the <coughs> facial vein that is coming here facial vein maxillary sinus is there facial vein is coming like this and uh, your deep facial vein facial vein is coming and continues the deep facial vein into pterygoid venous plexus is present here and uh, here, here we have the inferior orbital fissure through which this part is going this draining into the cavernous sinus so this is the course you can draw the easily the course okay this course is easy then let's talk about the muscles of eye that is orbicularis oculi muscles so we have lateral and medial uh, branches the lateral palpebral raphe is there here is the lateral palpebral raphe here is the medial palpebral uh, ligament okay this is lateral palpebral raphe is attached to the whitnall's tubercle and medial palpebral ligament is attached medially more medially so you have a superior tarsus and a inferior tarsus superior tarsus and a inferior tarsus uh, so basically what is tarsus tarsus is the fibrous connective tissue which gives skeletal framework to the eyelids okay and uh, talking about this we have uh, um, lateral palpebral raphe here lateral palpebral raphe here and the medial palpebral raphe here so of the palpe uh, of the muscle we have the muscle that is orbicularis uh, oculi we have many part like a palpebral part your lacrimal part and your orbital part okay <clears throat> orbital part palpebral part and lacrimal part so these three parts are there so what happens is that this is a superior eyelid this is a inferior and that uh, this is your uh, superior tarsus this is your inferior tarsus so there is a uh, part that is running inside the tarsus that are called is a lacrimal part lacrimal part because it is related to a lacrimal gland present over here this orange gland is a lacrimal gland as a sac of the lacrimal gland and uh, surrounding it surrounding the whole is the palpebral part it is the palpebral part and the orbital part is just surrounding the whole eyelid like this on the whole eye like this okay <clears throat> so the muscle is orbicularis oculi orbital part palpebral part and lacrimal part originates orbital part originates from medial part of medial palpebral ligament it originates from the medial part you can see orbital part this originates from the medial part of a medial palpebral ligament inserts making a concentric ring and inserts into same palpebral ligament only 
makes a ring and inserts into same palpebral ligaments so origin insertion the both are same action is a tight closer of eyelid tight closer just no tight closer and if you want to just close the eyelid if you just was um, that uh, gentle closer gentle closer uh, we have a palpebral part for that if you just do tight closer then uh, this orbital part is used talking about the palpebral part it's a, uh, originates from the lateral part of medial palpebral ligament it originates from the lateral part of medial palpebral ligament so this medial palpebral ligament and lateral part of medial palpebral ligament is giving origin is giving origin to this palpebral part you can see this is giving origin to a palpebral part this blue one and uh, inserts into lateral palpebral raphe lateral palpebral raphe is uh, like this one you can say okay inserting into it and uh, it is doing gentle closure of eyelid gentle closure of eyelid and talking about the lacrimal part lacrimal part uh, here is a lacrimal part here is a lacrimal part and this lacrimal part is originating from the lacrimal fascia and the lacrimal crest lacrimal fascia and lacrimal crest okay and inserting into the lateral palpebral raphe again it is doing the dilation of the lacrimal sac dilation of the lacrimal sac done so this completes the orbit and orbicularis oculi let's move on to the next part Let's now discuss the oculomotor nerve in um, quickly. So we have this midbrain, we have the section of this midbrain, and uh, there is the interpeduncular fossa here. This interpeduncular fossa here, and uh, here we have uh, your two nuclei. Here you have the two nuclei, that the nuclei for your third nerve, and uh, lateral to this we have the edinger westphal nuclei. So this from this two nuclei, uh, from one of the nuclei, your of uh, your oculomotor nerve will arise uh, part. Okay, and from this your uh, thin part of this oculomotor nerve will arise. Okay, and after that it passes like this, and uh, just above it we have a posterior cerebral artery, and the superior cerebral artery is just uh, present in this region. It is passing by uh, piercing a cavernous sinus, is piercing the cavernous sinus and going, and it's dividing into upper division and a lower division, right? Upper division and lower division. This upper division will come like this, supply your levator palpebral superioris and your superior rectus. In the lower division will supply your medial rectus or inferior rectus, inferior oblique, right? So, oculomotor nerve is supplying your uh, LPS, SR, MR, IR, and IO. And uh, we know the L SO4, SO4 uh, and LR6, that is superior oblique, is not supplied by this, it is supplied by your SO4, trochlear nerve. And uh, we have the LR6, that is lateral rectus, supplied by your uh, sixth nerve, abducens nerve. Then it goes uh, inferior oblique and inferior, uh, inferior rectus and inferior oblique, and then it goes here and forms and uh, like release into this and uh, gives you uh, supply to uh, sphincter pupil and your ciliaris muscle also sphincter pupil and the ciliaris muscle these are called as short ciliary nerves which are giving so what is the course it starts from the midbrain and goes by the interpeduncular fossa forward and lateral between posterior cerebral and superior cerebral arteries goes by the tentorial notch reaches the middle cranial fossa uh, is seen in the content of your oculomotor triangle enters lateral wall of cavernous sinus divides into upper lower division superior orbital fissure goes by the superior orbital fissure remember oculomotor nerve was a part of the superior orbital fissure only which is enclosed by the tendinous ring of gene remember the 36n mnemonic right 36n yes then it uh, divides the upper division the lower division the upper division is supplying a sp uh, sr and your lps and lower division is supplying your mr ir and io and this nerve to IO gives a motor root, it goes to the ciliary ganglion, okay, it, uh, it, it is going here, the motor root is going here to the ciliary ganglion, so th thick one is the sensory root, uh, red one is the motor root, thin one, okay, ciliary ganglion, from here arise short ciliary nerves, the short ciliary nerves are supplying a sphincter pupillae and your ciliaris muscle, okay. Damage to oculomotor nerve, that is the third nerve palsy, will cause stosis of the eyelids due to LPS paralysis, lateral strabismus due to unopposed action of lateral rectus. This lateral rectus is uh, like medial rectus was being supplied by this oculomotor nerve, so it will be paralyzed. So the medial uh, deviation of eye won't occur. So there will be unopposed action of this lateral rectus muscle. So there will be lateral strabismus and dilated and fixed pupil due to paralysis of your sphincter pupillae and unopposed action of dilated pupillae dilated and fixed pupil loss of accommodation reflex diplopia that is double vision proptosis that is protrusion of eyeball that completes the oculomotor nerve let's move on to the next part let's discuss about the trochlear nerve that is cranial nerve 4 cranial nerve 4 is the trochlear nerve and it enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure enters the orbit so superior, superior orbital fissure right superior orbital fissure then innervates the superior oblique muscle of the eye so4 you know so4 right 
and uh, it is the only crossed cranial nerve it's only cranial nerve that emerges dorsally from the brain stem it has the longest intracranial course which nerve has the longest intracranial course your fourth nerve that's the trochlear nerve so here we have the midbrain sections you have the midbrain sections the nucleus for the fourth nerves are there at the level of superior colliculi you must have uh, heard about the midbrain sections right you must have heard about the midbrain sections uh, we'll, we'll discuss about the uh, sections like if you take a midbrain section at the level of inferior colliculus at the level of inferior colliculus we'll see the presence of inferior colliculus here and uh, at this part at this part you will see your aqueduct aqueduct of iter okay aqueduct of iter okay and uh, here will be some nucleus that is mesencephalic nucleus mesencephalic nucleus mcn mesencephalic nucleus and uh, then then what will have then you will have your here here will there be nucleus for fourth nerve fourth nerve nucleus fourth nerve nucleus and the fourth nerve nucleus will go like this it will go like this decussated okay it has a decussated path and uh, other things which you will see will uh, also see your lateral lemniscus your spinal lemniscus your um, that trigeminal lemniscus your medial lemniscus and again here in this lateral lemniscus okay your spinal lemniscus your trigeminal lemniscus your medial lemniscus okay and here we will uh, see your pyramidal tract being formed pyramidal tract is present and here we will see frontopontine fibers frontopontine fibers parietopontine occipitopontine temporopontine Pontine, occipitopontine, temporopontine fibers. Okay, this fibers you will see. Then afterwards, you will see your uh, tectospinal tract being formed here. This is your tectospinal tract, and you will see your retrospinal tract being formed. Retrospinal tract. Okay, so these are all your uh, sections at the at, at level of at the level of your inferior colliculus. Inferior colliculus. So we are basically discussing this part where the fourth nerve nucleus is emerging out. Okay. So this is this is a part of your core neuroanatomy. It is a part of your core neuroanatomy. We will discuss in it. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, just see that what I told. Just fourth nerve nucleus. It is giving origin to this, and it is coming like this and down like this, and it's passing by the cavernous sinus. It is going through superior orbital fissure and supplying the superior oblique muscle. A very simple course. Lowest motor, lower uh, lower motor neuron decussates within the brainstem. Lower motor neuron decussates within the brainstem. So you can see the lower motor neuron is decussating within the brainstem only. Okay, and uh, talking about this, we have uh, most slender nerve. It is the most thinnest nerve or slender nerve. What is the course? Arises from midbrain, dorsal aspect of midbrain, winds around the cerebral peduncle and your superior cerebral peduncle, and passes between posterior cerebral and superior cerebral arteries. Okay. Posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebral artery passing between them, and by the lateral wall of a cavernous sinus, okay, by the lateral wall of a cavernous sinus, it reaches superior orbital fissure and it is seen medially above your LPS, that is, uh, it is seen medially above your levator palpebrae superioris and supplies your superior oblique muscle. What is the clinical your trochlear nerve design? Trochlear nerve design it, re, it uh, causes your eye deviation upwards, that is, paralysis of SO muscle. Patient tries to tilt the head to compensate for extorsion. So, pa patient will try to compensate. Compensatory head tilting will be seen uh, as a clinical feature of your trochlear nerve lesion. And eye deviates upward. This you can see the eye is deviating upward, and uh, this is a patient of your right, right side, tro right trochlear nerve lesion. Okay. So that completes uh, your uh, trochlear nerve. Let's move on to the next part quickly. Let's now discuss about the abducens nerve. So we have the abducens nerve here arising from the pons. Nucleus of abducens nerve is present in the pons, and it uh, goes like this. In, uh, a canal is there. Well, petrous part of temporal bone, the edge. We have a canal that is a dorelos canal. It's a fibrosis canal, and uh, the nerve goes by this, reaches, uh, pierces the cavernous sinus as usual, and then goes by this uh, that. Uh, part that is uh, your superior okay and then reaches the orbit reaches the orbit and supplies the lateral rectus so lr lr6 remember so we have the lr6 afterwards uh, we'll we'll discuss how the it, it has the lo longest intradural course longest intradural course is most commonly injured in increased cranial pressure it's most commonly injured nerve in increased cranial pressure there's increased cranial pressure course uh, lower border of pons it starts from the lower border of pons over the sharp ridge of petrous temporal bone it uh, goes by the under petroclinoid ligament and enters the fibrosis canal that is a dorelos canal runs through the cavernous sinus reaches the superior orbital fissure supplies the lateral lectus easy course increased cranial pressure the nerve is stressed due to descents of the brain stem the nerve is stressed and the nerve is cut by the sharp end of this petrous temporal bone in the do dorelos canal wherever it is uh, going this is cut by this sharp edge this is cut by the sharp edge 
and uh, due to this uh, the nerve is injured there will be lateral lactose paralysis what happens what will happen in lateral lactose paralysis obviously there will be no lateral deviation the i will deviate medially there will be unopposed action of this medial lector so we have the convergent squint convergent squint and we will also have your diplopia okay so that completes the abductions now let's move on to the next part let's discuss about some vertebrae okay so, so we have basically left with the miniature parts so just bear with me and we'll finish this chapter up uh, quickly so cervical vertebrae we have uh, the cervical vertebrae okay uh, c1 is called the atlas c2 is called the axis c3 to c6 is the typical cervical vertebrae okay typical cervical vertebrae and uh, c7 is the vertebral prominence vertebral prominence so what features we have in your cervical vertebrae if i have uh, just okay just we'll discuss here so uh, if you just see a structure of a cervical vertebrae so you will have a anterior tubercle here you will have anterior tubercle anterior tubercle of six cervical vertebrae is called the carotid tubercle just present against the common carotid artery right and we have a body of the vertebrae that is transverse diameter is more than the anterior posterior diameter transverse diameter is more than the anterior posterior diameter then we have the posterior tubercle posterior tubercle we have a costo transverse bar which is connecting the anterior tubercle and the po posterior tubercle okay and uh, then we have a foramen transverse area present over here this is a foramen transverse you know foramen transverse area okay which transmits the uh, second part of vertebral artery transmits the second part of the vertebral artery so uh, we have a posterior in this uh, in this anterior root anterior tubercle anterior root basically is this part this part is called the anterior root okay if if, if you need you can write here this part is called the anterior root anterior root okay and have posterior root present over in, in this part also okay so this part is called the posterior root this part is posterior root so basically what we have uh, done we have the costal elements so what are the costal elements of so the anterior root post anterior tubercle costal transverse bar and the posterior tubercle and the posterior root is not included in this costal element so these are your costal elements right then we have the superior articular fascia superior articular fascia present here and here then we have the vertebral foramina the vertebral foramen that's large and triangular and a bifid spinous process bifid spinous process is seen in your cervical vertebrae okay and uh, that completes your uh, that cervical vertebrae typical cervical vertebrae so between the superior articular fascia of one and the anterior uh, inferior articular surface of other surface of other we have a gigapophyseal joint gigapophyseal joint is a plain sinoval joint plain sinoval joint understood plain sinoval joint Talking about the atlas vertebrae, atlas vertebrae has some modifications. This this was a typical vertebrae, this is a typical cervical vertebrae. But atlas has a modification, axis has modifications, and this vertebral uh, prominence, this also has modifications. So atlas vertebrae has no body, okay, the main part, the body part is even absent. This body part is absent, okay, in the atlas vertebrae. Atlas is basically was a Greek uh, god who supported his uh, supported the whole world on his shoulders. Okay, at the same point uh, the Atlas vertebrae is present, so we named this vertebrae as Atlas vertebrae. Okay, there is no bifid spinous process. There is no bifid spinous process like this. Okay, the this part is absent, the body is absent, no bifid spinous process is present. Okay, we have the same anterior tubercle, the superior tubercle, uh, posterior tubercle, anterior arch is present. There is an anterior arch. Okay. And the superior at uh, atlas fascia of atlas is forming an atlanto occipital joint. Atlanto occipital joint. Atlanto occipital joint is the yes joint. At this atlanto occipital joint, this we told it. It's called as a yes joint. Yes joint. Yes joint. It helps you to say yes. Okay. It helps to nod your head or the nodding joint. And the foramen trans uh, uh, transverse sinus is present. So the vertebral artery third part will uh, go on like this, and uh, your C1 nerve also C1 nerve along with it. Understood, and we have the posterior arch and the anterior arch. Posterior arch and the anterior arch. And here, uh, that uh, here there is a ligament is a transverse ligament. The transverse ligament, and uh, this transverse ligament will have a formation of a canal type of structure. In which the dense dense of the axis vertebrae will uh, attach. Okay, will uh, just go into it. Axis vertebrae, axis vertebrae. It has an odontoid process that is called the dense dense. This is called the dense D E N S. Okay. And uh, here in axis vertebrae, we have a bifid spinous process present, but foramen transverse system is inconspicuous or absent. It is inconspicuous or absent, okay? And atlanto axial joint, we are talking about this atlanto axial joint, which is formed by the this is the dense, this is the dense part, this is the uh, let me mark, yes, this is the Yes, this is the dense part of your axis vertebrae and uh, this dense is going into the odontoid canal odontoid fossa you can say okay um, by which it is going and atlanto axial joint one medial atlanto axial joint are there and two lateral atlanto axial joints are formed 
ओके इज द ट्रांसफर्स लिगामेंट ऑफ एटलस विच इज हेल्पिंग टू फॉर्म द जॉइंट सो बेसिकली वी हैव द एंटीरियर आर्टिकुलेशन ओके एंड द ट्रांसफर्स लिगामेंट द पोस्टीरियर आर्टिकुलेशन पोस्टर आर्टिकुलेशन बिटवीन द ट्रांसफर्स लिगामेंट एंड द डेंस एंड दिस इज द डेंस विच इज प्रेजेंट डेंस ओके सो लिगामेंट्स वाज द लिगामेंट्स ऑफ द ट्रांसफर्स लिगामेंट दैट इज अटैच्ड टू द लैटरल मास ऑफ द एटलस ट्रांसफर्स लिगामेंट इज अटैच्ड टू द लैटरल मास ऑफ द एटलस एंड एक्सटेंड्स एक्सटेंड्स द सुपीरियर बैंड एंड द इनफीरियर बैंड सुपीरियर बैंड एंड द इनफीरियर बैंड सुपीरियर बैंड इज अटैच्ड टू बैसिलर पार्ट ऑफ ऑक्सिपिटल बोन एंड इनफीरियर बैंड टू द बॉडी ऑफ एक्सेस and the superior band inferior band and the transverse ligament these are forming a cruciform ligament or cruciate ligament just don't get confused with the cruciate ligament of your lower limb okay the cruciate ligament is present here only here also okay so it's better call it cruciform ligament what the ligaments are connecting axis vertebrae the occipital bone we have the apical ligament and the alar ligament and the membrana tectoria apical ligament alar ligament and the membrana tectoria these are the three ligaments that are connecting the axis vertebrae with the occipital bone Uh, if i have the diagram we will see here okay we will we'll discuss here what are the, the things okay just i am just reading out now apical ligament is connecting the dense to basilar part of uh, your occipital bone alar ligament is called as a check ligament and is checks excessive rotation and flexion it, it's connecting the side of the dense to the tubercle on the medial aspect of occipital condyle tubercle on the medial aspect of occipital condyle this membrana tectoria is upward continuation of this posterior longitudinal ligament okay and you have uh, here just see what are the things this is your dense this is your dense and this is axis vertebrae which is having your dense and uh, this is the basilar part of occipital bone so which ligament was connecting it the membrana tectoria to the side of uh, the membrana tectoria was connecting the basilar part of occipital bone to the side of the dense right membrana tectoria we talked about this upward continuation of posterior longitudinal ligament okay and uh, your apical ligament and all apical ligament talking about uh, we had uh, another ligament that is your yes uh, we had another ligament that is your uh, uh, at, uh, your atlanta occipital uh, atlanta occipital membrane is there there is the atlanta occipital membrane form here okay uh, we'll discuss one uh, atlanta occipital joint we'll discuss okay so atlanta occipital joint is a type of ellipsoid variety of synovial joint ellipsoid type of joint articular surfaces we have above formed by the occipital condyles and below by the superior articular fascia of the atlas So what are the ligaments? Ligaments we talked about the posterior atlanta occipital membrane is that it's connecting the occipital bone to this anterior arch of the atlas. This is the anterior arch of the atlas. Okay, and uh, here we have a membrana tectoria. Membrana tectoria is this part. Membrana tectoria is this part. Posterior longitudinal ligament is a continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, then we have a inferior band and superior band which is present here. Inferior band and superior band of this ligament is present here. Okay, and we have the anterior longitudinal ligament which is forming. Uh, your anterior atlanta occipital membrane and is connecting to the basilar part of occipital bone again so these are basically your ligaments so you can see in this structure also th this is this is the type of arrangement which i have drawn here okay so we have basically your at, uh, your inferior band your inferior band is present here your occipital condyles are there your occipital condyles are there your occipital condyles and here your atlanto axial joint is from this purple one atlanto uh, axial joint we have the transverse ligament that is attaching from this and alar ligament of the dense there are three alar ligament of the dense three parts and of the inferior band like this so basically these ligaments are supporting the joint what are the ligaments of atlan uh, atlanto occipital joints of the fibrous capsule that is thick in posterior lateral side and thin in the posterior medial side okay So anterior atlanta occipital membrane is the below to the anterior arch of atlas and above to the anterior margin of foramen magnum. Okay, this part, this part, anterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, so it below the anterior arch of your atlas, and posterior and atlanta occipital membrane is below to the posterior arch of atlas and above to the posterior margin of foramen magnum. Right, blood supplies the vertebral artery and nerve supplies the C1 nerve. so this atlanto occipital joint is supplied by the vertebral artery and the nerve is the c1 nerve which is supplying what are the movements at this atlanto occipital joint the flexion and extension that is nodding movement yes movement right uh, axis is the transverse axis what is the flexion flexion is done by muscles such as longus capitis and rectus capitis anterior extension is done by rectus capitis posterior semispinalis capitis planus capitis and upper part of trapezius okay lateral flexion is done in anterior posterior diameter which is done by the rectus capitis lateralis rectus capitis lateralis and semispinalis capitis is responsible for erect position of our head semispinalis capitis is responsible for erect position of our head okay 
talking about the clinical so if the, that is the fracture of the pedicle of the axis pedicle of the axis fracture called is hangman's fracture and it is the dense you can just uh, remember that's a dense of the axis vertebrae it is fractured if you just uh, hang a person if you just hang a person as a punishment or uh, for execution so the transverse ligament of uh, atlas which is ruptured dense will move backward and compress the lower medulla oblongata and compression of vital centers will occur and the person will die okay this is a hangman's fracture being demonstrated here understood so that completes the joints of head and neck now let's move on to the next part so now let's discuss about the suboccipital triangle so basically looking from the posterior side so you can see uh, what are the boundaries of the suboccipital triangle and uh, what are the things that are present so i have a superior lateral boundary superior medial boundary and the inferior boundary right so inferior boundary is formed by this muscle which is called the oblique capitis oblique capitis inferior oblique capitis inferior and the superior lateral boundary is formed by a ob uh, your obliquus capitis superior obliquus capitis superior okay and uh, your superior medial boundary these two muscles are forming a superior medial boundary superior medial boundary is formed by rectus capitis plus uh, your posterior major and rectus capitis plus your posterior major minor okay these are forming a superior boundary superior medial boundary right right so you understood this roof is formed by the fibrous septum that is covered by the semispinalis capitis muscle so roof is formed by the semispinalis capitis muscle and the floor is by the posterior arch of the atlas and the posterior atlanta occipital membrane consider posterior arch of atlas and posterior atlanta occipital membrane this is forming the floor contents of the third part of the vertebral artery dorsal ramus of c1 now which was running with with the third part of the vertebral artery and sub occipital venous plexus we have a sub occipital venous plexus also okay so you can see here the uh, uh, triangle uh, rectus capitis posterior minor the okay, rectus capitis posterior minor here and uh, rectus capitis posterior major also rectus capitis posterior major and rectus capitis posterior minor which are forming a superior medial boundary superior medial boundary the obliquus capitis superior obliquus capitis superior in this diagram also you can see obliquus capitis superior obliquus uh, superior which is forming the superior lateral boundary superior lateral boundary and this obliquus capitis inferior this obliquus capitis inferior was forming the inferior boundary right so that completes the suboccipital plexus and the contents are third part of vertebral artery dorsal ramus of c1 nerve and suboccipital venous plexus so that completes uh, your suboccipital triangle let's move on to the next part let's talk about the sympathetic chain the, uh, basically the cervical sympathetic chain so uh, the entire sympathetic chain is extending from the base of the skull to the coccyx okay to the coccyx base of the skull to the coccyx and position is paravertebral termination fuses in front of the coccyx and ends in the unpaired which is ganglion ends in the unpaired ganglion so called as ganglionic impar ganglion impar okay ganglionic impar or ganglion impar uh, which is saw in the thorax also remember yes sympathetic chain so we have the cervical ganglion that are uh, three thoracic ganglion 11 lumbar ganglion 4 sacral ganglion 4 3 11 4 and 4 so we are basically focusing on the cervical ganglion here we discussed about the thoracic ganglion in uh, thorax you can see cervical sympathetic chain so it's present behind the carotid sheet is present behind the carotid sheet and in front of transverse process of cervical vertebrae in front of the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae understood so the superior cervical ganglion middle cervical ganglion and inferior cervical ganglion superior cervical ganglion the fusion of upper four cervical ganglions the upper four cervical ganglions fuse to form a superior cervical ganglion middle cervical ganglion is fusion of fifth and sixth cervical ganglions and the inferior cervical ganglion is the fusion of eight seventh and eighth seventh and eighth cervical ganglions right this is a cervical sympathetic chain what is the feature there is no white ramus communicans remember that is no white ramus communicans all are gray ramus communicans and gray ramus communicans uh, to all the eight cervical nerves are there okay this is not ganglion please note that uh, this you can consider the nerve even okay this is uh, not your ganglion ganglion are three ganglion are only three so to avoid confusion let me let's make it nerve okay let's make it nerve so upper four cervical nerves fifth and sixth cervical nerves are forming an inferior middle cervical ganglion and uh, fusion of seventh and eighth are forming a inferior cervical ganglion okay these are nerves so uh, lateral horn cells of t1 to t4 these are preganglionic fibers okay so superior cervical ganglion this is the largest one and uh, this is spindle shaped 2.5 cm in length so here we have this uh, the scg that is a superior cervical ganglion in front of the transverse process of the c2 and c3 vertebrae c2 and c3 because we know this is forming by the fusion of upper four cervical nerves okay 
but uh, this is present in the C C two and C three vertebrae in front of the C two and C three vertebrae. Okay, and the superior cervical ganglion. These are great amus communicants connected to a C one, C two, C three, C four. These are forming. These are combining and forming a superior cervical ganglion. This is uh, winding around the ICA, forming a sympathetic chain and giving the uh, dilator pupillary muscles, uh, applying the dilator pupillary muscle. And it is also uh, revolving in the ECA also. And it is also giving branches to the pharyngeal plexus, pharyngeal plexus, and also to the superior cervical cardiac branch. Also fo forming a superior cervical cardiac branch. Okay, SCCB. Remember we talked about the SCCB, right? Yes. Afterwards, uh, we have a middle cervical ganglion. Please uh, see the location. So it is present in front of your C5 and C6. Okay, you can uh, specifically say C6 because C5 just a little attachment is there. So in some books it is written in the form uh, that uh, the textbooks that are followed in U US and all. Uh, you can uh, consider C6. Okay, you can consider C6. And inferior cervical ganglion. This is extending up to C7 level. Present in front of your C7. Vertebrae transverse process. Middle cervical ganglion so is in front of the transverse process of C6 vertebrae, and present just above the inferior thyroid artery. Present just above the this is the inferior thyroid artery. So it is uh, present just above the inferior thyroid artery, right? And the gray ramus communicants from C5 and C6. These are combining to form your middle cervical ganglion. This is a MCG that is a middle cervical ganglion. Okay, and uh, these are giving the branches to the middle. These are forming the middle cervical cardiac branch (MCCB) middle cervical cardiac branch, and giving innervation to the thyroid gland after winding around the inferior thyroid artery, right? And the inferior cervical ganglion. This is present in front of transverse process of C7 vertebrae. Generally, inferior cervical ganglion is fused with the first thoracic ganglion. So it is fused with the first first thoracic ganglion. It is fused with the first thoracic ganglion to form the stellate ganglion. So we have the stellate ganglion here. Uh, so we basically discuss the function uh, with relation to a stellate ganglion. So uh, there is the formation of C7 and C8 in involvement in the forming your uh, ICCB. Uh, sorry, your ICG that is a inferior cervical ganglion ICG. And uh, basically, this is giving branches to uh, forming an inferior cervical uh, inferior uh, cervical cardiac branch. Okay, this is not uh, cervical cervical branch. This is inferior cervical cardiac branch, right? Here I made a mistake here. Okay, let's change it. Yes, cervical cardiac branch. Inferior cervical cardiac branch. That is your ICCB branch. This is your ICCB, right? And uh, here we have uh, esophageal branch. It gives esophageal branches and wounds around the subclavian artery as well and vertebral artery as well. Okay, that completes your uh, ICG. After that, you know the answer cervicalis. This uh, this SCG, MCG, and ICG. So the fibers from NCG. Okay, answer subclavian is there, and it is coming and winding around the subclavian artery from the MCG and going to the ICG. This is called the answer subclavian. Answer subclavian, not answer cervicalis. Answer subclavian. Okay, this is called the answer subclavian. Starting from the MCG and winding around the subclavian artery, going to the ICG. This is called the answer subclavian. Okay. So that completes the cervical sympathetic chain. Let's move on to the next part. So now I'm basically talking about the lymphatic drainage of head, neck, face, which is the very last uh, concept in this uh, chapter. We have covered the head and neck extensively. So it has been maybe uh, five hours or so of lectures. Uh, we'll see. So uh, lymphatic drainage uh, general considerations. So total there are 400 to 500 lymph nodes. And from that, 80 to 100 lymph nodes are present only in the head, neck, and face. Okay, so lymph from head, neck, face directly or indirectly drain into your lymph nodes, called as a deep cervical lymph nodes. As I told, most of the structures, most of the structures uh, of head and neck, this drain into your deep cervical lymph nodes directly or indirectly. Okay, so you can consider absolutely. Okay, you can consider absolutely uh, also at this level. And this deep cervical lymph nodes are present along the internal jugular vein. Present along the internal jugular vein. So you can see here we have a Peri cervical collar, we have a peri cervical collar, we have an inner circle, peri, peri cervical collar is the outer ring, then we have an inner ring that is called as your, uh, that is uh, present around the ALI and the respiratory passage, ALI and the respiratory passage, this is called the inner ring, inner ring, and uh, here we have the submucosal lymphoid tissue, submucosal lymphatic tissue, and which is called as the Wilder's lymphatic ring, Wilder's ring, Wilder's ring will discuss, which will uh, comprise of your uh, pharyngeal tonsils, tubal tonsils, Okay, and palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils. Okay, then we have the deep cervical lymph node. This is a deep cervical lymph node which is present between the inner circle and the outer circle. And this is around your, this is around your, 
internal jugular trunk jugular trunk basically so right jugular trunk is giving uh, like around it so right lymphatic duct and left is called your thoracic duct left jugular trunk around the left jugular trunk so the thoracic duct understood so basically all of the lymph is draining into this uh, from the uh, inner from the submucosal lymphoid tissue it is draining to your deep cervical lymph nodes from the out inner circle it is uh, draining the outer circle is draining okay so all of this basically are draining into this uh, deep cervical lymph nodes so areas of uh, lymphatic drainage these areas are draining the from the right lymphatic duct this part this part of body is drained by the right lymphatic duct and uh, the next part of the body this part this whole part this big part is draining to thoracic duct draining to thoracic duct so basically this jugular trunk is uh, left jugular trunk is uh, like forming the thoracic duct right into li right lymphatic duct okay so you have this lymphatic drainage you can see how many lymph nodes are there they are arranged like this okay we'll uh, discuss about their arrangement in a more simplified manner more simplified manner so let's talk about the deep cervical lymph nodes present only along the internal jugular vein covered by sternum cleidomastoid the deep cervical lymph nodes have a upper group and a lower group so upper group is called as jugulodigastric lymph nodes lower group is called as jugulohomohyoid lymph nodes okay and this lower group some are displaced downwards which form a supraclavicular lymph nodes so basically the supraclavicular lymph nodes are also the displaced part of your lower group okay so you can see the neck from the side sideways uh, that aspect okay this is your mandible that is a lower in the base of the skull you can say base of the skull and you have internal jugular vein that's present like this your internal jugular vein and uh, how the lymph nodes are arranged you have your uh, uh, muscle that is intermediate and the omohyoid muscle is going like this the intermediate tendon of omohyoid which is just um, present superiorly along the uh, your uh, in internal jugular vein and all okay so first of all we have this muscles we have uh, we know about the triangle so we have knowledge what are the muscles and all okay so present along this it is a jugulodigastric lymph node present along this is jugulodigastric lymph node is the upper group of the deep cervical lymph nodes and uh, present at, uh, along the uh, intermediate tendon of the omohyoid intermediate tendon of omohyoid is a jugulohomohyoid lymph node so you can just write the locations if i am writing this jugulodigastric lymph nodes is present between your internal jugular vein between your in internal jugular vein and your facial vein and your facial vein and this jugulohomohyoid lymph nodes these are present along present along your intermediate tendon plus along your intermediate tendon intermediate tendon of your omohyoid tendon of omohyoid muscle omohyoid muscle okay and then we have at last your supraclavicular lymph nodes which are just a displaced part displaced part of this okay so basically lymph is draining into uh, juglo from jugulodigastric to the jugulohomohyoid and from the jugulohomohyoid uh, to basically it's draining down okay and uh, this supraclavicular lymph nodes these are displaced parts so the, these are displaced uh, these are uh, draining into jugulohomohyoid and again it is lymph is going down okay so jugulodigastric lymph nodes these are the principal node of palatine tonsil the principal node of palatine tonsil this jugulodigastric lymph node this this one is a prim principal node of your palatine tonsil afferents are the uh, palatine tonsils in the posterior part of tongue also remember posterior part of tongue we said that uh, if we draw the draw the tongue there is a deep cervical lymph nodes these are draining to the dc lymph cervical lymph nodes which exactly which lymph nodes your jugulodigastric lymph nodes if i had told in that part in that uh, lecture of tongue you, you won't have understood but now you are understanding okay so it's a principal node of palatine tonsil afferents are the uh, palatine tonsil and the posterior part of tongue and the efferents efferents are it is draining into jugulodigastric is draining into a lower deep cervical lymph node that is a jugulohomohyoid lymph node so jugulohomohyoid lymph node afferents directly from the tongue indirectly from submental submandibular sub and upper deep cervical lymph nodes and that is your uh, jugulodigastric and efferents are the jugular trunk it drains into your jugular trunk it drains into your jugular trunk additional lower deep cervical lymph node that's supraclavicular lymph nodes these are uh, scalene lymph nodes like uh, present in front of scalenous anterior muscle you can see there is a virtuose node remember the inflammation of supraclavicular lymph node okay it's called a virtuose node this gastric carcinoma may cause the swelling of this left which was uh, swelling of this uh, scalene lymph node the supraclavicular lymph node which is causing uh, which is causing a virtuous node remember we talked about this in abdomen let's discuss about the outer circle that is a pericervical cola so we said that we have an inner circle and the outer circle okay so we are basically discussing the mid middle circle that is your deep cervical lymph nodes so let's discuss the pericervical cola now pericervical cola now it will also drain into deep cervical lymph nodes don't worry so your outer circle that's a peri pericervical collar so we have lymph nodes arranged in this fashion we have lymph nodes arranged in this fashion you can see okay this are this is an arrangement of the lymph nodes so first of all first of all we have this occipital lymph nodes at the back of the skull occipital lymph nodes 
ओके इट्स आर डायरेक्टली इट्स आर डायरेक्टली ड्रेनिंग इट्स आर डायरेक्टली ड्रेनिंग इनटू एस सी दैट इज योर सुप्रा क्लैविकल लिम्फ नोट्स ओके सुप्रा क्लैविकल लिम्फ नोट्स सो दिस ऑक्सीपिटल लिम्फ नोट्स आर डायरेक्टली ड्रेनिंग इनटू दिस देन एव द मैस्टॉइड लिम्फ नोट मैस्टॉइड लिम्फ नोट सो बेसिकली मैस्टॉइड लिम्फ नोट इज ड्रेनिंग टू जुगलो डाइगेस्ट्रिक जुगलो डाइगेस्ट्रिक ओके मैस्टॉइड लिम्फ नोट ड्रेनिंग टू जुगलो डाइगेस्ट्रिक देन एव पैरोटेड लिम्फ नोट पैरोटेड लिम्फ नोट इज ड्रेनिंग इन टू योर जुगलो डाइगेस्ट्रिक अगेन देन एव द सब मेंटल लिम्फ नोट सब मेंटल लिम्फ नोट इन दिस ओके देन एव द सब मैंडिबुलर सब मैंडिबुलर विच इज ऑल्सो ड्रेनिंग इन टू जुगलो डाइगेस्ट्रिक and uh, submental lymph node submental lymph node is also uh, is not draining the jugular digastric it's draining into a jugular omohyoid jugular omohyoid and some uh, lymph nodes on submental lymph node also it drains to the submandibular lymph node uh, the submandibular lymph nodes also drains into submental lymph node and ultimately to the jug- jugular omohyoid and the lymph from the jugular digastric is again given to the jugular omohyoid from jugular omohyoid it goes down for the jugular trunk right Let's discuss about what are the uh, like uh, supp- the parts which are supplied by which lymph nodes. So first of all, we have the o- occipital lymph nodes. So basically, occipital lymph nodes are supplying the posterior part of the skull. Okay, the lymph from the posterior part of the skull. Okay, uh, it is uh, basically uh, draining into the occipital lymph nodes. And then we had your mastoid lymph node. Mastoid lymph node. So talking about the mastoid lymph node, it receives lymph. This it receives limb from the median surface and the upper surface, median surface and the upper part of the auricle, upper part of auricle and the median surface of the auricle. Okay, mastoid lymph nodes and adjoining scalp as well as posterior wall of external auditory canal. These are uh, receiving limbs from these parts. Okay, then we have to a lot of structures that are uh, draining into this uh, other lymph nodes that are your parietal lymph nodes, submental and submandibular lymph nodes. Let's discuss them. Of course, we have discussed in the organs itself, but here we have a culmination of your lymphatic drainage. Okay, so there is a culmination. So you can just uh, easy technique is that you can just uh, draw draw a face like this. You can just draw a face like this, and make eyes, make eyes, make a simple nose, and uh, make upper lip and the lower lip, and draw it draw it ears. Okay, and uh, just you have to divide this like that uh, between the uh, crossing the eye. Okay, and divide it like that. and uh, ear also you have to divide like this you are also you have to divide uh, the upper part the upper include only upper part okay and because the lower part the lower part is being uh, drained the lower part of auricle okay uh, mastoid lymph node is draining the upper part of the auricle okay the upper part of the auricle let's talk about this so basically we have the this upper part of this eye upper part of this ear and uh, this this whole part this red part is basically draining the parotid lymph nodes that is your up, you, you have to write just what you can see that it is forehead your upper part of the forehead the lateral side upper part of the forehead then the temporal region the temporal region of this upper part of the lateral surface of auricle upper part of lateral surface of auricle anterior wall of external auditory canal anterior wall because posterior wall was draining into your mastoid lymph node will drain into a mastoid lymph node and the lateral angle of the eye lateral angle of the eye okay these all parts are draining into your parotid lymph nodes talking about the uh, we have to uh, the green region is that this green region which will encompass more more the structures okay except this part except this part uh, except your tip of the no- tongue tip of the tongue your floor of mouth your lower gums lower gums incisors that is lower gums and incisors central part of lower lip central part of lower lip and your chin and your chin this part this whole part this whole part is draining to submental lymph nodes except this all of this part it's, uh, it's draining to submandibular lymph nodes submandibular that is the central part of the forehead yes central part of the forehead medial angle of the eye this medial angle of the eye then anterior part of nasal cavity nasal cavity anterior part cheeks are draining to your submandibular and uh, your angle of the mouth that is angle of the mouth this one this one the angle of the mouth is draining upper lip is draining into it anterior two third of tongue is draining into it okay anterior two third of tongue then uh, your uh, frontal or uh, maxillary and uh, anterior ethmoidal ear sinuses the uh, frontal maxillary and the anterior ethmoidal ear sinuses are also draining into the submandibular lymph nodes mastoid lymph node so receives lymph from median surface of upper part of auricle okay adjoining scalp and the posterior wall of eac occipital lymph node basically posterior part of the skull okay and uh, displaced lymph nodes of pericervical collar are the superficial cervical lymph nodes and the anterior cervical lymph nodes okay the superficial cervical lymph nodes are related to external jugular vein and the anterior cervical lymph nodes are related to anterior jugular vein anterior jugular vein superficial cervical lymph nodes is received limb from the angle of the mandible lobule of ear and lower part of parotid okay lower part of parotid your lobule of ear and your angle of mandible understood so th- this uh, this lobule of the ear this lobule of the ear are basically are basically receiving your limb from your superficial cervical lymph nodes 
so angle of mandible lobule of your lower part of parotid okay understood so you can uh, just you have a uh, like protein energy malnutrition right so pem pem you can remember pem you can remember superficial cervical lymph nodes receive limb from pem pem is your parotid uh, p is for your parotid parotid is lower part of parotid e is your uh, uh, lobule of ear ear lobule and m is your mandibular angle angle of mandible okay then anterior cervical lymph node this is receiving limb from the anterior triangle of the neck receives limb from the anterior triangle of the neck remember inner circle inner circle so inner circle we had this outer circle we discussed the outer circle and we have the inner circle now this is the inner circle this is the inner circle this is basically your inner circle and this inner circle present around the ali and your respiratory passage present around the ali and the respiratory passage so what uh, so what the features we have of this uh, inner circle let's see so you have uh, lymph nodes that is pretracheal prelaryngeal paratracheal retropharyngeal pretracheal prelaryngeal paratracheal retropharyngeal right prelaryngeal lymph node prelaryngeal present found of the conus elasticus and pretracheal this is just above the isthmus just above the isthmus of your trachea this trachea was there and the isthmus is there so present just above the isthmus right and this paratracheal this is present between the trachea and the esophagus between the trachea and the esophagus along the recurrent laryngeal lump with paratracheal lymph nodes are present and uh, afferents these are uh, like uh, receiving the limb from your tra uh, larynx trachea esophagus and thyroid gland the uh, larynx trachea esophagus and th thyroid gland so you can just remember for your uh, this uh, inner circle lymph nodes inner circle lymph nodes you can remember lot l o t you can remember lot so what are the uh, what are the lot structures this is a larynx larynx esophagus to remember the afferents esophagus then your trachea trachea and your thyroid gland So these are your afferents. These are your afferents for your inner circle. Afferents for your inner circle, right? Uh, of this three, pretracheal, uh, paratracheal, pre, prelaryngeal, prelaryngeal, pretracheal, and the paratracheal of three. Of this three, okay. Just note of this three, not of whole, okay. Not of whole. Of this three only. Of this three only. And efferents are the neighboring deep cervical lymph nodes. Basically, lymph is going to deep cervical lymph nodes only, okay, not in any other place. Let's talk about the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. They are located in the retropharyngeal space. That are the afferents, your pharynx, palate and tonsil, your palate, posterior part of nasal cavity, auditory tube, tympanic cavity, and spinodal and posterior ethmoidal air sinuses. So, spinodal and posterior ethmoidal air sinuses are basically draining the retropharyngeal lymph nodes while while your uh, other two sinuses your other two sinuses that are uh, present which are your frontal maxillary and uh, also your anterior th model you can consider these are draining limb into a sub mandibular lymph node sub mandibular lymph nodes, right and basically we have this afferents and efferents is uh, again neighboring upper deep cervical lymph nodes uh, afferents are pharynx palatine tonsil okay palate posterior part of nasal cavity then your uh, auditory tube tympanic cavity tympanic uh, cavity and the ar sinuses okay you can remember for this retropharyngeal lymph nodes you can remember pat pat okay you can remember pat pat what is pat p is for all the structures which are uh, like pharynx your palate and tonsil palate and the posterior part of nasal cavity a is for your auditory tube a is for your auditory tube here a is for the auditory tube and uh, t is for your tympanic cavity t is for your tympanic cavity t is for your tympanic cavity and the ar sinuses are again included in your a a is for your ar sinus which ar sinus your sinoidal uh, sorry your spinoidal and your posterior model right and uh, talking about the valdeus ring what is the valdeus ring so here we have an arrangement like this we have the pharyngeal tonsils present in the here and the tubal tonsils are present here tubal tonsils are present in this part tubal tonsils we have the palatine tonsils present here palatine tonsils are present pharyngeal tubal and the palatine tonsils are present here and the lingual tonsils are present in this part okay so this completes the valdeus ring this completes the valdeus ring understood and uh, this prevents the anterior microorganisms from external environment uh, present around the oropharynx and the nasopharynx so guys let uh, that's is the, that was your head and neck that was your uh, chapter called head and neck okay most feared chapter as i uh, can uh, say and get feedback but i hope uh, you understood all the parts i hope it is not that difficult as it seems of course it is difficult it is complex because uh, like um, 
many things are there many things are there to retain many things are there to understand so it is a chapter basically of retention and understanding it's based on both the aspects okay like a thorax thorax was a chapter based not morely on memorization memorization part was less in thorax you have to just understand the things and you can just go on and upper limb was such a chapter like uh, no uh, retention was very less lower limb was more of a retention type of chapter we have to uh, layers of the soul and all we have to retain okay abdomen was a retention type of chapter we don't have to understand we have to just uh, retain the structures retain the arrangement okay we have to understand of course but uh, we have to retain the names of the arteries and the nerves and the veins that are supplying okay and basically head and neck is a culmination of all this so it is a huge chapter you can say it is a very huge chapter and uh, we completed we completed the chapter uh, i hope i didn't hurry hurry much and i completed the chapter probably in 5 uh, minute in uh, your 5 hours okay 5 hours and 5 hours are more than sufficient 5 hours of content is more than sufficient as your head and neck is considered okay so just uh, go on revising go on revising Uh, watch the lecture multiple number of times if it is possible if you have time so as to get a uh, like strong grasp on this on this chapter of course you have to relate much and uh, if you just forget keep on forgetting the previous things then you can't uh, do the chapter you have to just uh, correlate the things correlate the nerves and uh, when i teach you neuroanatomy you just try to correlate the neuroanatomy with your head and neck there are many correlations present so uh, let's meet again in your neuroanatomy o- only one chapter is left that is a neuroanatomy we will uh, do the neuroanatomy next okay so let's meet again that's all from my side i hope you guys have a good time keep reading and uh, best of luck for your exams thank you